Well, here we are, Sticula. I'm hoping that our audio may work a little bit better, but I'm sure that was a really good intro from our host there to introduce here for the Cuts Down Land. I'm very excited for this one as well. We've got two teams ready to come into this one first and foremost. Which two teams are those, Stick? Well, it's two sort of familiar quantities, but for entirely different reasons. On one side, you've got Robert Morrison University, who have been around in Collegiate Rainbow Six Siege for a pretty sizable period of time, with a number of playoff appearances behind their backs. Across the pond from them on the other side of the field, it's Bryant, a school that isn't really too terribly active in the Collegiate Seas ecosystem. I'm actually really excited for this one as well. I recognize one of the names on the Bryant side. I recognize a lot of the names on the Robert Moore side. But for RMU, they're obviously coming into this one. They have a long history, like you said, in the collegiate scene. So they're expecting quite a bit. And we're expecting a lot out of them as well. So we'll have to see how that goes. And if they can, uh, I guess, showcase that prowess at this point here, Sticula. But uh, let's talk actually first about how this format's going to go down. We're not doing the typical, you know, you know first, first to seven, seven style, style in instead, Sticula. What are we doing? Well, it's the old way that things used to be in Rainbow Six Siege, where in each half of the game, you play a total of five rounds, and it's the first team in regulation that gets to six total victories that will walk away as the match winner. We do have overtime as well, but because of time constraints, we managed to drop one round off of each half. That way the games do go a little bit quicker, because we could be here, Scott, for 12 hours if all is said and done. Yeah, I mean, Rainbow Six Siege is the game of uh, trickling down the clock, let's just say it that much. Yes. Two rounds, every single map, every single game is a possible 15 minutes, it feels like, that you're shaving off of every single match as well. It just comes down to the wire with it, but we've got there our teams. We have ourselves lined up for our first map, which is actually going to be Cafe Dostoevsky. And in the collegiate scene, Cafe is a map that is... Uh, hit or miss in a lot of ways, considering how dangerous the map can be. A very top-down approach, working yourself to that top skylight, taking control over hatches, dropping down red stairs, and then vying for control from through Cigar Lounge. However, in the collegiate scene, and a lot of ways in just the normal scene as a whole for amateur, you've got a lot of teams that are doing a lot better on that attack, where Cafe's yeah. actually flipped to be an attacker favorited map because of the way that it's been played and how it's been adjusted so the attackers are more favored. And that's something that will be interesting when we've got five round halves, right? How does that sort of change the dynamic because things aren't exactly a parallel to the old system? And Cafe, I think, is a great match to see between Robert Morris and Bryant because it's one where I feel like, it's, Scott, it's really easy to tell when teams are really prepared on the map because if you're not, you're on the offense, you're sitting up top on that roof and you're really just waiting, waiting, waiting. When you don't have prepared strats ahead of time, things are so slow. Yeah, it, it can be so difficult to get around the map of Cafe in good time. If you're very disjointed, it's very obvious when that is the case. We'll have a lot of talking points to go about that one. I think more importantly, one of the objectives of choice that we're going to be talking about the most will be that third floor. In that top-down approach, it's very direct towards the site. And that means defensively, the attacking team is already in your face by the time they make it into the map. And that can cause a lot of problems. And typically speaking, you look at it from, I mean, maybe not nine, ten months ago, Cafe, you're looking at that third floor and saying, hey, defensively, this is the easiest objective. That's not the case anymore. Tack and teams have such a standardized route, such a standardized approach, that that third floor is much easier for them. It just comes down to winning those longer range engagements. And on the attacking side, well, you have the rifle advantage in a lot of ways, where the defense is stuck majority-wise with SMGs, maybe an LMG if you're bringing out that maestro, or maybe you're trying to be a little bit more cheeky up close and personal with the Mossberg and shotguns, but whatever it does come down to, you're typically still favored attacking wise in those long range engagements, but that which that third floor just necessitates. Right, and being in control of the offense on Cafe is going to give you that momentum that you need to play across both halves. I honestly think I would disagree with you in some assumptions about the map maybe flipping more to the offense. I think it is very 
um, important which two teams are playing. Because you get two teams that have really good structure and really good IGL calling, you are probably going to get a cafe attacker sided map. But if you've got more pug stacks, more teams that are coming up from this collegiate ecosystem and haven't really had that same amount of experience, don't really have that much of a vocal leader in the roster, things do sort of, I think, still default, as all maps do, back towards that sort of defender, defender side. And because, well, you can't really move as quickly, things do happen where you get that collegiate structure that we know, where everyone is just kind of up in your face and the defense is playing all crazy. I mean, you would argue defensively, turtling is the best strategy in a lot of ways, right? Force the attack to come to you, set up your trap and wait for it to be sprung. And in a lot of ways, especially like you said, and maybe some pug stack ways or lower collegiate where you have teams that are a little less structured, a little more disjointed, like I mentioned, then absolutely defense will take the cake in a lot of ways. It's going to be very interesting to see how Cafe will break down. I absolutely despise this map. Uh, I'll say it straight out. I know that you know I despise this map, Sticulum, but I've actually been really enjoying it recently. I've been actually having a lot of fun with it. It's very much so going to be the same old strategies. Even if you're not the most structured team, you're almost always going to work to the skylight on top of the roof. It is just the set in stone. You're going to push to it, take control over, and try to clear out these floors. And it's going to be a battle of that roam. Whether defensively you have yourself in that extended roam, or attacking wise you're clearing out that extended Rome. That's where this game is going to change, and that's how this is going to be dictated. Well, we're still waiting on the match, so why don't we go through a couple more pieces of housekeeping. For those of you who aren't aware of kind of what the stakes are of this land as a whole, we have a $400 prize. It's a double elimination format playing out in best of ones until we get to the finals, which will actually be a best of three at the very end of the day. So if you lose here in the initial round, your hopes aren't completely done yet. You would then go to play another game. But if you lose there, unfortunately, that's where your chances stop. For some of the rosters that we've got in the event, Scott, I, I think all of us have sort of settled on this idea that it's probably going to be Penn State as a front runner. They're the only squad amongst all of the rosters here who can really legitimately claim that they are at the premier level of collegiate and generally that premier term we use to discuss the top 25 teams in any given environment and for Rainbow Six Siege, it's the teams that kind of as closely as possible mirror the way that pro play is had, where you've got structure, you've got your roles, and everybody, you know, scrims to get on that 9 to 5. Yeah, I guess the question is how much time do you set aside for R6? How much do you prepare and how much do you prep in the environment as a whole? And Penn State is a roster that has found success in a lot of ways in the R6 scene, esports as a whole, uh, also in the football scene as they've come alive recently. So if you're a Penn State fan, it's a really good time for you out there. Uh, maybe not so much because uh, they beat my football team this year. Uh, shame on you guys. But... Good times all around for them. Yes, they are very much so an expected team to make it to that final stage, but that's not to say that we can't have a David and Goliath situation. The great thing about Collegiate, especially when you have a really well-structured team facing up against teams that maybe not be as structured, it doesn't necessarily mean that that not so structured team is going to lose outright. It sometimes can be very difficult to face off against players that don't play the standard way, that are cheeky, that are rats, that are all over the place. They can catch you off guard and that can really catch a team completely unaware and flip the game on its head entirely. And I think that's what Penn State are going to be the most worried about at this point going into this one. Uh, will they get shut down by the wild things these other teams will be bringing to the table or will it be the result they're expecting? Well, I'm hoping it's a bit of both because it'd be very entertaining to see some of these teams turn this one around. And on top of just that sort of structured versus more free-flowing siege idea, you've also got the fact that it's a LAN. Sometimes you turn up to LAN and you're just better at playing on the LAN environment because it's so much different than the online siege you've probably been playing for the majority of your career because mechanics are more evident because there's not really as much topic of that sort of peeker's advantage. You know, you're not complaining about lag when you're playing on LAN and you've got, you know, a fair and even playing ground. There is a lot of conversation you can go back on watching pro players that we've got... Uh, as well, in the history of Rainbow Six Siege, players say that the game functions better on land, that you don't get as many things as sound bugs. However, we're having some additional delays, so we're going to jump over towards a five-minute break. When we come back, Robert Morris versus Bryant will be ready.
we're ready to go and underway the five minute timer totally absolutely bamboozling everybody but we're ready to go into this one rme versus bryant like you foretold right there at the end the question i have on my mind first is what will the van phase look like in a lot of collegiate scene cafe is fairly standardized but with the obviously ever-flowing changes and more comfort bands being in the lower level of collegiate it may come down to what they just don't want to face off against what they're comfortable against and what they're not and our first band on the board being rmu's choice they're gonna go ahead and take off flores removing the rotero drones from being wielded here on this map and that leads me to believe that we would probably like to see RMU use a pretty heavy shield composition. Now, with Goyo would no longer having those Vulcan shields, those won't be in play, but still, Ranforce shield extremely strong, and it makes it so much easier to play defensively, not having to deal with those. Well, I suppose if you wanted an interesting ban face attack, you definitely got it so far. Finca being taken off it. It's not totally a wild card to see that Russian operator removed, given that she's got a lot of power when it comes to the way that the entry is played nowadays, having those grenades as well. I think the offensive life on Cafe, it's going to be pretty hard. Not only do you not have the Reteros, as you mentioned there, Scott, you also are losing grenades. You're losing one of those LMGs as well. Bryant needs to be very careful about the way that they play into this, because now that you've got mira band as well and you've got the wamai taken off i think that does sort of help to counteract the fact there's going to be a lot of shields here but it's still going to be a problem you still got a rooney and jaeger who are going to be in the fray now keep in mind as well with a attacker repick stick it's going to be much easier for the attacking team to kind of build against what rmu are bringing to the table but i think at the same time Cafe is a map that you're typically going to bring the exact same defensive lineup every single time. Just going to be fairly standard with it. But, I mean, at this point, I would be more worried about having your siege crash and having a, a rehost have to go down because of it. But, seemingly the case, one player on the bride side has uh, lost their connection to it. Their siege has crashed and be disconnected. Attackers have discovered the location of a bomb. Well, I guess we're going to continue playing out here, so uh, we'll see what the admins say if we do indeed go for a rehost or if we're going to continue playing on. I know because there's already been a bit of a delay, there might be uh, sort of some administration that needs to be done there. And maybe we are going to go for a rehost. I'm not entirely too certain. But uh, we're going to act as if the game is still live because that's generally the procedure that you get. And TSS is back in the lobby, which leads me to believe things will continue to be played out here. As we look to Cafe, a castle strat is on the board. I'm really interested to see how this one's going to go down. Obvious counter. Necessarily the same as Consulate, where it's Window Repel Simulator, but still a very important emphasis when it comes down to playing on these windows, having these repels, and applying pressure on that third floor. One of the more important ones is White Hall on that third floor. Applying pressure to the back of Pixel, applying pressure over towards Bathroom and Break. You need to force the defense into very tight corners, very rough angles, and hope for an easy pick because of it. Either you do that, or you work from White Stairs as a whole, which is a lot harder because you have to work from the first floor garage side first and then work your way up. And I really don't see a lot of teams doing that alternative take. It's a great concept. I love the idea. Unfortunately, I just don't think people are really in a position where they have practiced that take a lot of times and they're really ready to go for it when you get on game day. An operator you'll generally see that'll tell you they're going for that take would be the Bucks. So watch out for him if you're defending yeah. on the top floor. You're hearing that skeleton key generally. It's going to mean that there is a Buck and he's going to come from below. But teams are so prepared or used to the kind of the rigmarole of going for that top floor pressure coming in on the piano take. And when you've got the castle barricades, I would be a little worried. I honestly, Scott, think there might be a solid chance that you could get an operator like an Ash who's not really too meta right now just because there is so much bulletproof gadgetry you're going to need to dismantle. Yeah, I mean, the breaching charges do an amazing job of reaching rounds and being sent out and dismantling a lot of that defensive utility. You can't bring the Rotero drones. Obviously, that was banned in the ban phase, so 
the inclination is you have to have something that can kind of supplement that destructive utility, and Ash is a great way to do it. Sophia can fill that role with those impacts and her lifeline, but at the same time, quite limited, only having two. And you may want to use those a little bit more effectively to clear out holes and walls, as well as floors, to have that aerial pressure either below or above. But, like you said, the rigmarole of that third floor is to take those hatches, drop down, apply pressure through Cigar Lounge, and start to move to that side of the map very slowly while picking apart the defense and the players that are trying to defend those angles. And when it comes down to it, the first duel is anticipated to come down within that Cigar Lounge towards Pixel Hold defensively and back of Cigar towards Double Wall on that Red Stairs. I think our first point of emphasis and our first duel will, in fact, go there. And the question here is, Stick, can they survive defensively? Are they going to place the reinforced shield? There is no Amai, meaning we cannot bring out the magnets to defend as easily, which means an ADS will be all that's there. And that's going to be short-lived, all things considered that it's quite easy to burn those. And I think the offense just sort of need to realize going into the round what utility is ahead of them. It's not going to be, you know, a huge worrying process. I think you just need to be cognizant of what obstacles you're going to need to overcome. And a lot of teams do have problems with that. They see all this utility and they're like, oh no, what do I do now? You know, I've got this deployable shield. I've got this castle barricade that's in my way. You just need to calm down and you need to focus on... The matter of fact is, this utility, it's not indestructible. There's ways of destroying it. And you always need to think about your burn. Timing your burn to go with your explosives. Because if you do that, it's not a hard concept. It's not You're not doing trigonometry over here. You get that down, and you're already ahead of a lot of other collegiate teams. Yeah, I think coordination, chemistry, working alongside your, your teammates utility, working in tandem with that is the most important factor to play as a team in Rainbow Six Siege, to give your team that extra le a little bit of an edge over the competition. That's what separates really strong teams from teams that maybe just aren't as strong, aren't in the top upper, upper echelons of Rainbow Six Siege collegiate, like you had mentioned earlier, those top 25 teams. The difference really and truly is not just gun skill, not just clicking heads a little bit easier because there's menaces all over the field when it comes to collegiate r6 it's the ability to work with your teammates effectively and that's what we're looking to see here on this map whichever team can work across the board on a much more baseline level effectively communicates effectively use their utility in the right manner because copying what pro league does doesn't always work it's a difference of, well, I'm doing what they're doing, but I don't understand why I'm doing what they're doing and saying, okay, this is why they're doing it. It's the right idea to copy it because it just works. It's the best case scenario. So I'm looking forward to seeing defensively how that composition will work out for them. The longer range angles, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, favoring the attack with the right rifles. So the defense needs to force the attack to come to them without bleeding those extra few players early in those duels. And I think one thing that do the team some, some, seems like they forget on Cafe is the fact that, you know, it's really just a big cube. And you've got all these different windows. It makes sense to use them. Don't just go up and sit on the rooftop. Please do not do that. Because these windows allow you to build the crossfires, which are so essential to success on the offense. There's a reason why teams are going to play that castle. It's to try to shut down the possibility of you generating all of those angles. If you're bringing somebody like a sledge, or you've got, you know, your Zofia as well, you have all the right tools to get rid of those castle barricades. And the one window I do want to highlight to the utmost here has got to be on the wide stairs. We talked for a long time about Pixel, that sort of pseudo power position where you're seeing a lot of utility develop to try to hold. It. If you're on that rappel at the white stairs, it makes the pixel player's life so much more difficult because you've got a crossfire that restricts your movement. And now you tag that in with somebody over by ticket, that double wall at the top of red, that's tossing flashbangs, that's throwing grenades as well. It really is not fun to be at pixel. The offense, it's not a crazy complicated thing on cafe. I think it's just about being aware of the steps in the checklist you need to accomplish. You essentially, with the window repels on this map, you turn positions for defense as a doomed to transition away uh, yeah. into a tomb doomed to die, right? You're holding the cut. You have them. Their life is in your hands. They will eventually have to retreat or face the fury of your tracers, of your shots connecting against them. And it's just so much easier when you can guarantee that kill, maybe not instantaneously, but at some point you are given that go ahead. It's just about winning that next fight, which is much more favored to you specifically. 
specifically on that window repel where you can kind of dictate the angle you want to hold. And speaking of those window repels, like I had mentioned earlier and you just mentioned over there towards Whitehall, the window repels actually over towards Cocktail. Cocktail C2, C1, all of those windows apply pressure to deny those longer range engagements that defenses do somewhat like to play. They can still sit pretty safe within the actual freezer and vault section, but defensively, that white hole is doomed to be taken, and freezer hall is doomed to be taken at some point too, which means at some point, the pincer will come through from the attack. They'll have pressure on both sides, and it's very difficult to watch both angles at the same exact time. We're not like all mothers out there who have eyes in the back of their heads. You have to look one direction or the other, and that's where defensively you start to fall apart. It's about buying time to the last few seconds and forcing the attack on the wrong end. And for the top floor, that's an important concept. It's also relevant when you go look down towards reading as well, because oftentimes we talk about reading as a game of taking the top floor. It's really similar to attacking bar. The only problem is when you get control of that bar and cocktail area, the, the job's not done. You then have to transition into attacking the actual objective below as well, which is going to be big for Brian. I think you look at them, that tertiary side is probably going to be the most challenging one that they face. At a stats perspective, generally I think it's Kitchen that is the most defensible, but the level of complexity that you're going to get with reading I think is going to be a bit of a difficult point for them. That's my expectation here for Brian as a team that doesn't look to have a lot down on paper, that doesn't have as much experience in the history of Collegiate versus RMU. For Robert Morris, who have eight stated playoff appearances, it's a little bit of a different kind of uh, dichotomy that you've got there with one school not as experienced and a program on the other side that has seen the postseason for so many times. Now, Cafe is also a map choice for a lot of collegiate teams that's not super comfortable. So I'm looking at this map as a whole and saying, well, how does that dichotomy of collegiate, how do these teams fare on this map? And when it comes down to it, the fact that it was left unbanned to this point, the fact that it is a BO1, which means you ban every other map in the pool up to get to this last map, means that I arguably would think that both of these teams must be comfortable, at least comfortable enough not to ban it early. So I expect to see some fairly, fairly strong, fairly... Uh, comprehensive defensive strategies as well as attacking pushes and while the attack seems a little bit um, standardized to a way that I used to hate this map because of its same top down top down every single time go to the rooftop it's the first 15 seconds of every round I still feel like the attack looks glorious once they actually enter into the map and that's where things have to change can we see enough of a change come out from the Brian side to catch RMU unaware? Because like I said, RMU a well-versed, well-prepped team in the collegiate scene, moving towards the upper echelons, having that kind of strats and work together. Can Bryant pull something out and manage to find a victory off of it? Or will the defensive strategies of a predictively, at least what we're predicting, solid team of RMU survive and have an easy job of dealing with them. We won't know until the game goes down, but I have a sneaking feeling that if there's any map where shenanigans can go down, Cafe's a pretty darn good one to do it. Well, another point we are getting closer towards actually kicking things off on Cafe is for the entirety of this event, we're actually running with the new nine map pool, which will be an interesting concept. There's been a lot of talk about some of those power five schools in the collegiate CG ecosystem. How have they taken the three new maps? How are they using those to kind of change up their system? Because I'm going to give you kind of a brutally honest take here, Scott. I think it is pretty stagnant towards kind of the top 10 in collegiate. You do get a lot of the same teams. And for some of those schools who are maybe just starting out or have been participating in kind of the open competition, for a little while longer there isn't a lot of movement for schools to move on up but the new map pool opens up that opportunity it gives those teams who practice a lot a chance to move forward we're going to jump to another break though unfortunately the game is still not ready so please stick with us when we come back half phase just ahead Welcome back, everybody. We're pretty much ready and raring to go once again. Back to the map of Cafe, the band phase, as we know from before. We'll reiterate Flores, Finca, Mira, and Wamai. So no Wamai and Pet Magnets, no Black Mirrors, no Finca Boost, which was the kind of the one that we were looking at and saying, this may tell us a lot about how they're playing and no Rotero drones. So Nades 
pretty darn important here in the game of R6. And you can't bring Finca to help facilitate that. You're going to have to really rely on a Yana to get that job done. Maybe bring out that Mav as well. But attacking wise, I think a Yana is going to be that go-to. We also see Jackal being in play for the third floor. This one's not that important in all honesty. That operator picks not the... Uh, uh, must pick scenario that a lot of teams think it might have to be but can still be very strong about snuffing and forcing players to feel uncomfortable where they're standing still defensively flores and finca Attackers taken off here on the attacking videos three operators who are really pretty prevalent on cafe make their way through number one and present here in this first composition thatcher but those EMP grenades, you can really skip some of the more difficult steps of your burn. The largest of which, probably going to be those ADSs. The thing about the top floor as well, Scott, you don't even need to be inside the building to use those EMP grenades. You can throw them up on the rooftop and they will still deactivate the ADS, which makes clearing Pixel kind of an easy job. Another operator that does creep through as well is the Jackal, who you said not really going to be too great on the top floor, and I have concur there as well. But on Kitchen, you're going to need to play a Realm if you want to get anything done, Attackers and that's going to be an important the conversation bomb. there. Hibana is also let through as well, but it'll actually be Ace as your hard breacher in this first composition. Now, I love that you mentioned the Thatcher tossing the EMPs on the rooftop to actually clear those ADSs. Uh, you mentioned earlier, said, uh, please do not play on the roof the entire time. This may be one of those scenarios where we do actually see them playing on the roof quite a bit to actually utilize those EMPs effectively, but it does require a lot of coordination, a lot of chemistry between your two players to try to get that job done. Cheesy's also bringing out those nades like I had mentioned before, so we're going to see quite a lot of potential along with that hammer to clear out utility as well as these walls and sight lines. But what we're seeing right now from Bryant is a fairly quick push up to the second floor, or to the rooftop, I should say, ready to drop down, but not as quick as it necessarily could be. We're 45 seconds in and nobody has entered the building when it comes to this third floor. Just trying to still drone out towards New Ledge, New Balk, just trying to drone out towards Cigar. But the problem is with only one true Attack Heart Breacher, if bomb. they lose TSS, maybe to a spawn peak by the, the Robert University side, Robert Moore side, that means they have no real great way to entry in towards that Cigar Lounge site, towards Ticket, like you mentioned before. That could be the ultimately weakest factor of their team considering they're only bringing the one hard breach oh i think my worst fear has been realized it seems like we are going to have a game of sitting on the rooftop for the majority of the round it's 90 seconds of cast and bryant are only just now getting started into the map we've got a presence over by the cigar shop side as well one of the players had just sort of crossed in from the top of the red stairs and the aruni working below as well brian have got all the various different tools to accomplish their tasks, but they're going to need to focus on that pixel area. It's going to be so important to clear. If they get that done, things shouldn't be too troubling. Another threat they're going to worry about as well will be the Valkyrie below, who's currently waiting on her cams for a C4 that she's got prepped. Ready to send down at a moment's notice, but DB and Otis Whiskey in a very rough spot finished off by Cheesy's nade, and that's actually the first nade tossed as well. Shrunk finds an SMG 11 kill there onto Snakes, refragged back, and even four on four fair, but notice how much RMU have dropped down to the second floor. They're playing fairly all over the place, where you would typically see just a third floor approach. No one here on the first, and we're seeing the side of RMU defensively tear down Bryant. Warden finds one, Zedek finds another, it's just Simi left standing. They have to do it in Valorant, and they have to do it in R6, and right now they've got to do it all by themselves. A very dangerous time to play from, they're trapped over by Piano and Cigar Lounge, and they have to still push through this bathroom side, and that's where Shrug is lying in wait. Easy cleanup kill with the SMG-11, and the job is done here for round one. And I think our expectation of the way that Cafe Dostoevsky was going to play out is pretty much what you have there in the first round with bryant not being nearly quick enough in rmu scoring a lot of the important kills in the early game bryant never really got much set up going for them inside of the cigar lounge area and so eventually they take the first and now we look down to kitchen and service this is where you're really going to see the value of the jackal come forward but we've got something from rmu that might counter that 
Mozzie from Whiskey stopping that drone pressure. So it's really exactly. just going to be the Inox scans. If we play this right, RMU are going to have a decent job that they can accomplish on the roam. Attackers have discovered the location of now, roaming-wise, we mentioned that earlier as well. Stick saying roam game is where this map is going to be changed, where this map is going to matter. And notice what we saw there from RMU. They were on the second floor for the... Honestly, 80 to 90% of that round. Well, they did lose whiskey for that first blood. Notice how quickly RMU was able to adjust to actually playing that second floor. They were able to leave only two players on the third, and they found four collective kills right after. RMU looked very solid when it comes to defense, but that's only the third floor. We've got to see these other two objectives. And the first one we're seeing right after the third floor cocktail is going to be this kitchen site, the one you had mentioned previously, saying this is where Jackal's going to thrive. We had seen the Jackal be attacker repicked off and switched over to that IQ. That was the right... Hopefully, with the Inox scanners in play, they'll be able to snuff out that extended roam that RMU like to bring on the third floor. The one objective you don't expect the roam, so I can only anticipate that the objective you would see the roam is going to be even more prevalent. Well, for Brian, things look relatively similar. Haven't really made many attacking changes. You can get away with that, though, on Cafe Dostoevsky. You can kind of attack from the same sort of few operators every single time. There are a couple different moments where you would kind of rather choose to have an additional set of hard breaches, and that becomes a problem if you have RMU play really aggressive on the defense, right? Because you want to have some extra hard breach if your ace is the first pick. If he gets taken out early because he's got the AK-12, you know, you sort of do feel the need to kind of get in there and get a little bit aggressive and use that gun to get your picks. If Bryant lose the ace, it's so impossibly difficult to try to execute without any kind of breaching equipment when you're playing on cafe that you just, you're better off bringing some extra. Bring a backup. You know, Scott, it's good to have backups in life. Defensively, I'm more worried about when it comes to RMU and how quickly Brian have managed to make their way through the building. Look at the pressure we're seeing being applied over towards the bakery side. Already, Simi in the first real duel to go down. It actually does end with their death. A shrug gets them with a vector. Whiskey able to find a commando kill onto Soviet. But Whiskey does lose their life pretty quickly after their to Cheesy with L85. It's a four on three. And while RMU still have that man advantage, notice the pressure that Bryant had been able to facilitate towards RMU's defense. Shrunk's trapped in a rough spot. Easy kill, though, as Cheesy gives away their position by the tracers fired through that soft wall. The Vector now finding its second target in this round, hunting for the third, but Snakes finds a great kill instead. The L85 once again coming out victorious, but Bryant have fallen apart at the seams. TSS loses their life to Zedek. The trade not yet available. Snakes is left all by their lonesome with 45 seconds left stick. That is Diffuser that still needs to be stuck and they still need to make it into sight. Seems like a really rough time to do so. Thatcher really needs a pick to open up and there goes Zedek. He just sort of steps right into the angle and things do become more realistic here for Thatcher's chances. It makes it even more possible now that Warden's sitting prone behind Bunker. A triple kill for the Thatcher and now just left up to the Jaeger. Snakes believes that this final defender's presence might be over by the bakery side. So far... That defender not really eluding himself. And you can see Goalie is over by the red left. stairs, which is going to allow the Thatcher to just get off on a free plant. And so it will be up to Goalie to try to get back in here. And he does. Not too difficult for the Jaeger to close out, but an awesome attempt nonetheless by the Thatcher. Great job to use that highway, that main hall in center of first floor to quickly make that pivot over towards site and finding those kills. RMU will take a second round. That one much closer, a much more difficult affair for them. And truly, they were in a position at one point where it was a 3v1 stick. They had such an advantage. And the fact of the matter is, you let one player find so much impact in that round with L85, which is arguably, I would say, the weaker weapon at Thatcher, but that's because I'm an AR-33 man. Uh, that actually probably just isn't true as a whole. I'm just biased in that regard, but... RMU defensively nice. they win but do they truly win that round as a whole I feel like that's a moral loss to let it get that close at that point in time but they'll head over they have to pick up a whole new objective the expected one would probably be the library side having fireplace hall there as well but I would not be shocked to see mining actually get played as well at some point in this game the five round half it would be very entertaining to see them bring it out just for the you know the shenanigans when it comes down to it but it in fact is going to be reading room and 
defensively RMU will be w very well prepped for this one, but keep in mind the Buck, the Sophia, the clear available to cut the sightlines of those Candelas. Brian are well equipped operator wise and utility wise to take this objective. You see a lot of attacks on, on reading that have got a Nook and a Ying? Um, the Nook is a little bit less common, I would say, but the Ying actually is fairly common in a lot of ways. Candela from above can be a great job to have your players that are looking to step quickly from balcony to swing very quickly through that open door and make a quick plant behind shelf, right? The default plant on reading. It can be really strong, but the problem is... You can also flash your teammates, and those Candelas don't last that long. The blind doesn't do as much. It's effective, but there are definitely better choices. But I do love Ying, so it's impossible for me to, to trash talk Ying. So. Yeah, I, I think I do uh, see the point you're making there with the team flashes. I would be a little worried that Bryant might sort of get tripped up in their own motions if that is uh, The planter doesn't need eye some... stick, though. The planter's That's just fair. Putting, he's just holding the button. He doesn't need his eyes. Retina is not useful I when guess. holding down plant. Well, uh, anyway, with those two operators having been discussed, top of the hold is present here from RMU and a grenade we're gonna see roll over by cocktail. It'll explode in the Iana with a quick replicator to follow it up. However, the uh sorry again, will reactivate. So we'll need to burn that first most and well, there is still the possibility for a C4 to creep up from below. I believe that is the pre presence of Warden, the player, not the operator, lurking Going down back. by mining as the Jackal looking to kind of just creep in the bathroom already having been evacuated. Though. It clears those. The Inox are very effective at trying to snuff out the defensive presence well, still on this attack. third floor. Attackers but Bryant already a minute and a half into this round and have not found a kill, have only taken damage, in fact, by Cheesy, and we're looking a little bit worse for wear. TSS looking to apply pressure over towards C2, has already cleared out the majority of it. Hatch is a great way for RMU to escape in that direction, but mostly it's going to come down to, at least in my opinion, going to come down to using that Gemini Replicator to more success than it just was. They'll use it to drop down below, and unfortunately they get cleared out very quickly, and TSS loses their life because they didn't have the information stepping over to Cocktail, and an SMG-11 cuts their life short by Shrunk, though they do take a little bit of damage in the process. The only, maybe, misplay I'm seeing right now from RMU is the fact that Shrunk has already tossed two of their Toxic Babes, but you don't need the Toxic Babes if you can just play guns up and get kills. They'll find two total. Refragged back by Simi. Sovia does find Whiskey as well, but still three players surviving on both sides and 30 seconds left to play. Gonna be a bit of a brutal one, and Cheesy is gonna say, it's time for me to step in. Zedek with a bit of quirk of positioning, and all of a sudden the Nook seizes in for two. However, one has been down. His goalie will result to the handgun. Cheesy, in the meanwhile, attempting the objective play as the Aruni will look to creep through the Red Hall, and, well, you've got all the attacker guns trained right on this position. Another one's rotated into laundry room, and Semi will put in the victory there. Bryant with their first offensive pickup off of some good play there by Cheesy. Notice that boiling point that was hit there by Bryant. They had reached this. Everything they had gone after that point was culminating to that very penultimate finish where they dove into sight and took control over the objective. Army were completely unaware. Whiskey was reloading and walking across the objective room and reading room. No idea that they were already stepping towards the site. And Brian caught them completely unaware, which gave them not only a point of entry to go for the plant, but also to continue to cascade further onto RMU's defense. The structure fell apart like a house of cards and RMU weren't failing obviously to keep them at bay however with that loss and with that round done you can head back to that third floor an objective that RMU dominated the side of Bryant on despite them only having two players on the third floor two players on the second roaming they still managed to catch every single player of Bryant off guard and get a very nice finish for them what I mentioned on our pregame segment was the fact that you just need to kind of be aware of sort of some of the responsibilities you have as an attacker on this objective. Chiefly of those is being, you know, somewhat 
cognizant of what utility you're going to come up against. And the castle barricades are a large part of that as well. You also have no deployable shields in this composition, but there are two bulletproof cameras. And Bryant have an IQ. They've consistently brought one the majority of this game, which will not only help them with the bulletproof cam, but will also be great for when you've got those Valkyrie black eyes as well, giving you a constant stream of intel. You do not want to be thrown and blown by a C4 that comes from down below. It just isn't going to be a fun time. I really like the idea of what army are bringing to the table, though. Playing with that wrong game was where we had mentioned before makes or breaks Cafe. And Bryant are a team that they don't need to play the second floor. If they feel that it's necessary to clear out maybe Zenic with an Nitro Cell or Shrunk with their own Nitro Cell, whatever it does come down for the extended roam, if they feel it necessary to clear that, then go for it. But at the same time, as long as you're not sticky, as long as you're not keeping your feet very static, as long as you're moving around constantly, it makes it that much harder for RMU's extended roam to find success with that C4, like you mentioned, with the Nitro. And it means that they can be very effective while having less players to deal with an RMU on that third floor. I mean, goalies on the first floor, for goodness sakes, trying to clear out what could possibly be there. They're very much so not prepared for a very quick rush. If Bryant realized that, they could do exactly what they did on that last round, reach that boiling point, and dive onto site to catch RMU unaware again. Still in that sort of early setup phase, you did see a little bit of the use of the Twitch drone there just to march in, clear a couple pieces of utility. And now they've spotted out the first of the Black Eyed cameras as well. They managed to open up the Red Wall. So you've got the pathway forward here for Brian. It's just about picking up the feet and moving faster. You cannot afford to really go super slow here. It's all about keeping a steady stream of momentum, but also realizing, hey, we've got this possibility of a C4 below. It's just going to be a little bit more challenging for the Valkyrie now, who doesn't have that same amount of intel. The new hatch open as well. I mean, you're looking at a side of Bryant that's been super complacent. Honestly, Stinky, I think that's the best way for us to phrase it. They have been hesitant to push forward. They're not trusting of these angles. They know that they got dismantled by army previously, so I understand the hesitancy to push forward a site, but everything has to reach that point, and Cheesy's trying to force it now. They'll drop Skylight, take out one of Warden, but they've lost their teammate of Soviet at the same time. Now being shot from the rear over towards the Freezer side. Pressure coming from Freezer Hall, and Whiskey comes out victorious. In the entire oh. push by Bryant, the unexpected push doesn't seem to work out because nobody pushed with them. That is Diffuser on the ground in C2. Not only do they now need to push up to grab that, but they still need to go for the plant. TSS gets a kill in return. They'll go for a pretty non-standardized plant over towards C2. Now they're going to be able to finish it, but Simi and TSS need to clear out everything by their lonesome, and now it's just Simi because Goalie rushes them down with the Roni and Shrug tags out Simi. A good round for RMU. Three players survive, and they just let Bryant walk straight to him and dealt with them after the fact. It's so puzzling to me that the a sledge creeps through that rotation. Actually, it might have been the Thatcher. He literally got shot by the EMP of the bulletproof camera, and the player at the rotatable still died. Like, that is just... You would think they have the intel so the kill doesn't happen. Either way, though, with the bomb and cocktail, it really becomes kind of a rough spot there. And I think Bryant, if they just sort of moved a little quicker and they got the refrag on that player who came back from Woodstack, they probably would have won the round because of it. They just sort of left the diffuser down for too long and things became very ambiguous for the offense. With no clear goal in mind, they tried to go for the plant, and it was a good call but ultimately they did not have the proper coverage the IQ was sort of trapped in the back of the freezer and she didn't have the sight line enough to protect her teammate during that plant process RMU putting in already three rounds Attackers defensively and, and we're here at the final round can. of the first half I like that you mentioned and alluded to the idea that there was information available for RMU and they didn't use it, which caused them to lose that player. I believe it was Zedek at the time. I may be incorrect about that. Who tried to play that rotation hole and just got shot from it there by Cheesy. We mentioned at the beginning of this when we were vamping earlier on. Information, communication, and being able to precisely, concisely give that intel over is the make or break it point for any team playing Rainbow Six Siege as a whole, any esport as a whole in general, but Rainbow Six Siege with how fast and how slow it can be at the same exact time and how much every little thing matters to such a hefty degree, we noticed that kind of fall short for RMU. Bryant used it in a good way. They got a kill off of it, but 
in the same way that we see a problem occur for RMU, Brian did the same thing. Why are you extending all the way over to C2? That was the diffuser rushing forward, not your entry to do so. And it caused them to drop the diffuser, force TSS to go for the plant in that position because time was running out and they felt themselves in a rough spot. They get it down all good and dandy, but from that point on, would you're forced to defend, split up apart with nowhere to sit pretty because every single sight line is available to the defense and we see that work out against Bryant. We also see this beginning of this round work out against Bryant as TSS, the same player we had earlier disconnect before that rehost, does it again. It's a bit of an unfortunate spot because it does give away your first man and that was uh, the hard breacher there for Bryant, which is not really Ooh. one that's good to lose here. It's important to bring a backup, and, you know, I, I don't want to harp on that too much because that was something completely out of the control of the player, and uh, realistically there, it's it's not something that should have happened. But we're going to have to play it out as is, and Semi strikes back. Good for Semi to get involved. There's been a bit of a consistent presence so far on the Jackal, but also just to trade back that opening death. When you don't have your hard reacher to work with, it's important to orient yourselves into that advantage and work a couple different angles because realistically here, Scott, you're just going to have to take all your utility, all your guns, and probably pile into that whiskey double door. I think he's managed to step into reception first floor is not really being contested early when it comes to rmu on the aggressive stance they're still really relying on that roam game and while effectively brian get first blood there onto goalie they were still down a player early it only tied things out equalizing the man count and it lets whiskey get a nice kill to connect on a soviet which just puts the man count further in rmu's favor now four versus three sammy's working out to the highway hall like i had mentioned earlier but and he also needs to be very wary over towards Small Bakery and Bakery as a whole. And they've lost their teammate at Cheesy, who was applying pressure in a lateral direction. Now it's just Snakes and Simi. And Snakes has been bit in the rear by Shrug with a vector. A very effective player in this matchup as a whole. Now leaving just Simi all by their lonesome. They'll manage to connect with one with a C70 there to Whiskey. Three players they still must cut down by the end of this round if they want a chance. But time is running out, Stick. 25 seconds on the clock. They'll toss a smoke canister over towards Highway, denying sightlines to Small Bakery, but they're trapped by Bar. They're trapped behind Bar. They need to swing to sight, and there is a setup in stone crossfire by RMU, and they're giving away so much information with a break of the barbed wire, and it'll ask for Warden to swing for the final kill. So with the final round put in there in the first half, it is RMU who will take the advantage. They go 4-1, to one, and so we'll have to see how this does transpire. Another question we'll need to answer as well. Does that other player for Bryant get back into the game, or is it going to require a rehost? It would be nice to have a little bit of a break, I suppose, for Bryant, who have been kind of pestered by the disconnection so far. They've not really been able to focus on their own game, and I think that is a kind of an important part for Brian, I've been keeping my eye on Cheesy, who has been having some solid performances so far. I like his, you know, you could call it kind of a rat play. It's sort of the way that to, you describe it. He's been kind of creeping in and has been able to do his job. And now you've lost Soviet as well. So we are going to go to that rehost and we'll see how that does play out. But five round halves, important to talk about that because it's different than the way Siege is typically played. And RMU Robert Morris exit the first half with the advantage, clearly. Yeah, I mean, 4-1 is a pretty solid lineup as well, and we spoke about it earlier. It depends on the teams, but Cafe has fallen to a lot more of an attacker-favorited lineup. You see that a lot in Pro Team, you see that a lot in the upper echelons of Collegiate, and you see that a lot in Amateur as a whole, but we saw a very defensive half there. RMU really picked apart Bryant's attacks. The only way, place we saw Bryant be successful was Reading Room. And with the fact that this is a five-round half, that means that Bryant do not get the chance to re-see Reading Room play it because RMU don't need to pick up their worst objective twice. They can only play it once and be totally fine to bleed that one round. Now, they win this first round, the feel around where maybe Bryant aren't as well adjusted to getting back on the defense and RMU now are at match point at five. How do you adjust beyond that? How do you try to figure out where to work? Because any and all mistakes at this point for Bryant can be the... Well, factor that ultimately sends them over to the loser's bracket and will not have them seeing Penn State in this next matchup, which is where the victor of this game is going to go. And that match is really going to be probably the toughest challenge 
I think everyone agrees. We mentioned this, um, I think it was sort of in between uh, when we were trying to get into round number one, that Penn State look like the tournament favorites, that they've been the team that's got, you know, the, the most individually skilled roster, and it really comes together for Penn State as a solid unit. When you talk about kind of the, you know, the Power Five or, or some of the better, more premier level teams, Penn State, uh, they really hover kind of in the top 20. You never really see them cross the threshold into the top 10, but they have a lot of experience practicing against some of the better teams, getting reps in against squads like North Carolina State, playing teams like Purdue, Converse, and all the rest. And getting that experience is so incredibly valuable because it helps you to understand where your weaknesses are and I think Brian have started to understand where some of their weaknesses lie on the offense. The structure definitely needs a little bit of work, but they should have a little bit of a recompense getting onto this defend defending side. Honestly, with the play style we saw Bryant bring to the table, they do have gunners. They have players that can play at a really high level. We saw that come to fruition there in that first half, but... RMU had the advantage being able to play defensive, being able to turtle up and setting up their own crossfires. Bryant just didn't do a good enough job of gathering information to push forward safely. And I think that's where we're going to see some differences. If RMU can work behind their drones, can follow their entries and, and create space for them, at least gather the intel for that space to vie for map control, then RMU will be very well equipped to take this round and take this half and finish things off strong. But Bryant is a team that will set up crossfires. They're a team that can work together. Notice the pincers. We saw them employ on every one of those objectives. They had a really good pincer when it came to reading room. They still had pressure from above and the quick uh, push. They read the, the kind of environment well to push into sight and get those kills. And we saw them attempt the pincer towards bakery and towards bar to apply pressure when it came to kitchen sight down on first floor. But... They just lost their lives over towards Bakery, which left Bar all by its lonesome and ultimately was going to be cut down at some point or another, which RMU does successfully after about 20 to 30 seconds. Bryant, they have the right idea. The scoreline may not show that. It may not be indicative that they're having something work for them, but I do not think this is a game that is done and dusted as of this point. Bryant can very much so still contest. Yeah, it's not like RMU have played a flawless game so far. There have been a lot of close moments. The first half being, you know, that four-round situation, RMU really stacking up a lot of the sites. They were a little closer, especially that first attack onto Kitchen. Bryant almost had it. It got down to a one versus one because of just a really solid job by Snakes, who got in and really exposed a lot of the targets. The positioning was not on point by RMU. They opened themselves up in a couple different spots there, and they definitely did that as well when you look to the top floor, and, you know, it could have been a closer half, and there is, I agree with you, still a chance that Bryant will creep back into this game, but whether or not we're going to get this additional player in is still a question we'll have to wait and answer because at this point it looks like probably going to require a rehost. but uh anyway with how this is going brian i think just need to get into this next round look to bar and cocktail and just kind of secure a win with some confidence there's nothing else that you can really do here take this you know immense amount of time that you've got during the tech pause to discuss what you're going to do defensively, how you're going to outlast Robert Morris's attack. Now, I hate to mention it, but Simi plays for Valorant. That's one of the notes that we actually have for the Bryant Sides Valorant team. So they're well versed when it comes to timeouts and tech errors when those do occur, however rare those are in Valorant. You have a timeout for every half in every league that you're going to play. That's the standardized rule set. You have a timeout for every half. It's use it or lose it, right? And the best way to use those timeouts is when you know that the opposing team has momentum. You are stopping that ball from rolling further because right now, RMU's momentum, RMU's pressure is like a boulder rolling down a hill. It's not going to pick anything up. It's not going to be stopped. And you have to get out of the way of it, which is what Bryant have been failing to do. They, able, they were able to slow it down for just a little bit, putting both hands out in front of them. But it just kept rolling thereafter. The pressure, the arms gave out their attempts at bringing life back into the Bryant attack fell short. And now Bryant get to try to do the same thing again, where they can hold out same way RMU did, but now on the defense. And they have to get their own ball rolling. The, their own side of the court in motion. And like I mentioned earlier, the victor of this will continue here within the winner's bracket. They will face off against Penn State. You had a bye in that last, in, in, the, in this round as a whole of the games won. But then we have the game that's coming up of cuts down in UMBC. And the victor of that one will face Drexel, who also had a bye. So, I mean, you're looking at the winner of this one. 
who's doomed to face what we argue would be the number one seeded Penn State. That's a lot of pressure as well. Anything and everything is what you need to get practiced at a point. Honestly, Stick, it feels like this game is a warm-up for Penn State. And if you're struggling in this warm-up match as a whole, it could be even worse for them. It's a fair point. Things will get a little bit ugly if you lose out here and it starts to get a little bit more kind of downhill because it's double elimination. Lose twice and you are out of it. But we're having some more extended difficulty, so we are going to head to a break. When we come back, we should be able to finish up with Cafe. Welcome back, everybody. I think we're pretty much ready and ready to go once again. Sticula, we're back on Cafe. And like we saw before, scoreline very much so in favor of RMU, who's now heading over to the attack. And they've looked solid defensively. The question is, can they replicate the same success? They need two rounds total to reach six and be done and dusted here for round one. What's so funny? What's got you chuckling? I just find it so funny, dude. I find I find I find our time together so much fun, Stick. Well, that's good news because it's, it's <laughs> gonna be a long one, and we need to have fun. Yeah. See, just a game. We play games to have fun, and we're into the second half. Again, Attack I do want to continue to reinforce the fact that these are five round halves. It's not normal. It's not uh, the usual way that Siege is played. And that's not a bad thing. You know, there's plenty of different ways to play Siege. Just because of the uh, schedule that we've got here. We've got five round halves to make things move a little bit quicker. And so if you're confused, if you thought, oh, maybe there, there was an error in the rehouse. No, this is the second half. We're into the first round of the second half. And things are moving on. Let's keep in mind as well, right, with the fact that there's a five round half, we did not get to see Bryant head to the same objective they'd already won, because Army would pick that as their third objective of choice, which means that it would have been their third round and sixth round we would have seen that reading room side, but with no sixth round on that half, Bryant are now forced with only one victory total, which means that they're going to need three rounds in a row to tie things out, and they're going to need four to get the go-ahead, and RMU... Only needs two rounds to win this map of Cafe as a whole. And we mentioned earlier, the Rome game that can really set things in stone. And RMU used it quite effectively. We can see Bryant trying to do the exact same thing here. Simi's working within Sargar Lounge. I honestly don't like this position, though. They're a little bit too isolated and a little bit too out in the open, all things considered. They could be cheeky for one, but... You're relying on a lot if you're hoping that a second trade will come after. I think RMU will just cut them down as quick as it happens. Things definitely look different from the way that RMU had structured their defenses. We will not see anything like the Castle or the Jaeger in this composition. Instead, bringing operators like the T-Bird, the Vigil, even the Cab Can, having those traps as well can be a bit frustrating if you're trying to take the challenge and you accidentally walk into an EDD and it suddenly blows your leg off. Maybe you could get lucky and reach the objective and there's a Kona station from the defense to go ahead and heal you up. But so far, RMU not having made a lot of movement, and it sort of feels sort of like a repeat of how things went on the very Bomb first round. By attackers. Got Lurks down Shrug, below, though. Go. Might be interested to see what Shrug can do with that skeleton key. I often mention you know, that buck pick does generally lean you towards more of a cocktail take. I don't know if that's exactly what Shrug is going to do, but he is going to make life more difficult for the Bryant defenders in the back of cocktail. I see them working actually on this second floor. You can see them up in the top right of the screen there. Shrug is playing not on the third floor, which is the expected push for a lot of teams. Trying to be all over the place and yet nowhere at once can be very solid, but using that verticality, unfortunately on the wrong end of it, if you're an Anakin Skywalker fan, uh, the high ground much more important in a lot of ways, a lot easier to hit the head, which is a one-shot kill in R6, when it's basically the only thing there looking top to bottom, but... Here goes the Vigil of Simi. They had the opportunity oh, to Whiskey, no. but Whiskey Attack comes out on top bomb. and comes out with the first blood now for RMU, but Whiskey's life short-lived as Soviet holding Pixel, managing to find the refrag back. And there goes one more goalie killed off. Snakes finds a kill for themselves as well to Zenic. Two players surviving and not thriving for RMU as Warden are left with Shrug to work out the rest of this round. There's another one in from the Bryant team. It's left just up to the Therm. And he's still just sort of hanging out over here by Cigar Lounge. He's got a constant spotted red ping from that evil eye. And he's just going to rotate back. 
It's going to run out of time here, and it's realistically an impossible situation for the Thurman. So Bryant will get their first round. I mentioned important for Bryant to win this first one defensively. Get yourself going with that momentum. And I think another point about this, a little bit more nuanced, we saw through the first half, it was kind of a slow game for a lot of the members on the Bryant roster. All of them really getting some participation there in the first round. Now, participation medal may not seem like the highest of praise just outright, right? <laughs> I mean, Stick, you're saying they all participated, but it's so important in an eSport. It's so important in R6 for everyone to be doing their job and working effectively. And the fact of the matter is, you can tell when a team is very well coordinated because everyone's applying and... and fragging out and using their utility correctly Attack and positioning themselves correctly. And that was what Brian did in that round. But this is also the feeler round. This is the round where Army look at it and say, okay, we don't expect to win. We love a win. But we're also just trying to figure out how Bryant played defensively. And for that objective, they're doomed to see it once again. They'll have to because Bryant can head back to it here in just two more rounds, this and the next thereafter. They know that they'll have to head back to it at some point, and RMU can play it a little bit differently and try to adapt on the mistakes that they made. And I think the biggest mistake that they made there in that round stick was the complacency and hesitancy to push. They got the first blood, but why is Whiskey alone in Cigar Lounge pushing? You don't need the verticality on the second floor to the third, because Bryant can just use it against you. Those are called hell holes for a reason, because both sides can find kills, and it's favored for the top floor instead. We're gonna go to kitchen. We'll see what's next in the Bryant rotation for RMU. They haven't really brought as many of the same operators as Bryant did. We've seen both of these two rosters play kind of a different brand of competitions. RMU will consistently keep that Thatcher up. Why wouldn't you? Having those EMP grenades really makes life a lot easier. But we're gonna have more operators like the Buck and even the Nomad as well. Making sure you lock down those flanks so you don't have any Bryant members kind of creeping back up on you. To compare and contrast the two different takes that we've seen from these rosters so far, when Bryant attacked on a kitchen, they did a direct take. They really just went right for the bakery area. They didn't try to fool around with clearing any of the top floor pressure. Different idea here for RMU. They know they've got the buck. They want to use that skeleton key to get all the different vertical pressure. So they're going to need to clear out the top floor, and they're going to have to challenge up against Semi on the alibi. Aren't you taking first blood? Could be important here for them. They don't obviously have it yet. It's R6 at its finest, but they have cleared out the third floor. And that is control necessitated for them as well to apply pressure vertically. Trying to gain early spotlights. Maybe catch a player off guard. The third floor is clear, but they've got to go to the first at this point still. They still need to play smart. Simi's in a good spot for them to kill. They're being flushed out of reading room, spotted now by a drone. You made your way to Fireplace Hall, you now must escape it. So you've had to set your own graveyard in stride. Is the hatch open for, for Frieza? Do they have the drop away? They've been removing a lot of these drones of RMU, which is effective. A very important factor for giving themselves a chance, but... There's a player ready to swing, and Simi gets the upper hand. Whiskey again! Solo swinging in engagement instead of having two ready to go for it. And RMU, same mistakes they made in that first round of the second half, they're doing once again here. They will at least get the trade. Semi is cut back, but Bryant spending just so much time forcing RMU to be so incredibly slow in going for that top clear. And then to not get the kill flawlessly either. To let Semi still pop up for one just because you can't really push in two at the same time. And you're running low on drones as well. They do have the vertical. Sort of their last hope here, their last ditch attempt to get any sort of value out of that top pressure. And Snakes is forced into a really particularly tricky spot where he's got one over by the whiskey door. He's got the vertical pressure being opened up, but RMU running a little low on time and no advantage in the man count to be found. Even now it's cheesy to step one up. Shrug, sure he's got it. And they're flooding the kills from RMU, but you've got Soviet. Luckily, it's the buck to go ahead and dig things out here for RMU as they were cover in a spot that I honestly thought they wouldn't be able to. 
I am actually extremely impressed as well here, Stick. RMU pulling that one out of seemingly nowhere, in all honesty. And it comes off the back of that verticality. I mentioned Anakin earlier, and we're seeing that come true. Unlike, spoiler alert, the Anakin actually in the film. But the high ground is so important in R6. They tried to play the low ground in that first round of the half, and they tried to solo swing these angles. Those were the two major faults of RMU for that third floor push. And they made the same mistake of solo swinging as the same player as well to solo swing, which is why it was even more prevalent of Whiskey doing uh, and having a mistake there. But the verticality, if they can get it working for them, like in that last round, it's such an easy situation to come back from. They paid off, and they did exactly that. Bryant now have to figure out, how do we play from here? We can head back over to the kitchen site. That's what they're going to do since they lost it. But they also can head back to the third, right? If, if I recollect, I mean, why not try something else at some point or another? It'll be the next round when you see it, but... I mean... Come on, at this point, RMU... They can just repeat the same exact thing they did last time, and they just really need to do a semi first without losing a player. I feel like I've started to see this a little bit more. Obviously, there's been changes to Aguayo and his gadget. It's way different than it used to be. I see a lot of people who will put the Vulcan either on a barricade. That way, when you shoot open the barricade, the Goyo Vulcan you know, doesn't have anything to stick on anymore, so it explodes and the fire goes everywhere. But also on the actual wall itself. What's your take on that is not really a strategy where you set the Vulcan to where, you know, you're going to shoot it when it comes time for the execute, but instead you're just sort of setting it as a trap that, you know, detonates when the attackers make some progress? I mean, think about... Think about how R6 works as a whole, right? You can't look at every single angle and be ready at a moment's notice. The less you have to swing to use a piece of utility, the more effective it is, right? Even if you don't get to... Uh, pop it as safely as you could before the Vulcan shields, right? You can still be effective by buying time and think about how slow both RMU and Bryant were def uh, on the attack to push. If they hard breach down the wall in Freezer where there is a Vulcan canister placed and it goes down and explodes, it puts fire down and now RMU are locked out for 10 seconds, minimum, to try and wait out the fire and flames that are now placed. I think it's a genius play to put down those Vulcan shields where they're doomed to go down if the attack forces it and not the defense. Essentially making that utility retroactive instead of proactive, which makes it so much easier to utilize. Well, Semi, again, scoring a kill in the early game, and you've lost Whiskey as well as Zedek. Still a defender trapped inside that VIP area, and it looks like they are aware of this as well. Cheesy on a terribly slim portion of health, and it doesn't take much for Shrug to end the life there. A distant toss of the EMP grenade, and Warden will go ahead and use the exothermic, so that Vulcan on the other side will quickly detonate on the follow-up here. Well, RMU still needing to kind of get some preparation going, as so they're going to look to execute again. But are they going to have that same vertical pressure they used last time? They don't have they don't have Shrug up on the second floor right now. Instead, they're taking a very first floor, very one-dimensional approach to this site, and. While it has worked to at least equalize on three on three, Simi's effectiveness early cannot be understated. So much value gained for Bryant. A good chance for them to continue to hold on. Snakes and TSS each find one. It leaves just Warden left standing. They basically barely come out on top in that next engagement, but a Claymore from Goalie takes out Soviets. And now you can use the Kona station of uh, of Cheesy over on the Bryant side to your favor, oh! and Warden doesn't even stick the Planned. They hop off, they go for the swing, and they get the kill. An unprecedented result to get that aggressive, almost greedy in a way, but they eat up, and RMU will take this first map 6-2. Electrifying final moment there from Warden as the Fragmites pop up in the one versus three, when it looked like Bryant finally had an advantage defensively, that they were ready to close out there on Kitchen. Warden says it's my time to shine, and Robert Morris will close out the first game of the day here at the Cutstown Land with a 6-2 result, not leaving a lot of questions on the board, but certainly a position where Bryant gave a good fight. And you're looking at that map as a whole and saying Bryant had a really good first round of that scenario. 
The second one, they fell to the verticality. And in the third one, there was no verticality. Semi does an amazing job of finding two frags almost instantaneously. They do get traded out, but that's value. That is an unexpected gain for their side. And now you look at it and say, well, what went wrong in the one dimensionality where they have that advantage? The Claymore kill, unexpected. I'm not sure how they fell to that one. I think it was actually placed towards highway and main hall. The second one came through, and it's a kill gained by barely winning out in an engagement. And then the third one, the hop up. Expected result for the final few moments of that round, but RMU had already started to bury the side of Bryant. They just needed to put the last bit of dirt back over that grave to finish the job. And that's the problem as with R6 as a whole. If you have a really bad half, it's extremely difficult to make that recovery, and Bryant fell short of doing it. Yeah, I, I think they did show a couple glimmers there, but some mistakes ultimately that they really could not afford to allow. When you're in a three versus one, man, you just have to close that out. How are you running into a Claymore where you, when you know where the last attacker is? That just, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. You know, those traps, I hate traps. I'm not a big fan of trap operators, Claymores, anything like that. But you got to be ready for them. You know, you can't just wish for them not to be there. And it's unfortunately, it, it, it's kind of a troll to walk into a Claymore to sell that advantage. But ultimately, I think Brian have learned some valuable lessons. And it's a double elimination tournament for a reason. Their chances are not completely out of it yet. Now, they will have to drop to the loser's bracket, though, when things come down to it. I think we'll have a little bit more information about who's in the loser's bracket at a certain point in time. But that does set in stone that RMU have a doomed game against Penn State. I say doomed isn't it's, it's going to happen. Maybe not that they lose that, but it is a very difficult matchup. All things considered that we had called out so many times that Penn State was the favorite team coming into this one. They're a well-known university. They're climbing up the echelons of the Collegiate R6 scene, and they have done a very good job of making their name known. And now RMU has to face off against that prepared or at least warmed up after seeing that first game but we do have an interview we'll throw it over to the host to get that interview underway as well i think that is ready so uh we'll hopefully see you guys back with a new set of casters as well for that next matchup uh i made a sign just special for this for this exact time because i'm not crotch stuff <laughs> like this is not not correct crotch stuff will be will be here later he's a lovely lovely guy very excited uh for him but excited just to get into this siege because you know as you can tell we're not American. So that might have been a mm. few, like a bit of a shock to some people at home. We are not American. We are from Ireland and from the UK. So we're, we're from across the pond, you might say. So we're very excited. Like this is a whole different region of Siege with different habits, different personalities. Very excited to get into it. Really looking forward to this one. A massive shout out to Infernosis and Sticky game number two if you need subtitles please let us know in chat because i know i can be a little bit excitable whenever i cast some siege but we have the hometown novi kutstown taking on the university of maryland baltimore county and you know it's a double elimination bracket so a loss here isn't the end of the world but you really want to start the day off for, by with a win don't you yeah, of course. You want you want you want to start off with a win, but also you want to stay in that upper bracket. Dropping down into that lower bracket means your back is against the wall. It's we call it the crocodile swamp over here in in UK and UK. Um, so is is essentially where you don't want to be purely because yes, you have that lifeline, but when you go down into the the pressure mounts. Every single every single mistake could be the one that sends you home, sends you packing, sends you out of the tournament. So neither one of those teams want to get there. And if you stay up in the upper bracket, I believe you end up skipping out an extra game you have to play in the lower bracket. So the further you make your run, the easier your life is going to be, essentially. And the less games you have to play, less things you're going to show. Speaking of showing, we have been showing the operator bands. And interestingly enough, the, the one that jumps out to me Gibson, is Zofia being banned? Yeah, I think that's a direct target at that LMGE. We know that they've changed the meta a lot over the last few months, Novi. You know, and I think it all kind of started with that ban on Ash, where people started migrating on their masses to playing Zofia, and then they nerfed the Zofia AR 
and everyone started using the LMG E Novi, and it's just completely changed the way this game plays. Yeah, you hold down left click and you walk into the opponent and you've got so many rounds in the in the mag it doesn't matter because the defender has a p10 roni or an smg 11 and has run out of bullets within half a second and you can't do anything so you, it is the meta at the moment i'm presuming we're probably going to get some quite harsh changes but banning the zofia does leave the thinker open and interestingly enough, I think personally, Finca is way, way stronger than Sophia at the moment. You've got the frag grenades, you've got the uh, adrenaline boost as well to give the extra HP, plus the LMG and the guns. There's just so much going for this operator, and she can kind of blow open the game. You don't necessarily stick her in entry, it's more of a second entry kind of role. And she is so, so. Attackers are moving to defuse a bomb. Yeah, it's such a great operator. I do see that the attacker repick was used where Rogers has switched over to the Maverick and Head now will be rocking that Finca. But it's so good to see Theme Park back in the competitive setting. And a lot of the past hasn't over because initiation used to be that third site potentially the teams jumped onto. But as of right now, we have hopped over and we're seeing it being ripped out of the bag first off. Yeah, it's interesting. Throne Room was usually the go-to primary site. You know, well, back in the day, it was some daycare bunk or whatever. But Throne Room, after the rework, was this bastion of defensive site. You should be winning that 100% of the time. And actually, since being back in the pool, even in pro play, we've seen it start to slip by the wayside. It could be a number of things. It could be the, the changes to the meta, like you said, for in terms of attackers. could also be the fact that because it's a primary site, it's the one that everyone ends the most, both into as an attacker and as a defender. And so now you're looking for other options purely to unsettle the attackers a little bit more, give you that slight advantage in terms of sort of reading the game and knowing where it goes. KZM PR is looking for the engagement though. Gets the first one into skirt. Brat like instantly just sprints off into bunk. But kind of needs to back away because only on 10 HP. But that's UMBC taking all the first blood. But there has been a reply. The thunder's coming in the form of Thundy, but it gets traded off. Yeah, we're back into a 3v3 situation. Make that a 3v2 as KZ triples down, picking up a third king. He's third kill. He's only got a couple of HP points on the board, but he's got lots of bullets in that gun. But look at that. Head tosses a nade. We spoke about how Finca can be important, but going to get traded out almost instantly. And now it's all down to Rogers, the Maverick, in the 2v1. One minute left on the clock, though. So there's plenty of time to decide what to happen. But Buckting gets the kill with the SM. MG11 and on defense the University of Maryland Baltimore County take the first round but Novi there was a lot of swings and roundabouts in that one yeah cuts down had a very very good foothold despite uh the best efforts of the Jaeger in, in in KZ's hands UMBC sort of, I don't want to say got lucky by any means, but Cuts Down had that advantage and they shouldn't have allowed that Finca to get so close in that situation. There should have been some kind of answer. So Attackers both teams not looking bomb. invincible despite UMBC getting that first win. They're both showing positive signs, but also a few mistakes here and there. KZ though sitting on three kills, so opening up the game very, very well. It's just a case of Cuts down, I think, calming down a little bit in that mid round. He sort of got away from them after Thunder got them that advantage. Yeah, and I think what KZ showed in that was his ability to win those 1v1s too, Novi. We, we talk about, especially in the EU side of things, how important it is that you don't give skilled players 1v1s. You have to be in a situation where you can get that instant trade. But they just weren't in that position. It allowed KZ to pick up those three kills early days and you know, in a first round of a land, picking up those three kills, that's going to give him a lot of confidence going into the day too. Yeah, sticking it, Infernosis said this earlier as well on the cast. They said, what you kind of need to look at as a player is if you're not the entry frag or you're the support player, you still need to do your role. You need to do what's expected of you and you need every single person, regardless of role, to do that job. That is your responsibility. And so even and it, you know, you're probably maybe not as fraggy as the other entry fragger. Well, adapt your plan, get your team aligned, 
and then do your job entry well. Have a person on backup to trade. We kind of saw that with UMBC, what they were doing on the defensive side rather than the attack. Looking at it from Cutstown right here. But we swapped over to Bunk and Daycare, so the other sort of top floor site. So interesting that uh, throne room's not throne room armory is not being picked. But understandable, especially in terms of the meta at the moment. Cuts down, slowly making their way through, going east to west, working their way through this top floor. But this is an opportunity, Gibson. We could see someone going underneath and throw some up nades. That would really be a possibility to open up this round for them. It definitely would be, but as things stand, they are going for that horizontal take, and that take has been slowed down just a little bit as Joe slams the head of Rogers. He's going to fall, making it a 5v4. But yeah, back on your point, you've just lost Finca. That's two nades down, but you still got a lot in the tank. Skirt has got two. You've got one for head, so you need to use that utility. We sp in the past, you would have spoke about how important it was to get kills with those C4s on defense. Well, those nades have become such a vital tool of the attacker lineup as well especially when you bring six of them with finka mav and sledge but kz and co just rinsing cuts down at the moment to two versus five a very solid round so far still one toxic bay canister left in the chamber head is removing the head of massive but in has gone down that might be a bit of an issue head seems to be dragging his team through this round, but it's not enough. It's all on Thunder left to try and capitalize this awkward situation. And there we have it. UMBC move forwards 2-0 and o on defense on Theme Park, though. That's important to stress. This is defense. You know, you can go 4-2 down, but as long as you get to swap side and have your time to shine, we've seen of times before teams bouncing back. Yeah, it's all about getting that desirable split when whenever you play it. To me, it's not a panic station yet for Kutztown. You know, this is the round that you expect to win. Going into the third one, Armory Throne, really what they got to decide to do now is which of those walls are you going to breach through? Do you go through barrels? Do you go through yellow stairs? Do you go through maintenance? There's so many different entryways into this site, Novi. And with the addition as well of the can openers, that utility that came in in the last 12 months, it's kind of changed the way those attacker lineups are going now too because this is a site where in the past you would have seen two hard breachers being taken you can get away with one now if you take an attacker with that utility but it doesn't look like that's something that cuts down have decided to do yeah it's always an option that they can bring it usually when it is brought is often in the hands of buck or zero those seem to be the two operators which tend to bring that piece of utility but looking over at the defensive side, we're seeing the anti-utility strat themselves. KZ with the Jaeger, you got Joe on the Wumai, you've then got the Bandit and the Mute for that denial, as well as the uh, information denial at the same time, and the Malusi also to soak up that utility uh, against the attackers, especially when they're bringing these, what, three lineups of grenades? The two smokes, the flashes, the, there's a lot of projectiles to burn through. And they sort of identified that a potential option for them to bring would have been, instead of the Malusi, the Aruni uh, with the Shere Gates would be really, really useful just to dampen and remove that extra piece and force Cutstown to expend more. But at the moment, UMBC is setting the pace and that's coming off the back of this roam as well from the Malusi on the top floor. Could be an interesting one. Depends if she gets spotted out. Yeah, clearing the roamers is such an important role and Thunday pushing right up already onto that maintenance door at the bottom of Dragon Stairs. So Kutztown wasting no time in gathering map control. But I think that pre-fire actually is going to cover the steps of Malusi getting ready to come down those Dragon Stairs. Thunday having a little look down that long corridor. They've given away where this attack's coming from. It's so obvious, but now for UMBC, it's a matter, Novi, of just holding down the fort, identifying where those weaknesses are now, and just, you know, reinfor you know reinforcing would be the wrong word, but getting ready for this attack. Preparing for it, because you know that the rolling thunder is going to start rolling through. That's the first one. Joe goes down. Excellent entry. Traded. Actually, not traded. Onto an opposite player in the form of Tom's. The Thermi has already done his job. 
the rest of the team can now decide how they want to approach this. There's still frag grenades in hand. There's three frag grenades to be used. They could easily clear out some of these positions, which are entrenched right at the back of the site. Thundee playing with fire out in the open, but it's Ed who's going to take the first entry. Buckton replies. So does KZ. And suddenly this is all falling apart for cuts. Rogers still yeah. has the frag grenades, Gibson, but they haven't used them yet. Yeah, I know they've got to use them. You need to find some sort of a pick. KZ is low HP, massive and bucking. Still anchored down on site as well. And there, Rogers opens up the dinner bell, gets that first kill on the massive in the situation. But Rogers gets a double down. And it's a 1v1 now for the one. They know exactly where the defender is. Head takes the head of KZ and cuts down, pull one back. Much better from cuts down. Good execute. Well, I, I want to say late round decision making uh, was very on point for their players. And if they show a bit more of that, especially into the other sites like initiation office, we could quite easily see this go the other way and then start to pick up a couple uh, more rounds just seems like they need to work a little bit on that coordination you saw thundy change position not quite sure in which way to approach and there was stacking of attackers onto multiple choke points it could have been disastrous gibson of a multi-kill coming up because the attackers aren't spaced correctly yeah, they're not, and it's something that you can work on. We've got a little bit of what looks like a tactical pause here, so it's an opportunity maybe to even discuss that a little bit more. But you got to say, Kutstein are going to take a lot of confidence from that one because there was a moment, Novi, when it was that 3v2 situation where you thought that it wasn't going to play into the hands of Kutstein, but they got, Rogers got those two very important opening kills you know, in that 3v2 situation to give them the ability to push up onto site. But so far, they're very linear attacks, aren't they? If I could start Novi, they're going in from one side mm. of the map and they're sticking to it. Yeah, the individual players are looking good on cuts down. Just want a little more coordination between them. Get a bit more dynamic because at the moment, UMBC, like you said, because it's linear, they see you coming. They know where you're coming from. They can prepare for it. Throw a player underneath, throw a player on flank watch or, or sort of counter roaming, if you will, just to, to cause a little bit spot. more pressure on the UMBC lot and you're not relying on individual position uh, performance just to bring them across the line. Yeah, exactly. But individual performance, that's what it's all been about for KZ so far. He's having a field day going six and two. He's got Jaeger ready and Novi... We are on that old school 5-5 five, five split as opposed to the, you know, the, mo the more modern 6-6 six, six split where it's first to seven. Now it's really first to six. Because of that, you don't quite get two full rotations of sights on defense. How much do you think that's going to impact the way these games play out? Weirdly enough, I think quite a lot, especially on maps like this where they most likely feel a lot more confident confident on their primary and secondary as opposed to their tertiary site as we just saw umbc pretty much had everything lined up for them and sort of fumbled because rogers was allowed the ability to kind of just do what he wants in that situation having the option of getting to play your primary and secondary back to back is just a huge huge advantage and we could see depending on it, it kind of changes the way in which you to picks because suddenly maps where you do are that strong on them you should try and prioritize because you can quite easily take a 4-1 split and finally we're seeing a frag grenade kill i was waiting they're bringing six of them i was expecting a dozen kills by this point with the frag grenades but they've got their first with it it's in the hands of skirt and what a way to open the round that's the bandit off the table so no option to bandit trick later down the line Yes, and with the operators they have, they can just shoot that little hole in the barrel's wall, toss the nade up, and get that wall wide open. Thunday as well, doing a lot of work on the attack inside as well, of just watching that flank, getting that intel. Here comes the utility dump, and that's exactly why you bring an operator like Nomad as well. It's so important that when you have a lot of nades, no way, that you also back it up bringing you know that secondary stone utility stones flashes things that can burn it as they just kill feed lights up again no way it's a 4v3 yeah it was skirt trading one for one on the eyed but casey he's just doing casey things eight and two two in the round and that's gonna destroy the cuts down assault onto the site umbc 
in a very strong position, but there is time. The issue is UFBC have rotated above Tom's right here. And on the hatch, you can see Buckting, I believe, is just waiting patiently. And Tom's getting aggressed from the other side of the site. With a minute remaining, cuts down, need to regroup and re-strategize. Otherwise, UMBC is getting this round for free. Yeah, and I love the way the defenders are playing this. You know, like I said, playing the two floors, playing that verticality the other way around. Normally, you expect the attackers to do it, but the defenders are doing it so well. Tom, though, manages to sneak into the site, but his head is going to get taken off straight away by M. Tekel. Let's see if we can get the refrag. No, we can't. M. Tekel on the double, and that is another round for UMBC, and they are going to be absolutely delighted, Novi, with the way that this first split has gone. Yeah, because that could have been a really rough round, but they managed to bring it back under control, especially with that early advantage and cuts down. It's kind of been kicking themselves there. That was a very winnable opportunity. But it comes down to, like you said, that linear attack is really, really hindering them later into the rounds because they're not opting to check off certain things on the attacker checklist. Usually in that situation, Attack especially when it's a any map really, when it's a bottom floor site, you want to clear above first and then you work your way down. Yes, it takes a lot more time, but the advantage of that is you clear it and remove the possibility that a defender can get to that position. If they do, they'll have to run through flight drones, they'll have to run through nomad air jabs or claymores. It gives you more options and more freedom in the attack later down the line. So it's a risk reward balance sort of thing that you have to uh, have to balance on the attack. Cuts down went for, in theory, a very safe start, but it ended up being a very risky end to the round in the execute. Five seconds remaining. Yeah, it was. It all comes down, like you pointed out, to the fact that the defenders were able to play on both, you know, both floors of the map to keep that pressure on. This is the last opportunity for UMBC to take a 4-1 split in. They lost the trophy once they picked it up again, but we're going to have an attempted spawn peek. But Tom is going to take the head of KZ and maybe Novi. He was just a little bit of a victim of his own good start there. And, you know, confidence sometimes can lead to a little bit of complacency. Yeah, the Achilles heel or Icarus before the fall with the wings melting. It's that sort of thing. Maybe Casey goes a little too aggressive and gets punished for it. But this, who cares? For cuts down, you've got the opening kill and it's onto the top fragger of the entire server. They should be running this one home. But UMBC still mounting defense. You can see they've gone very almost passive in their approach. Beforehand, they're playing a little more dynamically. But actually, they've left Joe to it on the smoke. And this is a bit of a risk. I dig it because the SMG 11 is amazing. His bucking is proving onto skirt. But with the smoke of all operators, you've got those toxic babe canisters. You've got the smoke grenades. You want to keep those late into the round. If you get picked off too early, that could be a bit of an issue. But so far... Both sides slow down. It's in that 4v4 situation as we hit the halfway mark. A situation now where that push is getting ready to start. Thunder's opened up those lines of sight. And M Tekel's going to get knocked by the Nade. Rogers finishes him off by the Finca. And now they've got the 4v3. They can trade their way to victory. But they're pushing up through the bathroom. Thunder. He knows there's likely somebody in and around the vault, but are you going to get the kill? Swings around the corner. Peeker's advantage. Thunder gets a kill. And now it's all down to Joe. SMG 11, just 17 bullets in the mag in a 1v4 situation. And with smoke offsite, unavailable or unable to stop this push, the task has become a monumental one for Joe. He's just biding his time. He's waiting to see if he can get that open and pick for free and seeing if one of those attackers become complacent. He spots out the head in the vault, misses a shot though. And with 25 seconds left, Novi, you gotta say this looks like the job done for Kutstown in round number five. Oh, that was a nice headshot though, but you really need to be hitting the rest of them too. Too many body shots, not enough heads. And head cuts down Joe, and there we go. Cuts down, taking another round on the board on their attack. And to be honest, good job. That was a lot cleaner, especially when it came to that execute. You could see a little bit messy at the start, but in that actual call onto the execute, they worked their way round, cleared out each point of the site, rolling their way through. 
it was just a lot cleaner than we've seen previously. And they really needed that round. They needed that 3-2 split because unlike, as you said, usually we'd have six rounds. We're on five rounds. So we're now getting to swap sides. We're seeing a different flavor for the defense. We're seeing the mozzie mute combination. So prioritizing the anti-information as opposed to the anti-utility with the Wumai Jaeger. Well, Intel, as always, has been a king in Siege, especially whenever you can use it to get a real good lay of the land, work out where those defenders are, and plot your attacks. So it looks like Cutstown, they've gone for the Intel denial, like you've said. And when you look at the attack, that, or the attack that's been brought by UMBC, they've also stocked up on their nades, Novi. They could potentially have six to bring, depending on the loadout that they take. Not only that, you've got the good old-fashioned Thermite to play with and the Nomad, so they're going to work on maybe shutting down any kind of a flank that Kutztown might be looking to bring. But they have decided to go to Throne first, and it's a very different approach that UMBC have taken. What do you see in this defender setup that might lead to some you know, stumbling blocks for UMBC? I think it's if they assume that cuts down isn't going to roam like they uh like umbc did or don't respect the roamers that's usually what catches people out when attacking especially on a map like theme park where it's so large compare it to say coastline or border which is now on the map pool as well you've got a lot smaller map with less room and less sort of dynamic gameplay for the defensive in terms of the roam with this it's massive you can just yeet off over a balcony and disappear for a solid minute and a half and not get seen by another player. It's a huge, colossal map, similar to Villa. And if UBC don't consider that and aren't aware of their flanks, don't have people watching the flank drone, things like that, they will get punished for it by Cutstown. And those roamers will make mincemeat of the team, get that opening kill, and they should be able to convert the round. Yeah, and it's been a very slow start to the round two as UMBC, they're just you know prodding tempting trying to work out where those defenders are and joe rings the dinner bell with the first kill m tackle gets the second as they turn it in to a 5v3 and the roaming game has been absolutely wiped out and now it is time to anchor hard on defense for the remaining kutstown players tom rogers and head they need to work really hard to repel any sort of attack that umbc bring but novi with a minute and you know 10 seconds left on the clock by the time i finish making my point they have so much time to play with still so much time a minute 10 remaining and cuts down very troublesome position umbc are looking to circle for the kill you see tom's rotating around but currently isn't anywhere near he's on the flank he's pretty much going to rely on him rogers and head is kind of going to have to just hold the tide of umbc players off and now into 50 seconds this is where things get a little bit tight because the attackers they had 30 seconds for free still what have they managed to gain they are not in a position to execute as of yet but without a smoke the mute instead it does mean you have no toxic canisters to keep them at bay joe finding that third kill of the round leaves two left on the defending side ripping them apart joe on a triple on an absolute tear rogers is gonna try and hold on gets one has to reload switches to the cz but don't believe they're gonna find anyone there's someone prone there mate you gotta shoot him switches around the corner the map goes down rogers is trying to deny it but the plant has managed to go off takes a breather to reload and starts to mount the assault to try and get this round back in hand yeah, needs to take his 1v1s, and he's not going to take any of them as massive. Has a massive impact on that round. Gets the final kill, and all of a sudden, UMBC are 4-2 up. And really, you got to say, I thought that Cutstown did a great job in the first minutes of stopping the attack. You know, contesting the point of entry so that UMBC couldn't get into the map and around cash. But... Within the space of a couple of seconds, then they lost both roamers and all of a sudden momentum swung massively in the favor of UMBC. And Novi, we spoke about this before, back before, you know, the last time we worked together. Momentum and confidence can be like a sixth player on the team. When you get that on your side, suddenly you start hitting all your shots and the game just feels a lot easier. Yep. 
it's, it, it's really the mental game, isn't it? It's when you're feeling good, mm -hmm. you play better. When you're feeling bad, you play worse. It sounds so simple, but it is true. It's all the way through every single esports, every single regular sport. Most of the things in life is kind of like that. So you kind of need to get yourself in that frame of mind where even if things aren't going your way, you still sort of reset mentally. You reset what you're doing as a team. You get them on board. And IGL in this situation, if you're in Cutstown, you kind of need to bring them on side and go, look, it doesn't matter if we lost. We know we can win rounds. We can bring up, even if you don't believe it, your job as an IGL is to get them to believe it and get your team to rally around that cause. Cutstown isn't out of it yet. It's perfectly possible for them to bring it back. They are on the defensive side, so they have a little bit of an advantage. I think they just need to reassess their sort of aggression in the first minute and a half of the round and sort of calculate whether what they're doing is worthwhile does it pay off or is it worth scaling it back a little bit playing a bit safer more turtle like with maybe just one player roaming and the rest playing a lot safer and anchoring on the site yeah well i think you got to be careful in this round in particular because you know it's it's pretty obvious to state but a 5-2 is a very difficult or different scoreline to say a 4-3 because can you stop umbc from winning three potential map points in a row the way they're playing right now I think that's a very tough ask. So Cutstown, they need to play this one really safe. They need to win this round. Head is having a look behind the shield. The attackers doing their drone work. We're in that kind of secondary drone phase inside the round where the attackers are just trying to prod and poke their way through. An opportunity maybe missed there by Head on the rotate. And it looks like they're getting ready to make that push through Bunk Wall. And I get the feeling it's going to be all action for the next 60 seconds, Novi. Just bursting on through the smoke grenade blooms and that yellow fog. The nice attackers, you can see, rotating all the way around. Massive. Taking the long way around just to get in a position where it can actually do something in the round. The grenades are going to come out. Forces Thundy a little bit back. But here's KZ with the first. Buckting with the second. Cuts down. Is getting destroyed at the moment. But still, time is a little bit on their side. They have a minute remaining. There's another Toxic Bay in hands. That's just been bloomed. So now there's about 40 seconds, but a smoke has been traded by Joe. The plant is going down, and this is disastrous for Cutsdown. It's looking like a flawless round. Just Rogers left to try it and manage it again. The Thorn trying to be the pain in the side of UMBC finds one, but still needs to find four more. I doubt it's going to happen, but never say never. is close. Manages to down the Mav as well, but it's not quite enough. And that is the round. University of Maryland, Baltimore County move on to map points. Would you say, Novi, that Cutstown are getting a little bit cut down by UMBC here? I was waiting for you to do that one. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> you, you, you've worked with me before. You know when they're coming. But... You know, the only part, there's a couple of positives that Cutstone can take from this game, even if this does be the last round they play. The first one being, if you lose, you're not out. It's double elimination. You go into the lower bracket, you get a chance to, you know, fight your way through the trenches Defending back towards the final. But for that. UMBC, I, I've loved the amount of control that they have played with. Yes, KZ had an absolutely phenomenal defending phase, but whenever they switched over to attack, look at this now. Joe has picked up the mantle as the primary, you know, entry, the primary killer. And he's not necessarily playing those old-fashioned entry operators either. So, UMBC doing a great job of sharing the fragging load on their team. Yeah, there's a good share because, like you said, KZ started off being that player. Now, Maybe it's a bit of, not nerves, but we, we talk about players often needing time to warm up, just like athletes do in regular sport. All those little decisions with your wrist, with your arm, you, that's why you do aim training beforehand. That's why you go into deathmatch or originally T-Hunt as well. It was just to get the muscles moving. It feels like the rest of the UMBC players have started to come alive. Same can be said for Cutstown, but at a slower play pace. At the moment, it's just Head and Rogers starting to get going. The rest are kind of falling by the wayside. And if they want to salvage that map, we need those other three players to start hitting their shots. 
Yeah, they need to. They need to share that load skirt on. Her has a big opportunity maybe to start getting something going in this one. KZ, though, he's got the nade. He's got that silhouette in the distance. The nade is tossed. But there's that Jaeger coming in clutch. This little bit of cafe is going to be a vital engagement for this game. But UMBC, they're loading up. They're loading the utility. They're loading the rounds. And they stick one into Head's head. And he is going to fall 5v4 now on match point as KZ gets straight into the drone again. Trying to work out where the next target could be. And Novi with a minute and 50 left on the clock. And three players left on life for Cutstown. I get the feeling this game is very close to being over. Yeah, UMBC, they are on incredible form at the moment. They seem very confident both on attack and defense. But Tom Cuts and Thundy managing to put it back just the slightest bit. This is a far more positive post plant than they usually find themselves in. But it's not going to be the case. The Finca is just finding all those headshots with the LMGs. Thundy, poor Thundy in a one versus three, throws out the magnet just to give a little bit more cover, but it's being approached from every angle. The Maverick goes down, but it's a two on one, 20 seconds and barely enough time in it. And even getting pinged by the Alibi holograms, not going to be enough. Even a smoke to add insult to injury. Oh, I thought he might've just been able to show out Mass's legs, but that's not enough. UMBC take the map. Unfortunate for University of Cutstown. Yeah, brilliant performance by UMBC. They just looked in so much control from start to finish. And as you spoke about before the game started, getting a good start, staying in the upper bracket for as long as possible, it keeps you away from playing the top teams. It keeps you out of those trenches. It will provide them with a little bit of confidence going into it as well. But one thing I will say, Novi, it's theme park, and it was back inside the competitive environment. Did it play out the way you were expecting it to? Not at all, because I felt like when Cutstown would have came onto the defense that they would have posted a bit of a better showing, uh, just because mm -hmm. of how defender-sided theme park can be. It feels like the players just weren't quite comfortable yet. They didn't have they they didn't have their mojo on. Do you you get what I mean? Where you know when a player's feeling it, they're hitting shots, they're swinging corners. It almost felt like some of the players were a little bit mm -hmm. shy, I want to say. They 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 were they didn't have the confidence to back themselves. And now mm -hmm. that they drop into that lower bracket, you've got to back yourself. There is no other option. So I want to see cuts down, step it up, and show us what they can really do and maybe even make that lower bracket run. But congratulations, UMBC. That was a great opener. They look good on both sides, and that's not easy for a team to do. This could be a real contender here. They could be, and we've seen one other team or team go through in the upper bracket, and we've got one more game left in the first phase where we're going to see, I think it's Drexel taking on Penn State, where once again, Sticula and Infernosis will be the guys taking you through it. We will have a little bit of an interview with one of the players after this break, and we'll see you very soon. Well, we're here for another game as we continue on with our rolling schedule today for Cutstown University's land. My name is Stikula. Obviously, we've had a little bit of a swap in for Gnosis decided he didn't really want to cast with me anymore. So we brought in Novocaine and we're going to continue on with the day as usual. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm slowly my way through all the caster pairings. So started with Gibson, now I'm with you, Stick. I'm excited because... Already, just from that one game, I've already noticed differences from what we get over here in Europe to how NA decides to play the game, even at a collegiate level, which is really impressive. And I'm just excited to see what else we get, especially with this upcoming match, because I've heard a lot of uh, of Penn State is it being one of the favorites in this tournament. Excited to see what they can do. Yeah, Penn State have got a lot of hype behind them. We'll move to the bracket and kind of discuss where we are in the tournament so far. Of course, this is See in the top there, our Robert Morris versus Bryant game is the one we kicked off the day with. And for a cafe map, Robert Morris, they look pretty good. Despite a couple of thrown rounds by Bryant, it was sort of a close endeavor that they ultimately availed themselves of. And so you see Robert Morris versus Penn State is where we arrive at now. And 
Guttstown versus UMBC. They mirrored the same exact scores. It's been 6-2 to two results so far, and of course, we're working with that modified game format, not having the traditional first to seven round victories in regulation, with five round halves, and it being the first to six who does get to play. With those two games having been so quickly, Novocaine, I'm expecting this to probably be the closest one we've had yet. Yeah, but it can go either way with how strong Penn State is and being the favorites. And we also heard in the Robert Morris game and some of the other players have said, because there are these sort of breaks in between playing, that the players kind of take a bit of time to warm up. And sometimes that affects their in-game performance as well. And that means they're not hitting the shots. They're not winning their ones. And if you're against the disciplined side who know what they're doing, who are the favorite, they will punish you for being slow off the mark. Well, another interesting tidbit about this game, it's got all the fun parts with it. We are also heading to Skyscraper. Of course, this map... Nine-map system, and to be honest, Novocaine, uh, unfortunately, the collegiate ecosystem is kind of stagnant when it comes to maps. We get a lot of villa. It's almost villa, villa, villa every single day that we come on the broadcast. So to get Skyscraper is really refreshing for a variety of reasons. I, I think it gives us an interesting dichotomy to this game because Penn State, they come out of this position where we refer to them kind of as this premier quality, where they're one of the top 25 teams in the country. They consistently play against some of the the other teams from the top 25 in the actual regular season of our circuit versus Robert Morris, who are a good team, don't get me wrong, but they're considered the top out of the open league contenders. They're not quite at that premier level, despite making it close in the playoffs on a couple different occasions. So it should be a close matchup, and like you said, Skyscraper, just to touch on the point about how you always get, we always get Oregon and Club. That is the two maps that I'm sick of seeing. So again, very excited for Skyscraper because it's something a bit different and theme park previously. So definitely these uh, teams are sort of flexing their muscles because it is best of one. That's something that's worth touching on is being best of one. You have that there's no room to go there's no safety net you just kind of have to play it can go either way this is for a team like rmu this is an opportunity to unseat the uh the top seeded team and send them to packing down to that lower bracket and why not take them to something a bit different to something like skyscraper maybe that you've prepared for in your pocket and they won't be ready for Jaegerban will file us out there as the final defender to be removed, and it's been kind of a consistent trend so far that in this LAN tournament, we have had some wonky bans on the earlier map of Cafe Dostoevsky. We had a Flores get banned, which isn't too totally strange. There was also the Finca ban, which has been consistent through RMU's picks so far. They just want to sort of get her out of here. She's got grenades. She's got an LMG. She's really kind of a fierce opponent that you don't want to deal with. And so into the first here from Penn State. And they're going to introduce a composition featuring a couple select characters. Castle and Tachanka amongst the most. So they've got the anti-utility with the Wumai, but then also the Aruni as well. And then you double that up with the castle barricades. There's quite a few pieces of defensive material that RMU are going to have to remove if they want to eventually execute. And couple that up with the Tachanka for the area denial, especially the plant denial, could be a bit of an issue. The only slight problem I might see is... There's a bit of an inconsistency with teams with the Tachanka in actually getting him to work. Quite often, a smoke or even something like uh, the, the, the new Goyo rework is a little bit more suited because there's more reliability. You just literally pop something, pop a bit of gadget, and it's done. You don't need to aim the gadget. You don't need to do any of that sort of stuff. And there's more agency. But Penn State being the side that they are, I presume they've probably got this in sort of in lock and using a strategy. And it's something that RMU has to consider as they approach the site. Well, one thing I've already spotted, and this is just purely from looking at utility versus utility, RMU have brought a single set of frag grenades on the Iana, and you would assume the Gon 6 is there as well. So three forms of soft destruction for Zedek. Whiskey having two of the lifeline grenades as well. Got breaching charges there too. It does become a little bit worrying when you've got that deployable shield. We've seen dedicated 
inside of Drum. And you've also got the four Castle Barricades as well. Realistically here, RM, you have to be, I think, on top of their rotation utility-wise because you're going to come against a setup which is really made for the burn. You may have the Jaeger banned by Penn State. That was intentional. That's what they were sort of prepping coming into this one. And they know that they've got operators like the Aruni and the Lamai to stop all of your util. Now Destroyer shut down Whiskey, and you didn't clear that shield. It becomes a bit of a rough spot, and Zedek will fall off the balcony. Surely the defenders have heard this, and it doesn't take long before Mild can collect onto that pickup. Yeah, falling down the toaster, going to get burnt. Now we're in a three on four, with Penn State having a slight advantage in terms of man count. And they've also managed to run down half the clock as well. Goalies pushing in through drum, but going to make their way through. And this is kind of the stalling point. You work your way through the map, east to west or west to east, depending on the site. And you get to drum, mezzanine, and dragon. And then you sort of pause, because that's where you have to start clearing things to then eventually push through. That was a nice trade by Warden. But two on three, there was the reply by Penn State. They're still maintaining that advantage. And look at all the utility that has to get burned just to even get through, to get close to an angle where you can start being effective on your approach onto your execute onto the side. I think this Kate Electra Claw right on the gold wall is just kind of hurting the progress that Robert Morris can make. But UFO will backpedal into an open angle, giving the Thermite a freebie kill there. And... Well, it seems like that electrical lot not going to provide too much of an issue. Jaws was getting a little bit stingy with his utility, and he will close out this round still with one electrical lot left in the pocket. But another piece of utility he's got waiting is that C4, and the toss should be here. Jaws will send it up, but no waiting too long. Ultimately, the C4 does go up, and the explosion is good for a kill against Goalie, but it does not stop the plant, and so now Warden, the Nomad, realistically holding all of leverage. Not to mention, you've got Air Jab's toss. But Warden, what are you doing? He turned his back to the open target and he gives a free clutch to Jaws so long as the Cade can find the bomb. I genuinely think if the Nomad didn't fire the air jab just there, the Cade wouldn't have been aiming down that door all that time because that, that sound cue indicated exactly where on the mezzanine the Nomad was hiding and that meant the lineup was the fire was ready and also then as you said running with your back to the enemy was also that second <laughs> mistake on top of that you compound you compound them together the sum of that means you lose the round a round you should have won rmu is going to be kicking themselves because that was their round all day long penn state getting a little bit lucky but you don't need luck you need round wins and that's what counts Right, and because of the halves are shortened, the amount of time that you've got to kind of get your value out of those is relatively slim. And Skyscraper, I feel like, has not really gone to uh, any kind of defender or attacker one way or the other as it is right now because teams are just still getting experience on it. Both of these rosters, it's realistic to assume this is probably their first official match playing on Sky, so they've not really had a lot of those games. It's important not to think about it in terms of, you know, numbers on a scorecard rounds one in a specific half but about closing out on those individual opportunities and a big one that rmu just missed out on penn state closing down with success on karaoke and t now make quite the interesting choice in their rotation as they're not going to go to office directly instead they will extend up to office via a bedroom defense and sort of touching on what you said about where skyscraper sits whether it's attacker or defender sided in terms of sites the first the primary and secondary are usually very uh sort of you go to the karaoke tea room and then often you'll come to office exhibition and that's the next one that you'll go to the other sites tend to have quite a significant fall off in terms of defensive sides one in pro play at the moment especially a barbecue and kitchen that seems to be the one where the win rate just absolutely tanks into the ground so it's interesting that penn state is opting for what most teams would consider a tertiary site which means one of two things either they want to throw a curveball at rmu or this is something that they've prepared this is something they've got in their back pocket that they can also use to surprise uh, the rmu side and this is a bit worrying because if rmu was essentially had the option to be gifted that first round now Penn State is starting throwing them curveballs. Is this where they just start scaling out of control in this game? 
Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the point that I was looking for there between you lose out on that opportunity for RMU and things do get a little bit more dire. Shrug DBNO. We'll see if there's a push up. Looks unlikely for Penn State to try to chase in for this frag. They'll let Shrug go down, but this is really a robust and fearsome top floor extension, and it's already getting started with two picks. You've lost your primary soft destruction component. The Nomad's down as well, and it's almost like RMU really can't win. Can't get anything started here on this top floor clear, and to be honest, I don't know what the chances are that your Iana and your Ace are going to be able to dig themselves out of this hole. If you were to get it started, probably the best way to go about that would be to isolate either the Alibi or the Wamai, those two low HP players. But from the standpoint that we're in, without these final two attackers linking up, it just doesn't look realistic. This is the kind of moment where you kind of just want to send it. Go for the play, see if you can find anything. Just actually legit crouch walking round corner Zetic. It always pays off to be fair, but not quite landing the kill despite Penn State being very tagged up from the team damage in the prep phase. And now RMU with 30 seconds left. This isn't the time to use the replicator. You kind of just need to run on in, take the gunfight, see what you can find, throw the frag grenades in. But where's the ace? Where's Goalie? Actually getting caught off by the alibi who's managed to retreat back to the defenses. And now it's all on the Iana to try and make the play. Finds the first, looking for the second round the corner. With 15 seconds, there is no chance in this round. You've done well to protect the KD, but maybe that's going to be it. There we go. Penn State win the second round and an incredible incredibly dominant fashion very different from, from that one and, and i mean you could almost kind of come at that and call it a flawless one even though it isn't true in the numbers and eventually penn state do lose two men well rmu did they really accomplish any steps on the checklist I, I think it's hard to say yes they got into the map they got started they were met by the extension and they just lost they just could not move past mm -hmm. that and it just set themselves up in a position that was really ugly and you have to get in control of this. It's not like your typical, you know, first round, uh, typical six round half game where you kind of, you know, you play the sites, you start to get adjusted, you start to kind of figure out the way that the rotation is going to work. No, you can't really do that. You kind of have to get in here. You need to start early and you need to get your momentum because Defenders you lose out on that and the game is going to spiral out of control quickly, which already looks to be sort of the direction we're heading on. This Penn State clean up the first. Karaoke does get a bit close towards the end and RMU almost make it over the line. But on that second attempt, the bedroom site looked like RMU had never experienced it before. The curveball works. Strike out. That's a baseball thing. That's an American thing, right? But I mean, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 like you said. It's it's RMU genuinely. That is the perfect way to summarize it. Actually, it was kicking me going like, what's going on here? They just looked like they'd never ever played into that. They weren't prepared. They did. I think they were on the right lines of going top to bottom as you should do and working their way through. They just really were. They they they, they didn't know what hit them essentially. And now they're kind of in a position where, okay, they've just thrown us this random tertiary site and they've stomped us on it. We had this golden opportunity in front of us and we missed that. Like, what, what's going for you mentally? This is such a difficult position to be in. And this is exactly what a captain needs to go. Like, especially with this sort of technical pause as well as we're trying to get the players back in the game. I think one of them crashed. This is where you go, guys, like, calm down. Look, we were very close that first round. This is what we're doing wrong. This is where we need to fix it. And they need to get everyone rallied, get them aligned. And they have shown in an even without weird strategies, they can kind of take Penn State on. They just need to repeat that performance. And I think we really analyze this map and you compare the two teams that we've got playing so far. Penn State, you look at their strats, you see the way that they've hold out. You don't go to the bathroom site without being prepared for it. It's just really a decision that doesn't make sense. If you're going to play this, if it's default strats that you're with, it's going to be office. Penn State, they've got castles, they got Tachankas, they got deployables, they really got everything. It's clear that there's a strat somewhere that's down on paper or that's at least been dry ran. Robert Morris, it's hard to find elements of their attacks that look scripted, that look like they've sort of got an idea of what they've done before, cut off drones things like you know getting in certain areas where you're consistent on the entry and you know you're going to take that map control i think we can excuse that bottom floor objective that bedroom site 
Maybe Rob Morris have only scrimmed this once, and maybe they didn't get the chance to attack that bathroom site. You only got so many rounds in a scrim, right? Maybe they've only played the other objectives, and they've moved through that typical rotation, going from party, going from karaoke, then trying to play office, and eventually maybe landing on barbecue and kitchen. Robert Morris, I think we need to see another site from them. I don't think this game is completely out of reach, but they need to win this next round. The tech pause needs to be sort of that platform to allow them to springboard off of, because if they don't, Penn State are going to get out of control. Yeah, the reduction in the the round limit to five rounds rather than six and a half really actually favors the defenders because, like you said, the, with the full rotation, you don't necessarily get it the second time, and so you don't get to go to your third tertiary site. You don't have to, and it just makes that objective a little bit easier. So with Penn State at the moment, they flex one of their uh, sites, one of their primary ones. It was close, but I'm sure that they could probably correct a few things. There were some silly individual mistakes. The second one was very clean. If they even have barbecue as well on lock, there's so many fl options they have and where to go. Robert Morris kind of need to get one round, just one round to give them that confidence and then they can work sort of their way forward. But it's one of the cases from a mental aspect is until you get that first win, that that zero on the screen is just going to haunt you. Like it doesn't, doesn't do anything for you until you turn it into a one. And while we're waiting for this rehost to propagate, I think we could talk a little bit about Skyscraper. And I feel like compared to some of the other maps, I, I do see a lot of similarities between the way that Skyscraper plays and the way that, you know, the Villa is sort of set up where you've got this kind of oblong map and you've got a lot of rotations that you need to cut off. And there's kind of those two crucial highways coming through Terrace on the top floor, as well as coming through kind of the main lobby or pantry below. That's sort of a similar area to where you've got Villa. You've kind of got top right. You've got that landing area that you're going to rotate through. And then on the first floor, you've got bottom red and as well you've got kind of the living room hallway and corridor there on skyscraper so far i feel like the four sites that you're able to play each of them has got their own unique component and similarly to the way that villa plays all four of them are realistic all four of them there is a chance as compared to maybe you look at a map i don't know like clubhouse or bar and stage it's really tough to get the wool over the attacker's eyes on skyscraper you can kind of be free with what you want to do on these sites there's a lot of freedom and especially in the operator lineups as well we've already seen that in just the past two rounds we're seeing tachanka come out and then a rooney and then they're swapping you know from this and that and changing their strategy depending on the site and i like it for the longest time in siege we've had i mean mainly on attacker but again on defense as well we've seen very static lineups of oh we have to bring the jaeger we have to bring nor am i and now we're seeing teams banning jaeger removing them from the game and saying let's play something a bit different and it's very very exciting and like you said with the flexibility and the different sites we're seeing that in the operator picks as well where they're being dynamic they're picking castle for certain sites not for others they'll pick alibi for certain sites not for others and it's just very very interesting seeing the the depth in some of the strategy that is coming out from these teams today. Yeah, and I think we should continue to expect that from Penn State. And I feel like almost the onus is on Robert Morris to kind of figure out the way that they're going to respond. I mentioned that idea that coming out of this tech pause, they really have to get something with some good momentum. This tech pause needs to really be used to not only facilitate, of course, the restarting of the game, but also for them to go ahead and get their strats in order, get their attacks on the same page. Everybody needs to be not even a clear understanding. They need to have a goal. We need to know yeah. what the idea is, what the big plan is going to be, because that's just wasn't there especially on that bedroom site I, I like the way that they attacked kind of coming on over from that extension sure they took a lot of casualties on the first round when you look at the way they tried to get rid of that deployable shield inside of drum it was kind of ugly they did get it through eventually they did get that area and they got the wall open into gold as well which is like the two steps towards winning that round clear the extension open your breach and now you've got a route forward but they couldn't capitalize on that entry even with a lot of defender mistakes. I mean, talk about a late C4. He didn't know any idea where the bomb was coming down to get a kill for the thermite that was planting. Maybe you could say, kind of need to get out of there a little quicker. I honestly feel like that's more leaning towards the territory of nitpicking though. And RMU, I expect them on a repeat of that tea room and karaoke site to probably take it, but it's going to have to be somewhere else for Penn State as that objective does remain locked down. Yeah, it's a very interesting one and, and sort of following on from what you're saying is that it wasn't pretty but like you said that first round they did a lot of good things but then in the second one they almost seemed like they were playing penn state's game they weren't playing their own game plan 
And because of that, it was very, very simple, very one-sided, very sort of e easy to get around for Penn State. RMU really need to sort of get on the same page, readjust, and then come back into it playing their own style. Regardless if it's the most effective, they shouldn't be worrying about that. They should just be trying to play what they are comfortable with. Um, and I feel like they have the capacity to do that. They've shown that in the first round. Now, they appear to have gone into bedroom. But yeah. I believe, like you said, you know, we're, we're having a chats and, yeah, and Discord to sort of say, I believe it should be locked, right? So, hmm, interesting, 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 <laughs> interesting. I guess we just keep playing until the admin says uh, we can't, or <laughs> I'm not sure. That's kind of a strange situation. I, I was thinking for a moment that, you know, maybe they would have the, the site rotation change because of the shortened halves, but with the way the Pro League used to work, it was still the same. You know, you play an objective, you win, you have to wait two rounds before you can go there again. It's yeah. never changed. It's always been like that. And um, Penn State, I don't know, it, it's, it does seem kind of unfair for them to go back down to bedroom with how devastating it was last time, right? Absolutely. But Robert Morris, they're not complaining about it <laughs> maybe they're like yeah bring it on <laughs> let's have another go let's see if we can get something going our way for once um they like the challenge maybe they're just a glutton for pain who knows but they seem to be rolling with it and a faster pace look at this zetic just running on in getting the control of the kitchen into the pantry you can see the jackal coming out because there was that alibi who was a bit of a pain in that round so they can use the jackal to try and find that roam and get a bit more control but psu once again take the first blood that jackal is out of the round and robert morris start off on the back foot and it looks like a hell of a back foot because goldie's going down as well yeah, this is not really the tempo that you wanted to be at. I like RMU getting started a little bit quicker and not spending so much time in the early game outside of the map. Get in the building, get your drones, get your intel, and let's get a move on. However, it doesn't seem as though that's really managed to make things move any quicker as it's just caused them to suffer one casualty and the ace being out on the balcony is a rough spot, though he does get involved, he does get res back up, and in the meanwhile, Whiskey has put out Destroyer, who, despite not getting any kills here in round number three, for the majority of the academic year, Destroyer has been a huge part of why Penn State have been so successful. He's a consistent threat in a lot of their matches, and finally another death by RMU. Not quite the ace they were hoping for earlier, but Zedek putting in the work as he's iced out both Mr. Sinister as well as Mild there. I was going to say, I'm waiting for Zetic to start fragging. He was swinging around the corners, trying to go for the pre-fire, but it wasn't quite enough to land a kill. But UFO has landed it on two. Mr. Warden, and that will bring us to a 2 vs 2 with 35 seconds. You've got the Mute waiting close with the shotgun, has the SMG 11, of course, along with the castle. The smoke has been removed, which was a fantastic kill for RMU to land. Now, this is a bit of an advantageous position, but they can't quite get through the wall. There we go. Zetic, no, has to actually crouch jump in through it, and that will give the sound cue. So she's expected. Oh, oh my lord! Jaws get slapped shut into the jaws of Zetic, getting swallowed whole. UFO at least trades onto goalie. The Iana for Zetic has just been slamming them home with the triple. I don't think there's enough time. As the diffuser is sticking the plant, UFO is going to run down. That should shut it out, getting yellow pinged as well. I don't think there's going to be quite enough time to flick up. No, there isn't. PSU win the round, but a valiant effort from the Iana for Robert Morris. Oh, you do for the castle really become aware of the fact that he's a two-speed as you watch him try to chase forward towards that player in the process of planting and Penn State lock in their third uh, to clear up the confusion it was just decided for the sake of you know the game that would go back to bedroom and the admins are not going to care they're not going to go back on the call there so it's around the counts it's a legitimate one in the books and already Penn State have guaranteed themselves an advantage first half going three the maximum RMU can now pick up would be two and they're really going to need these two because there has been some speculation that this match could be the first 6-0 on the cards and you'd love to back in the underdog here to believe that Robert Morris can continue fighting it's just sort of hard to get in that camp 
when after the tack pause, when after the opportunity to step back and kind of get a better assessment of things here, you don't strike in with the round. You suffer a lot of early deaths, and it seems like the similar issues that caused them problems so far have continued to come to the forefront. And Robert Morris, they're going to have to go back to karaoke. This is the closest site that they've played. Well, I guess you could kind of compare the other two there on the bedroom. But for this objective, it was one that Robert Morris should have had. And ultimately, they kind of bungled it up at the end. Let's hope that they don't do that the second time around. Attackers objective is to locate a it's a shame because Robert Morris are showing flashes of brilliance. They're showing that they can play at a at a very reasonable level and match Penn State, at least in terms of fracking, maybe not quite a strategy. Penn State seems to have, certainly have the advantage on that front. Their preparation seems very on point. But it doesn't mean that they themselves are making individual mistakes and losing out on gunfights to RMU. Robert Morris University, I think the start of the round, they need to play a little bit slower. The mid-round, they can keep the tempo up and put apply pressure on PSU because... As soon as they go into aggressive, PSU seem to be very, very prepped for it. Especially in terms of even when a player gets killed, there's usually someone on that trade kill and is ready in that position. And aren't you just on at the same levels of coordination, I want to say, in terms of trading kills. So they need to tighten that up on their attack. Otherwise, they lose the opening pick again. And as you mentioned, Destroyer. Destroyer is certainly doing Destroyer things and causing absolute destruction in the Robert Morris University side. And the last time we were here on karaoke, it was Destroyer who scored the opening kill. So now he's taken out two crucial parts of this attack. And Zedek's like, nah, you're not going to get away with that. He tries to sort of charge in deep. It's a little bit of kind of an avenging call. Let me try to get in and, you know, get that revenge for my two teammates who were both just eliminated there. But the value that is taken out when you lost the Flores or Tarot Jones and the flashes, all your burn from Warden as well, it becomes a bit of an untenable situation. Destroyer does go down he does not get away with that for free but ultimately is the value really enough to counteract the losses that robert morris has faced oh zetic almost getting picked off and that is pretty much rmu's star player right now he's been the one finding the opening kills for them he's been the one punching his way through into some of these sites now the jackal is starting to creep on through looking to pounce but gets tagged off by the chichanka the massive LMG rolls another one of Pete and Roni to finish the job, but it's all on the poor old Thermite in a one on four. It looks like Penn State's going to get their fourth round, remain undefeated in this map. And poor Robert Morris University kind of need to go back on the drawing board. At least finds a kill there. So there's some potential. Penn State's going to keep giving the Thermite separate one versus ones. There's the possibility, but no. The Tachanka. Rattles down some shots towards the stairway. And just like that, Penn State move on to a 4-0 round advantage. I mean, you look at that way the round closes down there on karaoke, and it's almost like that's the perfect scenario that Penn State were expecting. They were ready for Robert Morris to get frustrated with the amount of utility with the Cade Clock keeping them from opening the gold wall and to just say, let's send it. You've got the door open. You've got the lines of sight that have been opened up in the other wall for T. And it's just like life is so difficult to be one of those RMU attackers coming in because you've got an LMG, you've got a Roni, you've got a C4 that's going off below. You've got all of these different factors which just make that T room such a battleground, such a chaotic space. And ultimately, it does not work out there in the end for Robert Morris. And it's needing some serious uh, structural work there. The Maverick being banned, though, by Penn State. Set yourself up in a position where, you know, that, that kind of is bound to happen. And I did want to uh, just quickly correct myself there. The bans have been swapped. It was uh, RMU who banned Mira and Maverick in the first place. And now Robert Morris are kind of seeing the result of what's going to happen when you don't have the Maverick. You can't open that wall. So what else do you do? Well, my call would be to bring a Cali or to try to blow up the claw from below, and neither of those two options ever chosen by our Attackers are moving out to locate a bomb and defuse it. Or the zero. Uh, and often or players seem to forget that the gadget can be used vertically. <laughs> it can be used on pretty much any surface, although the sound cue is quite loud, but also brings the backup hard breach. So he's like a, you know, you can see he's basically filling the role of the hard breacher in this lineup. 
Uh, quite often he's brought as a secondary, not the primary, because it's a little less reliable in terms of the gadget. You can't control when it detonates. It goes off automatically. Not the biggest hole as well to jump through. It sounds weird to sort of mention and go, surely just opening the reinforcement is fine. If you have to jump through that, we've seen it, it gives an audio cue over. Uh, it messes your aim up for the previous like half a second, five temps. It just causes a few issues. If you can run or crouch, walk through a opening, it gives you a bit more advantage in terms of gunplay. And that could be the difference between winning your gunfight and losing it. And that could be the difference between winning or losing a round. So now to barbecue, we'll close out the half for Penn State with the first showing of the other what we call tertiary site here on the first floor of objectives. And it seems like RMU have gone for some top pressure. I guess they're going to move on over. They do have the sledge in this composition, so you would expect him to want to get in, get some vertical going. One map that does see a lot of use of the buck is border. And I feel like Skyscraper can really benefit from the buck as well. If you bring him in here, gives you a lot more versatility in terms of opening up the floors up above. And he's got flashes. You can count him amongst your operators for the burn as well. I would almost think maybe bringing both the buck and the sledge might be an honest call here to try to get the maximum out of your vertical. That being said, you don't get to open the vertical until you've cleared this top floor extension. And clearing extensions really has not been a bullet point on RMU's comp uh, resume so far this match. Yeah, it's been a tricky one for them to try and sort out, and it doesn't help with Destroyer as well with the m21 has these amazing long lines of sight both on the top floor and on the bottom floor if destroyer chooses to back off as well you can see jaws on this nice one over sushi bar it might cause a few issues later on but with that m21 you've got a huge amount of damage that you can actually match usually attackers have longer range weapons so they tend to win out at longer range not with the m21 you can really pack the heat you affirm mild will get the first two so again opening kills goes the way of penn state and that's not even with destroyer chiming in he has taken a bit of damage so i presume he's taking a bit of a gunfight but rmu knocking on the doors there's destroyer popping up in the kill feed there's another one a long way off mild picks up zetic it's all on warden and a flawless round to close out the half stick this this is an incredibly dominant performance from Penn State. Five spoken in a row for Penn State with not an interruption made by Robert Morris in the first half. Just goes absolutely bonsai. And so now they step into the second split here and Robert Morris have a serious task ahead of them. Sure, the Maverick is banned here. Sure, you don't have that thing to back up your entry. But ultimately, is that going to really be enough? Is that going to be enough to put the defenders in such a position of leverage that you're going to win five in a row? I think I've already settled my mind on that decision as well. Penn State are performing well, not only because of this map, because they look mighty prepared on it, but also just because at a macro level, they seem to be defenders, the better team in me. this Bouting. It's a reason why everybody expects Penn State's to likely be the favorites, and you sort of have a conversation there about, okay, is Robert Morris kind of the best of the rest? Are they better than your other teams that you've got competing, like Cutstown, like Drexel? Are they going to be able to perform and notch what would likely for them be a third-place finish because Penn State versus the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, probably going to be the finals that we end up to decide to whom goes our $400 prize pool? Ten seconds to yep, $400. Certainly looking between those two sides. Penn State certainly look hungry for it. That's a that's a nice payday split between them. I think they'll be quite happy with that. And they get to enjoy playing Siege. Oh, well, you know, enjoy is a strong word for some of these players. I'm sure RMU is currently not enjoying the game particularly that much. But they're on that defensive side. And, of course, there's always that little bit of comfort where... As an attacker, you're expected to set the pace with defense. You can disrupt the pace, but you don't set it. Ultimately, you just need to run that clock down. That is your main objective, not just getting kills, running the clock. And that's something that you have a bit more freedom because you're waiting for the attackers to come into you. PSU, though, approaching from the uh, south side on the Geisha balcony, trying to open up that wall, which I believe is Caded. Ooh, Caded getting a little bit tagged, but there we go. Robert Morris actually gets the opening kill. Mr. Sinister not able to get the line up, and man, that's a huge opening by the Caded. He's now trapped completely 
flat against the wall, eventually gets taken out, but that's fantastic by Robert Morris University. Unfortunately, it's an advantage they take with a little bit of a sour note attached to it as Scully does not manage to get away from that karaoke side. Shrug will quickly make up for that, though, as Jaws, the player who did facilitate that earlier refrag, will go down, leaving things up between UFO and Mild. And so far, these two players have done a fair job of it, but against four, is it going to really be possible? will have to be up to their individual efforts, and... You've got the right players. Mild is a, such a strong one on the flank watch, but he can't really defend against that when he's getting sprayed down through the wall. And it's left up to the longest standing member of the program, UFO, really the one who got things started for Penn State's R6 team. And well, he's against four, and oh, he's got possession of the diffuser. It's not really the biggest point of leverage here with RMU as they play so incredibly passive. One player on the stairs as well, so you can see RMU is just holding these positions and being very, very calm about it. Quite often in this situation where it's a 4 vs 1, some teams feel inclined to suddenly start taking Angel, like, yeah, you know, we're going to win this round. But they'll give a player separate 1 vs 1s, and that's suddenly uh, the properly the best scenario for the attacker. You approach him two at a time, there's no way that he's going to be able to win that. But that's where Robert Morris kind of has to show the calm, cool demeanor. Something that UFO is showing right now. Look at this. Checking every single angle. Slowly working his way around. Not just rushing in for the sake of rushing in. And you can see Robert Morris were getting, I want to say, a little bit angsty at the end. They looked like they were starting to take the duel. And that could be an issue further down the line. I don't think it's what I'm going to be thinking about right now. Because they're still on that match point, And Penn State just need one more round to close this out. It's a really rough position. It's all about sort of trudging up that hill and trying to fight back as hard as you can for as long as you might be able to. Usually, though, it's the first one that's the most difficult to interrupt that momentum of Penn State. A key mistake for Mr. Sinister as he, alongside Destroyer, tried to get things going from that wall by Geisha. It really didn't work. Penn State lost those two casualties, and that was sort of the uh, snowfall that began the avalanche. Robert Morris, now with locking down karaoke, are going to rotate over towards office, try to see what this other top floor site is going to hold for them. But Penn State, you just sort of feel like they're kind of chopping at the bit here with an opportunity to close it out. And another thing, you know, it would be uh, sort of following the trend for Robert Morris to fight through another one for Penn State to close it out and for us to have our third 6-2 to two match of the day. That's certainly confidence. I mean, not that Penn State needs any more confidence at this point going in as favorites, but it's confirmation that, you know, they are the big dogs. They're the ones that are the favorites and a, a, a nice clean 6-0 or, you know, even a 6-1 would be a very nice way to make a statement piece of saying, we're the, we're the best team here. You guys need to come into us and prove that you are better than us, not the other way around. If they were to lose a map, I presume it'd probably be more likely earlier on, maybe when they're a bit colder or tighter, because like I think it was one of the players from Robert Morris University said, they've been up since 2 a.m. They've driven all the way here to play on the LAN, and that does factor in that tiredness. Whether that's the case for P uh, Penn State is a little bit different, but is one of the things about uh, LAN, it's a different aspect of the game than playing on online, and it might be a little bit different for some of these players, and it makes might take some time for them to get used to. Well, uh, RMU in this lineup, it's all with the traps. You've got all, really, the traps you could bring other than a Frost, who's been left at home. Now that Penn State have made but footfall inside the map have gotten sort of boots on the ground in that western side and they're ready to come against what the defense has got for them. It's really, I think, going to be a battle of who wins the entry. If Penn State get the opening kill and it doesn't get traded, more importantly, they're probably going to manage to take the round. And wow, Whiskey just runs right up and the LMG was a little bit quicker to the trigger. Destroyer putting away the threat of the Valkyrie and one of the C4s in your composition as well, which can be quite helpful late in the round on office to be able to stop that plant in its tracks. Whiskey going down as well isn't the biggest deal in the world, I guess, at least with the Valkyrie. It means you've got someone who's literally permanently on cams. PSU certainly respecting 
Robert Morris a lot more this time, making they, making themselves do their due diligence with their droning, ensuring that they're getting good eyes on where the defenders are sitting. That shrug, pulling out a C4, maybe a little bit too early for my liking, but with a minute remaining, PSU still need to get rid of this deployable shield. They still need to work their way closer through to the site, and it feels like RMU is just holding the line. They're just being very, very patient. This is their dream scenario right now. Even though it's 4 vs 5, they can just sit and wait for PSU to take the initiative, and that is certainly not going to help with Destroyer doming his teammate. Yeah, that's not really taking the initiative. That's kind of pushing the rest of the squad backwards. Exothermic goes, and Shrug puts another one up on the board. And unfortunately, it looked like Goalie had a drone on his position the entire time. Sinister, after having deployed his utility, gets it going in the frag department. He's got one against the other. He's sort of worried about that. Maybe a C4 toss, which could be prep. Shrug is in with the gun rather than the utility. And in the process, looks like the Therm is going to try for the plant. The cat can't spot it out, but Mr. Sinister is stopped and dropped before he can complete the plant. And it'll ultimately be the Thorn who does away with the final Penn State members. Robert Morris, they managed to string together too defensively. And this is when you have to kind of think of the holistic nature of this match. In that first half, if PSU had, well, if RMU hadn't bundled, uh, sort of bungled the bungle of the PSU defense on that first initial round we had in this game, we would currently be looking at 4-3 scoreline. And that's close. It, it all came down to that one round where it swung. And that's why playing with five rounds and a half, each round is more valuable than it would normally be. It, it sounds so simple just taking one or five aside, but it makes such significant difference because RMU would only need one round now just to catch up. Currently, they need three to catch up. It is that big of a swing. So, playing certainly from the back foot, but they are showing better signs of coordination on the defensive side. They look a lot more comfortable. PSU, honestly, I'm a little bit disappointed with how they're approaching these things because they had so much time and did so much droning beforehand. And then it kind of went out the window and they started shooting each other. Like, wh like what's happening to the team? Yeah, and I did want to say it, it, it's two things when it comes to, you know, the opportunity that was failed to close out on that couple of rounds in the first half. Not only is it the distance that you have to come back of, but it's also the fact that you're facing down match point, that you're under that pressure where a single mistake could cost you the game and you can't afford to make any mistakes. You have to play flawlessly. And it, it's just really a spot that nobody wants to be and never want to face down that match point. But, you know, maybe for Robert Morris, it's helping them to feel a little bit more motivated. And you mentioned earlier, Robert Morris had been up since, what, 2 a.m.? I mean, they're really probably running out of energy here. I know I certainly felt like I was running out of energy. I had the easy job of waking up at 7 a.m. Think of it for the RMU members who have been up for so much longer. And that tiredness is going to certainly factor in, or maybe they sort of zone out, and because of the tiredness, their nerves kind of go away. The, you know, they're not... Purely not worried because they're too tired, for instance. It, it, it can sort of affect players in weird sort of ways. And also being in, in the LAN environment as well, is you've got your team next to you. You can talk to them. You can sort of, you know, high five, fist bump when you're trying to mount the comeback. Or when Shrug is getting another kill. He's been so, so strong on this defensive side. And that's the opening kill for Robert Morris. Followed up by another, the cap can tearing them to shreds. Robert Morris University, where was this in the first half? This is a completely different team. The frag grenade going down the stairs. I don't think he's quite cooked enough to catch anyone, but it has forced a defender back off. And now UFO is kind of doubting the certainty in his position. He's at least holding the team off so Hibana can start doing the checklist, rolling through the reinforcements. But still, RMU in a very commanding position right now. An attempt at a retake through the top floor is in motion right now from Robert Morris. Ultimately, it looks like at least one of the players has decided to fall back, though. Jaws continuing to adjust his position, or even UFO, who still stares on through the wall, is Thatcher himself taking a bit of damage. It's become a very precarious spot here where Penn State haven't been availed any opportunities, haven't been given really any gunfights that they can take to score this one back to try to make any of these picks possible. And still that distant threat, that idea in the back of your head that this top floor is not exactly clear. 
and it seems like UFO might just have to try to send it in. Look to take any of these battles. He will clear just around the corner, but all of the defenders having gone away, and nobody giving Robert Morris any chances to take any shots, though they've got the hatch open. Realistically, that's the only thing going for them, and they're going to have to call a hard rotation if they want to make their way into the objective. There's still barriers of defense <laughs> keeping them out of the site. That's not going to stop UFO, though, for Penn State. 10 seconds remaining, circling the side, finds a second, that is huge, eventually gets taken down, but two more kills go their way, shrunk with the cap can no as well, way. and oh dear lord, Robert Morris University, not like this, Penn State win that in a round that they had no right in winning, and what a way to lose that, that's so unfortunate, but congratulations Penn State, they stay in the upper bracket. And I suppose this was the result that we expected, but definitely not the means of getting there. Penn State a little behind the curve on this attack towards the bottom floor bedroom defensive site. Ultimately, things just go totally awry. And it shows you that on a dime, despite a disadvantage being present and the attackers just having nothing working to their favor, all it takes is a call. Let's rotate. Let's get out of here. This top floor, it's not working for us. They hit the site. They go quickly, and they keep up that aggression. They understand that Robert Morris are only as good as their weakest link. And boy, did Penn State find that link. And they took it all the way home. Despite a Thorn gadget exploding, nearly took the round off course from that comeback itself. The player's decision by Robert Morris to chase in for that frag to go prone beneath the window ultimately will send them down to the lower bracket and their first defeat. But again, 6-2. to two. It's the only result that we've had in the schedule so far. Yeah, six to two, but that I feel like that game could have easily been five, uh, sort of four four at that point. We'd still be in it. We'd almost be going to overtime at that point. Robert Morris, there's a lot to look back on that game. Few decisions here and there could have gone the other way, but also showed the importance of individual playmaking. We always touch on it. It is a team game, of course, but sometimes if you have star players who just have good rounds, they can off the back of that winner. And for me, that last round, UFO was just dominant you're in a five versus three and you have to brute force your entry onto the site takes it into his own hands finds two heads and only only because of that performance penn state was able to close out that game you know without that they would be moving on to what it would be it'd be a five four score line and Robert morris would be one away from catching up and pushing it to overtime that was all off the back of ufo so definitely props to the penn state side but also the individual prowess to get us that win as well all right, well, with that being said, it does conclude the match at a 6-2 result, and it'll be Penn State moving on as the expected, probably, scoreline that we were all thinking of for them to continue on their run so far. However, we have our interview, so we're going to toss it over towards Connor. That'll be the end of me for today, but we'll have Gibson joining Novi when we come back from the break. Let's go check out that interview. Welcome back, everyone, to the Cutstown University Rainbow Six Siege Land 2022. My name is not crot stuff is that way that way novi and i'm here with gibson there we go i've got the directions right i was a bit confused about which way i was going but hey doing my dude we've had some interesting games um what about you know this upcoming match we've got because this is our first elimination game of the day For that, Novi, I think Novi's just heard me. I think I was did very unprofessional there muted thing. But basically, what I was saying, Novi, is we've seen a lot of very one-sided games, and because of it, it's very hard to understand where the lay of the land is because we don't know how some of these teams in the lower bracket actually are. So we've seen US, uh, sorry, UMBC. What are we expecting from Drexel? Though we haven't seen any of them at all. Yeah, it's an unusual one, and and not being on uh, sort of streamed and shown is uh, sort of an advantage in itself. You get to hide a few things, maybe hide your mistakes, hide your strengths. Um, but I'm kind of looking for a team to really take that underdog mantle and hold it close to their chest and really 
you know, do the lower bracket run. That's what I want. I know Penn State mm-hmm. is meant to be, you know, they're the most likely to be the, the winners and they're very, very strong, top 25 in the country or whatever, but I'm always happy to support an up underdog. I like the upset spaghetti, you know, so I'm looking for that lower bracket run. So what I'm looking here isn't, I don't even care if it's a close game or not. Um, I want good siege. That's what I want. Mm-hmm. I want very clean by Drexel or UMBC. I want them to show us that they've got the fundamentals down because that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter how good you are as a player um, or you know if, if you know the map inside out. It comes down to the fundamentals as a team and you need to be hitting those certain things. So whether that's droning, whether that's trading, certain skill sets need to be there and I want to see them demonstrated in this game. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And this is a massive opportunity for these players too to just continue playing in that competitive environment because Novi, we looked at some of the players' bios and some of them did say that they want to play competitive Siege. This is the collegiate level. We know from the EU that a lot of top, top players, you know, managed to use this as a stepping stone all the way to the top two. So, you know, maybe you're part of a program that's not the best team. But as an individual, if you can show that you're a really good teammate and you have the ability to to frag out as well, this is the opportunity to put some tape out there. Yeah, there's a lot of players had their start in grassroots just like this in, in esports scenes. You know, both Gibson and I are, you know, we're over on the other side in Europe and we've got players that in our university, in our collegiate level, who are competing in tier three, tier two and national level mm-hmm. competitions and are vying for that pro league spot. Uh, you know, an AL player who, who could get all the way up to that level and be a pro league star. It can happen. And this is kind of where you get a first taste of competitive where a lot of people get the itch, I call it, because it's that, you know, you, you once you get that taste of competitiveness, once you taste that win, you have that itch where you just want it again. It's so addictive for, for these for these players. And nothing is more addictive than being in the lower bracket where everything is out on the table, all the cards are being played. Whoever loses is sent home, sent back in. Like this is the opportunity to show us what you're made of. Exactly. And I think a lot of viewers Novi, they don't really understand the fact that as a caster too, we love seeing the growth of players and them stepping up to the next oh, level. Yeah. You spoke about the underdog thing too. We're big into the underdogs, but you know, if one of the players in this tournament does go on and get to T3 level or T2 or even T1, you know, as a caster, it's kind of nice to say, yeah, I, I saw them whenever they were on the up. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. You take a bit of pride in it almost for sure. Um, and uh, and as you were touching that growth, that's one of the things like with Robert Morris, that game against Penn State, the scoreline didn't show the level they were playing at. It, that wasn't a fair representation. That game could have easily gone 6-4. Um, and I don't want them to be disheartened dropping that, uh, into this low bracket. Same thing can be said for these two teams with Drexel, UMBC. Just because they've been they've lost that first game, just because they're now fighting for their tournament hopes, doesn't mean they're out for the count. This is just another opportunity to sh- prove yourself. Nothing too surprising on the operator bands. Pretty standard stuff. And we're, of course, on Oregon, so it's pretty standard things. I'm not going to get excited about the Blackbeard pick until it gets locked in. <laughs> um, I, that's just, I'm assuming that is definitely a bait by Buckding. Um, oh, we've had a player leave. Maybe that's just... a bit of an issue. <laughs> Yeah, game uh, I think crash. maybe they just saw the black. We're so close, <laughs> so close. Yeah, they saw the Batman and was like, "Nah, bro, I'm out. I don't want to play this one." Um, I am gone. So we may have. We'll find. We'll know pretty soon if there's going to be a rehost or not. But it's you know, there's a little bit of ethics. I think whenever we attack an EU or if someone on our team takes Blackbeard, you know, you're kind of obligated to shoot out the shields yourself so that they can't use it. But this is a false start, and we know that whenever we get back in, we're going to be going to the top floor in Oregon. Whenever you talk, Novi, or you, you go to the library, you know the book of strats on how to attack every map? Well, the Oregon book is one of the most worn ones in that library because 
every single person who plays Siege at any level at all has a very good idea of what the standard attack is on the site. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can kind of shut your eyes and just start playing. Uh, it's one of those ones where everybody should be comfortable with it. Everyone should know uh, what's going on. And there shouldn't be any surprises. That being said, there is an opportunity to do something a little bit spicy, like just, you know, peek past the bedroom door. Why not? Run close to the balcony. Okay, maybe that was a little too aggressive. Fiery combat might not want to live up to his name too much. The rest of the players now down for the count after their player unfortunately disconnected due to a technical issue. UMDC now have that man advantage, can work their way through. You can see the usual utility, the deployable shield next to the dorms to try and prevent any kind of pixel angle. But Joe is going to take the next kill onto Bootless. This is Drexel getting kind of demolished following on through. I felt for them, especially with the player disconnecting. There's nothing you can really do in that situation, but this is just insult to injury. UMBC easily, quickly sweep up that round. That was clean. That is one of the cleanest attacks I have seen in a long, long time. Yes, they did lose you know, KZ very early on, but Joe over, you know, the two games, well, two and two or one game and a round that I've seen him in so far is so impressive with how he attacks the map in phases. Nova, you know, he, he doesn't wait about once he gets the open and pick that open and frag. There's no hanging about. He doesn't let the defenders get back into a position to regroup. He literally jumps straight into the action and keeps that, you know, as the kids would say this day, he keeps pushing P, keeps the accelerator on it, and makes it so difficult for those defenders to regroup. Yeah, it's keeping... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just threw you for a little bit of a loop. But yes, no, you're right. It's that applying... Uh, we always call it a, a, aggression, right? It's mm -hmm. when you're doing something that is... You're taking on more risk to try and get um, a, a, a bit more of an advantage. Um but the issue comes with when you should have just backed off in the first place. Apologies, though, for the misinformation. It's actually upper bracket game, not lower bracket game. So mm -hmm. this is deciding who is going to go into the upper bracket final. So to be fair, it might not be an elimination game, but it's a promotion game. And this is to promote into, what would that be? Guaranteed top four, I believe, in that point, or at least top six. No, top four, top four, I think. Yeah, top four in that point. If you get to upper bracket, you at least finish in the top four. So mm -hmm. looking to get that upper bracket berth, Penn State have shown that they are a little bit mortal in that Robert Morris game as well. So there is an option here. But University of Maryland, Baltimore County, they still need to run through Drexel and uh, Drexel vice versa. And Oregon is very even playing field, like you touched on beforehand. Very, very even. Everyone knows how to play this. You know, mm -hmm. your, your your nan, your brother, everyone, your neighbor around the corner, everyone, even if they don't play Siege, they can know how to play it. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration. But it is that <laughs> played out that you can just kind of switch off. And this is where we'll see, essentially, it's a very good test for which team is better. There, there is no hiding on this map. It is, and whenever teams try new players, this is one of the maps that they usually do it on. You know, how well can you perform on a map like that. And you spoke a little bit about Penn State as well and saying they showed that they were human. Well, in the words of our Lord and Savior Arnold Schwarzenegger, if it, ble if it bleeds, we can kill it. That's what a lot of teams will be thinking about Penn State right now. But no way. This is Drexel University. This is UMBC. We saw UMBC dismantle. You know, they really did. They, they dismantled Kutztown earlier on today. They're playing Drexel now, who are a surprise package to us. The big thing that I would do if I was Drexel is work out on how to shut down Joe and KZ because to me they give that team that some that special sauce. You know, that's the the key ingredient for them is the kills that they manage to pick up. So if you can shut down those two, you've got a chance. And it's also setting up that storyline for us as well. University of Maryland, Baltimore County is essentially Penn State's the favorite. UMBC is like the one that is pegged to go to that final and challenge them for that spot. So mm -hmm. Drexel is kind of the underdog in this situation. I said I wanted to see an underdog and root for them. They already showed briefly in that one round 
even with losing a player, that they can take the aggression. They're not afraid to swing these corners. Um, and that's a good sign. That's a very, very good sign. Mm-hmm. A lot of the time you see players, when they know that they're the underdog, when they know they're not the favorite, they're a little bit hesitant to swing that. They doubt themselves. And that split second, that adds up. You know, that's one temp here, two temps here. That's the difference between winning a gunfight and losing it. And Drexel, if they're showing that they will just absolutely send it, I think that's a very, very good sign, even even in that briefest round that we saw. Yeah, I'm excited for what this game is going to bring. But you spoke about that timing, you know, the fact that all these little tents add up. The clock is a very cruel mistress. At the start of the round, the clock is in the attacker's favor. But the longer you wait in those little tents as they add up, suddenly the clock becomes an extra defender and it becomes even more difficult. So you can't hesitate. You can't wait about, you know, we've all watched SA, NAL, EUL, the top players, there is zero hesitation. They literally have the little checklist in their head. And as yeah. soon as they draw through that first line, Novi, they're straight on to the second. Yeah, it, it is, it's instant. They they don't doubt themselves. There is players... I, I mean, you see it in the interviews, actually. That, mm-hmm. That's probably the best place to see it. E- even down to, like, Tier 2, Tier 3. When they're playing against players who are quote unquote better than them mm-hmm. um I, I remember there was one with the delta project lineup two world champions kanto and fabian and teams would beat them and they go yeah it's just another team like because for, for them even though they're in tier three it was like they don't care it's a world champion they're just gonna go mm-hmm. in and absolutely gun them down they absolutely unequivocally think that they are a better player whether it's true or not it doesn't matter The fact is mentally in their head, Mm -hmm. they back themselves. And that means that they can perform at that level. When you are the underdog, it's an advantageous position. There's no pressure. You're expected to lose. This is your chance to surprise us and show us how well you can play. I believe we're redoing this first round as well. So clean slate, but both teams did kind of get a a sense of what the other one was cooking in the kitchen. Uh, once again, down the Blackbeard is going to be running through, but hopefully no computer crashes this time. Hopefully not. Look, it's the thing that you have to deal with, unfortunately. No matter what the level of competition, you're always going to get little tech issues like that, but it's good to get this game up and running. And, you know, you spoke as well about the underdog thing. Look at Eminem and how they did at SI. They went into that tournament mm. thinking to themselves, you know, nobody expected us to be here. Let's just have fun, and they made it out of the group stages. So it goes to show with the right attitudes, you can take down anybody because we've seen it in the past. You look at the old G2 roster. They didn't even make it to SI because teams that were on paper not as talented as them didn't fear them. They backed themselves, they won their gunfights. And that's it. Confidence is that sixth player, Novi. It is such a huge factor i mean you can even look at si and the fact that tsm won and tsm a fantastic team but going into that you would have gone oh you know bds look insane you've got all the latam teams as well then you had down one Kier who just swept their group in such a dominant fashion tsm finished third in their group at si mm-hmm. and they ended up being the champions they lifted the hammer you know, and, and that sort of testament to go, it doesn't really matter how what happens earlier on. As long as you still have an opportunity, it's all that matters. And it's all up to you to perform in that arena. Now, here's Joe, though, on that Flores with the Rotero Jones as well. Very, very Compton player, especially on the entry, on the attack. This player comes absolutely alive. Drexel, they have to be wary because if they let him get in a position where he can just get a bit of an advantage, they are going to be punished for it. And that's another player that we've yet to highlight, but we certainly should. That's KZ, and he is an absolute terror on the server. 
Oh my god, KZ is a scary man. Joe is the same spoopy though. Pulls one back, that shotgun. At the moment, absolutely singing out its song of misery. A minute and 54 on the clock, but the attackers, they're working through that little checklist. They're getting the wardrobe door open. KZ on the windows, having a little look into games, and now he's going to change his position and potentially push up white stairs. Not only that, Joe has gotten rid of the shield, which will force mute and smoke back out of that little bit of position i love the way that umbc have started to approach this round look at that spoopy's gonna get taken down by kz as well it's a 4v2 situation and now bootless and monkey have it all to do but they're in a very good position with smokes in the lineup you can delay novi but massive he is gonna just go ahead put that diffuser down and all of a sudden umbc they're now the defenders novi and they're in a prime position to win round one. Monkey do, monkey don't. Monkey kicks the boot, <laughs> but Bootless is still alive on that smoke. Should get taken down right here. There we go. Massive opening up the first round for them. Getting them that W, getting them that victory. That's 1-0 up. Drexel fall behind on their first defensive round. And is this something, is this signs of things to come? Because UNBC are attacking. They should, in theory be at that disadvantage and that was drexel's primary site they're now opting to switch things up going down to the bottom floor to the laundry room do a bit of laundry a bit of cleaning uh but umbc currently they look like they're cleaning house great start by them and now with the change of position for drexel maybe they're going down down in an early round and we'll see where it goes i'm sorry again i'm going i need to stop doing some puns no way because i'm going to get sacked but anyways the first round, I think what UMBC did very well was the way they played the, the every section of the round was perfect. They got the open and two picks. Yes, they lost a man, but they kept focused on what that objective is. And they went ahead and they finished the round. They got the win. For Drexel, you're going into the second round. You're a round down, but you just can't afford to let yourself panic. You've got Mira, so that kind of says to me they're not going to play the elbow hold novi but with mira in play even if there's nobody playing on that mira it gives those defense those attackers something to think about doesn't it absolutely it gives them something to think about something to consider and sometimes you see players kind of panic similar to when you see a clash or even a monty it's that deer deer in the headlights rabbit in the headlights where the eyes just go wide and they don't know what to do and they're just standing in the middle <laughs> of the road they're just standing in front of the shield of this black mirror like well like what do i do um <laughs> and you just kind of need to be calm and and sort of go through your options go okay well do we have hard breach is it electrified uh, is there a way we can clear it from behind can we get a vertical angle do we just have to deal with it and we swing it as two and try and bait the mirror out from that window there are always options but the problem is is because people panic they either go for the wrong option or they waste too much time trying to decide what to do yeah and deciding what to do is exactly what umbc are doing right now as they're clearing top floor they've cleared the middle floor as well so they are 100 percent confident that there's no roman presence but they've spotted out one of the players playing on white stairs the question is now how confident is kz he's got two nades Novi. he could just toss one out and maybe get himself a free kill he's looking for it it's an option but getting drone down into freezer making his way down the stairs no resistance yet default shot out as well but that's the goo mine so that's an audio cue going over to drexel how do they react to that information don't know if any players are going to try and peek through you can see he's just slowly shoulder peeking each corner trying to find something gone six goes out to destroy the deployable shield that means he can safely cross as he knows there's no one behind there the flash is also covering his approach there's now three players down into freezer going to drone around the corner as well that'll give credence to push up freezer and start applying pressure across the basement corridor but there is a player sitting right behind the actual bomb and that could cause a few issues if they didn't already go oh it's a one-on-one -on -one trade it's actually umbc taking advantage monkey swinging around the corner doesn't find the banana has to back off and that's a three on three drexel 
<laughs> is trying to hold on, but Monkey did a good job in shooting out the Rotera drone, gets slain by Massive, going extinct. We're a 3 2 scoreline. Massive is starting to stick the diffuser, but Spoopy, no, is not quite enough. KZ closes that one out. UMBC take the second round. Yeah, well, Novi, they may have gone down Freezer, but they came in hot in that one. <laughs> As they managed to get the second round on attack. But if you're Drexel right now, Novi, things just aren't going to plan. You're not winning your 1v1s, and even whenever they do get a knock, just UMBC are so fast to trade it out again. Yeah, they're, they're, they're so, so fast at turning up, like... As soon as Drexel slams on the brakes or slow the car down, UMBC cut the brake line and just like put Defenders foot back on the pedal and just go even faster. Backers. You know, they're, they're like, we don't want to stop. We want to keep going, keep pushing, swing those corners, swing those angles. Drexel did a really good job. Monkey in that corner on the Jaeger just behind the bomb did a really, really good job in holding and wasting time. Just wasn't quite enough to deal with the swing. There's a few moments there where UMBC could have been caught out but they had the crossfire set up they were covering the planter they were doing their due diligence and that helped them secure that round it did but we're getting ready to get involved in round number three it looks like fiery combat's extending himself a little bit out maybe we're going to see a little bit of a spawn peak to get us underway fiery combat they've moved around they've got the malusi out they've got you know that that could cause some problem problems for that one my or that uh Malusi gadget, but they end up moving it away. So the attack coming on in from UMBC. They're absolutely flawless so far. Two rounds, two wins in game number two for them. Let's see how they're going to approach it. But I'm looking at this attack and setup, and it's the, your standard 3 2 splits. Ooh, slight issue of massive leaving the game. That could be a technical issue, but I believe. It's after the prep phase, so no rehost is going to be allowed, unfortunately, for UMBC. So, starting at a deficit, I guess it's only fair, seeing in the first round. I actually know they got to replay <laughs> that one, so it's just an unfortunate situation. You kind of got to deal with it. Doesn't seem to slow them down. Going small tower, working their way through, trying to drone out and get a bit of more information. The fact that that drone stayed alive for so long, got so much information, was kind of disastrous for Drexel because that's allowed Joe to push up quite confidently to this wall. He knows that no one's close, no one's in showers who can swing him or anything and can slowly start opening the reinforced wall from small tower through into dining and they can start looking for that execute onto the site very early on in the round and it helps when Buckton gets the kill too. Yeah, the confidence, Novi, to go ahead and go straight up onto that wall and open it, even with the player deficit. And now they're getting ready to execute, but the hole is just not big enough to fit through just yet. But once they do, I expect to see some action. MT or M Tech has got that Sophia LMG, the LMGE, which has just absolutely changed the game. Joe is already in there and putting down that diffuser. Smoke's going to come out. Joe don't care. He's going to fall back in the diffuser's plant. And KZ gets one on the spoopy. But bootless knives down M Tackle 3v3 with 35 seconds. Azami pulls one back. Bootless pulls one back. And it's all down to KZ. Iana, two nades in the pocket if he needs to use them, but it's a 1v2 situation. He gets slammed. And just like that, we will see Drexel win their first round, Novi, but it wasn't as clean as they would have wanted. Yeah, that was after getting the advantage of a four versus five right off the back. But a win's a win. A round's a round. Doesn't matter how you came there, as long as you've got to the destination all right, without any casualties. Drexel, getting that first round is helpful, but where do they go in their second? They're going back to what was their primary uh, site of choice, which is kids' dorms. Um, mm -hmm. They looked a little bit shaky on this one, honestly. They didn't look too good, and UMBC had a good idea on how to crack their defense. Yeah, and that's what they need to do is just find a way to shut down the key players, whether that be by... You know, a DC happened at the start of the round. They need everything they can because UMBC, they've already won two rounds on attack. So really the ball is in their court for the rest of the game. Anything else they get after this point is a bonus for them. And with the way that we've seen some of these teams build momentum, if UMBC go into their defense phase, Novi, with 
you know, t three rounds, maybe even four. You don't know what the way they're playing. It's it's going to be very difficult for Drexel to claw their way back in. Yeah, it's tricky. It is very, very tricky. I'm looking for them to at least adapt a little bit on what they're doing on this one. Bring something a little bit different. Change the positions, maybe. I would have liked to see a mirror, maybe. Uh, that that could have been kind of interesting setup, but I believe this is quite similar to what we had beforehand. I'm going to be looking at Fiery Combat because he opened up this whole game with that fantastic peek onto Master Bedroom Balcony. So far, we haven't seen anything more from him, and I want to see that player step up. I want to see that early aggression. And from the get-go, put UMBC on the back foot. Yeah, and Joe's whipped out the Flores as well, so it's pretty much the same attacker lineup that they took in the round that was abandoned at the start of the game, where Joe and KZ pushed hard and fast in through Master Bedroom. So whether we see something similar again, we'll get to know KZ 5-1 and one right now, absolutely smashing this game so far. Um, you look at the defender side, you know, Bootless with three kills, Monkey with one, Azami with one, Spoopy with one, Fiery Combat with one. When you consider that they have won one round, Novi, I suppose the one thing we could say is they've been efficient with turning kills into wins, maybe? <laughs> no, you got to find a positive to it? Yeah, I, I guess, I guess. I don't know, I think UMBC is currently just looking like the better oh. team. <laughs> oh, but that is a fantastic C4 by Spoopy. That's more like it. There we go, Drexel. After UMBC raised the bar, Drexel raises it above them and is now saying, you play at our tempo, you dance to our beat. Joe waiting patiently in the main lobby. Thinks that there's a defender around the corner. He is right on that one. But is playing patiently, not walking into a master bedroom control. Has gone over to the attacking side. Defenders have been pushed out. But you can see the Mute Jam is slowly taking their time to delay UMBC from pushing any further. Massive is getting a lot of value out of that drone. Eventually gets slain. Joe gets fiery combat going down in a flurry of bullets. Frag grenades should get rid of that bulletproof cam. Was it cooked properly? I think it did manage to get it. That's fine. So they've opened up. They completed a lot on the checklist, Gibson. And now they're looking for that execute. Yeah, one more pick will give them full reign to make a move onto the side. Joe's going to get rid of that shield as well, so that's another little task done. And that's exactly what they need to do, sending another little Rotero drone. And actually, the shield wasn't gotten that time, but this time it will be perfection. And don't be surprised to see the push coming in through Trophy and in through that wardrobe. M Tackle gets that opening kill now, and that could be the dinner bell wrong. The opportunity to push on in as the food puns continue. KZ having a little look around the corner. Spots out the head of Bootless. Well, he's headless now, not Bootless, as he falls. And it's a two versus four. 45 seconds left on the clock. And as things stand, the diffuser is going down again, Novi, and UMBC are ruthless. Yeah, massive on that hard support roll. Plants, the diffuser, now Azami Mami trying their best to bring it back to a level playing field, but not going to lie. Not looking good because Joe managed to take one with him before going down, but not out. UMBC moved to a 3-1 scoreline on attack on Oregon. Drexel University just not able to t stem this tide of aggression that's coming from this Maryland-Baltimore Baltimore County side. Mm -hmm. We've seen, this is the second time we've seen them play. We've seen Penn State play as well. And both of those teams have a very methodical approach, don't they, Novi? They know exactly what their jobs are going into the round and they work through it. And doing your job, you know, doing your job properly, would you say that it's narrowly more important than mechanical ability sometimes? Because when you use your utility and do your job, it has a big impact. I think it's a bit of both. Like some players, mm -hmm. they kind of rely on the crunch going, oh, I'm just a support player, it's fine. But then you look at Massive, he's a support player playing Hibana. He's doing the job expected of him. He's also currently 3 0. You know, so that, yes, on one hand, you shouldn't be expected to be the star player like, a, I don't know, Bolo or, 
or, or Shaiko or something, but you still need to win your ones. It comes down to that fundamental principle of you need to click heads good. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no other way to beat about the bush. Um, but in doing so, there, there's also that measured aggression of your team might need something other than you to go out and get kills. They might need you to be the person to communicate, to be a team player, to do a grunt role of droning for someone else. And you need to be willing to go into all those other roles with a smile and perform them to as best of your ability. You can be the, the best fragger in the world, but if you can't communicate, no team is going to want to pick you up. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Novi. It's you're bang on with that. Communication is key, and I know that there's a couple of uh, you know young, ta talented players coming through the scene now as well. We've seen some of them in this lobby. Let's see if they can make that step up to the next level. 45 seconds into the round, and Joe is hot droning on in, having a little bit of a look around Brazil. See if they can get that opening engagement again. Buck knows exactly where that one player is inside Armory, and let's see how long Malusi can hold the fort. The hatch looks to be closed, so Malusi could be about to get blown out of Armory. Not a good place to be, and they, uh, that is Monkey out of this round. Tekel still doing some drone work, still trying to clear out Brazil, but once again, the map control that is being taken up by UMBC now, the fact that they're clearing out all the roamers it's clinical. They are so calm and clinical with how they approach things, and they're going to be a scary prospect for anybody, Novi. Very, very scary prospect. It's not looking good, really, for either side. At this, oh, I want to say either side, but definitely Drexel at this point. UNBC are also looking, I want to say, as clean as they did in their first game which is a good sign as their you know if they win this one which they look on track to do so they will be against the titans that are penn state and that's a whole whole different ball game isn't it that that is a different side and a difficult one at that to beat so showing this discipline on their attacking side is certainly a good sign massive and buck ding Aww. with a quick double as well a triple kill in the pocket for buck ding bootless might be about to be headless at this point. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a body shot, but at least it's a flawless round for UMBC. Yeah, and UMBC, they're making short work of this one. They have four rounds on the board as we go into the switch, and they're just two rounds away from stepping into the next phase of this upper bracket. Drexel, though, maybe they're an attack inside. Maybe they're better on attack. The attacker repick has changed the way the game plays and I'm looking at the lineup they're taking straight away they're bringing Zofia, Iana, Ying when I see Ying Novi I think one thing and that is a fast aggressive push do you think that they might be able to catch UMBC Cole on the first round in defense maybe maybe but they have the option to re-pick off of it I like seeing Ying paired with a lion personally I absolutely love that combination you activate the lion <laughs> I have no other word for it other than dubstep, bass, bass boom, I don't know, subwoofer. You get him to send out the good vibes, you throw in a yin candela and anyone who tries to move away from it, well, they're going to get pinged anyway. It's a, it's a good combination. You just have to be in the right position to use it. The only issue is that does use up a lot of resources. You've got, you're essentially committing two of your five operators on that lineup to a very specific task. And you might have to sacrifice, I don't know, the heart breach or the jackal or other utility that can be brought to other operators. It's always a balancing act necessary, but the ying is being stuck. We're seeing Habana and Iana to back them up as well. With the secondary heart breach as well. So, you know, I, I think you touched on it. You you sort of sometimes with the tin openers, you get them brought instead of the case of two heart breaches, which we would traditionally see. Yeah, and the can openers, it just adds an extra dynamic to some of these players as well, because it does change the role of, of Ying a little bit more than in the past, where people used to just take the smoke grenades and take those candelas, which have been buffed now. I think Ying has got an extra candela, and a lot of people forget, Novi, that Ying has got the secondary, you know, the secondary use for Yings, where you can actually place them on hard walls too. You don't always have to roll them into the room, so... You know, with the can opener and that ability, you could see something clever coming out from Fiery Combat. 
Yeah, definitely. You could see, you know, you can see something a bit different. It could take them by surprise. Ooh, but that yokai. A good echo play is an absolute terror. It has to be very clever with where to put the yokai. It can 100% win around. But even just the information we, you know, I saw it the other day where they used the echo drone, the yokai, to go out of a drone hole. This was on Chalet and Snowmobile. <laughs> out of the drone hole to work out when. Uh, who, where the positions were of the people who were trying to open up that door. Oh. So as soon as they opened a the reinforcement, they ran through and just shot the guy. And it was really, it was an insane place. There's so much die, so, so many sort of dynamic ways in which you can use that operator. But that was a great opening by Monkey that just ripped the head of KZ, and who's a star player for the UNBC lineup. But it's going to be more difficult with Freezer when there's a shotgun waiting around the corner. Joe. Nicely done to even up the man count. Buckding chimes in onto Fari Combat. So the Ying is not going to be able to flash the Candelas. And instead, UMBC are in a commanding lead as they go into the last 50 seconds of the round. Yeah, 50 seconds left on the clock. Massive still playing on elbow, so he's not failing on his task of being vigilant. You just never know when the push could change. That's the utility coming on an M tackle now completely blind, but still manages to hit a couple of shots and gets the diffuser down. Two members standing, but M tackle's going to get knocked as well. But look, there's now one standing player. It's the Jackal in the freezer. Buck tosses that C4 over the ledge. Doesn't find a kill with that one. Bootless gets the kill with the nade. And all of a sudden, it's just down to him. They cut one of those reses off by the looks of things. But 10 seconds. It's a 2v2. The crush comes. Bootless gets one. Swings around the corner. Tries to find the kill. You don't have time to get the diffuser. All you gotta do is play it safe. But the Echo gets the kill. And UMBC are now just one round away, Novi, from progressing through to that next stage. One round away from progressing to that upper bracket final against Penn State. Are we going to get another 6-2? Is Drexel able to get their next round on the board? Or is it just going to be a case of UMBC rolling through and getting the fastest victory we've seen so far in this tournament today? Drexel's got it all to play for, really. There's nothing left to do. We unfortunately didn't get to see the Ying come to fruition after sort of teeing her up for a big play. It didn't really happen. Maybe, I, I think on this site, maybe it's a, a, a little better because once you get the Master Bedroom Control, you can throw those Candelas right deep into the back of the site and really start swinging in from all the different angles. Yeah, well, you got to play aggressive. And, you know, something, you know, I know that Stickula spoke about it a little bit earlier on the day. This is a LAN game too, Novi. So, you know, the whole swinging thing where you get a little bit of a peak, you know, peaker's advantage. It's a little less powerful, I suppose, on land builds as well, because all the players are essentially on zero ping. So if you are going to swing, you need to use Ying to the absolute ability and being annoying, be as annoying as possible. But two minutes, 50 seconds now for Drexel to get something going on attack in this round. It's a very turtle defense though that we're seeing from UMBC in this one though yeah which is surprising because they seem to be a very kind of like aggressive side and or so much so in their first map that we saw on I think it was theme park yeah it's theme park so mm -hmm. maybe a different style it wouldn't surprise me if we see some of the players floating around on the first floor I believe there is let's see who that player is I, is it KZ? It would, it would not surprise me if it's KZ hiding down here. Oh no, oh, that no. looked like an SAS operator. That definitely looked like an SAS operator. Is, is that Buck Ding? Just, just casually, yes it is. Just casually sitting in, in the security in the servers. And he's waiting patiently and he wasn't spotted as well. So this could be diabolical. Oh no. Or oh. if they don't read it. Finally spotted. Okay, so his position's no, but... Ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, it doesn't really matter because there we go, it opens the hatch and suddenly he's got an escape route. And now he's just going to be an absolute fawn in the side of Drexel because they need to always consider that he can push up White says at any point. 
Oh, and Azami Mami gets the first kill of the round, making it a 5v4. Can Drexel make the comeback happen? Oh, Buckting has decided he spent a little bit too much time playing inside security, and he's going to push. Oh no, easy kill for Buckting as he's going to get that knock onto Azami Mami. So it's back to a 4v4. <laughs> Buckting just skeeter shoots a monkey out of the air. He just fell from that tree very, very quickly. Spoopy is on white stairs, but there's so much barbed wire that he's just going to find it very difficult to get up there without being spotted. But look, Ying's getting ready. Those candelas are being charged. Oh, Novi, he backed out of it. There we go. Oh, okay. Waiting for teammate to use utility first for the magnets it's still not gonna matter they're still gonna go off jump straight into the line of fire massive the timing wasn't quite there he wasn't blinded was only blinded after the fact spoopy at least gets another one onto the hero that is buckting but umbc have the three two lined up they're on match point they just need two more kills to send them into the upper bracket final make that one more it's all on bootless Looks a little bit clueless. <laughs> GGs are being called in chat already by UMBC. Drexel, this oh. might be it. Bootless, I think that's it. That, that's absolutely the round. Bootless isn't going to be given anything. KZ might get tagged a little bit, but that's the round. UMBC commanding victory over Drexel University. 7-1. Drexel is going to be sent down to that lower bracket. And University of Maryland, Baltimore County moves through to the upper bracket finals against Penn State. Yeah, brilliant performance by them. And that is going to be a very interesting matchup. And Novi, you know what the best thing for UMBC is now? Even if they go on to Penn State and lose, they're still going to go back down into that lower bracket. You need to lose yep. two games to be eliminated out of the double elimination bracket. So... UMBC now, they're, you'd nearly say they're in a position now as our Penn State where they're going to be very confident that no matter what happens, they could make that final. And Penn State, they've got that break in between playing as well, which always factors in. Some of these players, we we sort of spoke about it earlier on. It was actually Connor in the interview uh, talking to mm -hmm. one of the players, I think from... Ooh, I can't remember. I can't rem remember which university it was, but they said that they've travelled since two a.m. in the morning. You know, so mm -hmm. they're tired and sitting around not doing anything for for an hour or two, waiting for your game. It's only going to make things worse. It's only going to make you more tired. It's only going to make you want to go to sleep instead of playing. And so when you get in there, we've seen it. Some of these players they take a bit of time to get going for the engine to get hot. Um, and in a best of one format. There, there is no safety net. You lose that game, you're you're out, or you're down into the lower bracket. There's no which mm -hmm. way to look about it. Penn State still need to be kind of wired because, yeah, UMBC look good. They, mm -hmm. they look good, especially on their attacks, which is generally where most teams struggle anyway. Yeah, they have been very good, and it's been all down to KZ and Joe and the ability that they have been or they have found to get those open engagements. It was really impressed as well by some of the play by some of the other guys on the team last in the last round in particular because they're sharing the load a little bit more. You spoke about the fact that one of these teams has been going since two, you know, two a.m. in the morning. It's it's going to be tough for them to do well. I couldn't agree with you more on that point. And we've got quite a few games yet to play. I believe what we're going back to the lower bracket next time around and. The, from this point on, for those teams in the lower bracket, it's win or you're out. So pressure's on. Yep, eliminate, which is always fun. Uh, teams seem to definitely change when they're down in that lower bracket. They they do, they don't play the same. We always liken it to when you sort of like an animal is backed into a corner. You know, suddenly they'll the, their behavior will just change, uh, and we see a lot of teams sort of go like that when they're one round away from being eliminated when they're one map away from being eliminated it just switches on and they play differently step the level up and that's an opportunity for drexel um at the moment though we're waiting to get a interview ready from our winning side but in the meantime we're going to throw it over to a quick break while we set that up for you guys don't go anywhere welcome back everyone welcome back and oh, look, Gibson's changed his look, hasn't he? He's now wearing glasses. <laughs> He's bit. wearing a hat. 
yeah, he's got a Pikachu in the background and Novi's changed as well. He's suddenly looking a lot more handsome and has a far better beard. Crot, how are you how are you doing, Crot? How are you doing? This is your I... intro for today. We, you're doing the late yeah. shift, aren't you? Yeah, putting it putting in the late hours here, but I'm excited to be on screen and finally get to cast and get involved in the action. And there's been a lot of it so far. It's been a lot of it. We've had some really good games so far. Been quite quick, but quite sort of giving us a lay of the land. It's sort of like painting the scenery in the background of the play. That's what we we sort of got. Now we're getting into the real action. This is where our star player is going to come out. This is where we're going to send people home. This is where we're going to elevate people up and hopefully put a crown on them. Let's bring up our uh, upper bracket. I believe we've got ready first. Uh, we've got both. we sort of gone how the lay of the land is looking at the moment. And here we go. So you can see... Robert Morris managed to win 6-2. Penn State had a bye, then got knocked down into the lower bracket. Cuts down, unfortunately, the same. Got knocked down by UMBC, who sort of breezed through Drexel and are on their way to that upper bracket final. Crot, this is... We've had quite quick games so far, but we haven't had any teams eliminated. You know, this is... Like, this is one of those cases where... You know, when your back's against the wall, everything changes. The whole game is different, isn't it? Absolutely. It's do or die now. I mean, both the teams that we've, we're have we about to commentate on, they've lost one and th there's no other option now. It's it's either you win or you just go home. And uh, it's like you said, your back's against the wall. Sometimes that can unleash the beast somewhat and uh, bring out the best in teams. But other teams can feel the pressure. And like you've said earlier, um, some of these teams have had to travel a significant way. 2 a.m. in the morning, I think someone was traveling from that fatigue and then the breaks in between games, getting cold hands and tired and not really knowing your opponent. It's uh, It can be disastrous. But Villa for the first time tonight. We're getting different maps on every single game. This is, we're getting very lucky. Very, very Spoiled lucky. I'm choice. surprised it's... Yeah, I'm surprised it's not all the same map. That's if this was in the UK, that's what we get. We get oh, just Oregon, be Oregon. Or just be Trump Oregon. Has. Yeah, just Oregon. Every single gap. But we we're getting Villa, which is good. It's exciting, different. Thatcher, of mm. course, being banned makes sense. I don't think we're going to see too many surprises here. But like you said, it's do and die for both these teams. Max gets the wall. Whoever loses will get eliminated. Whoever wins will move forward to fight another round. Uh, but it's going to be a tight one. Are we going to see more than two rounds scored for the losing side? Are we going to get a closer game? That's the real question. Yeah, I think we probably will see a closer game, especially since, you know, everyone's seen each other play now and they can start to formulate how they work, how they group up, how they flank and roam. And uh, that can come in big bucks now that you've got at least one map knowledge on it. The team that you're playing against but like you said i think it's just going to be fairly standard bands across the board just because you're not really targeting anyone they, you, they've only played one map and it doesn't really give you enough spice enough knowledge to really justify banning someone outright or target banning a player's fragging role so again just really good standard bands getting rid of those grenades getting rid of that extra intel and of course those horrible mirrors and the mirrors can be a bit of a nightmare. Gibson and I were talking about it where people kind of panic when they look into it. Um, mm -hmm. Look into the black mirror, look into my eyes. And they, they, yeah. they sort of freak out or get mesmerized. Sometimes actually you get this inverses rather than them freaking out, they almost hyper focus on it. And it, yeah. sometimes you've got to make a decision where on the attacking side, you just cut your losses. You just go, screw it. This isn't working. Let's try something else. Even though we've wasted this much time. Even though we, it's a sunk cost fallacy, isn't it? And you sometimes see teams like, they're like, ah, I just can't get through this angle. I can't reinforce or open this, uh, this reinforcement. Who cares? You sometimes got to know to cut your losses and move on. That's the beauty of the mirror, though. It can just be an imposing presence and it can waste time mm. with people not knowing how to deal with it and kind of it puts pressure on and it buys you time without even really doing anything at all literally just stuck in the wall and um it's a it's a very powerful gadget and of course it gives you a little bit of a drop and if you've got those reinforced walls with the mirror in and then the unreinforced so you can just bop around quick peek oh 
we've got a DC, and because that is in the prep phase, I believe we will have to rehost. Five seconds left before. Let's see if we can get confirmation on that. Reinforcements in place. That currently the teams are staying in, so maybe they're carrying on. We'll have to see. The admins will be able to resolve that soon. But in the meantime, let's just look at the lineup. So attacking lineup from Bryant University, TSS on the fuse. Of course, Ooh. brings the backup hard breach, but that is their only hard breach option, I believe. So if they're going to open any hatches or any walls, it is on the fuse, which is a very weird sentence, which in, what, three years of casting siege, I don't think I've ever said. <laughs> no, of course, the new gadget coming out does change the tides of some of these operators. But this, to me, because they've got no hard breach, just suggests that they are going for the frags, of course. We've got the F2 in Twitch's hand, the Sophia, and the Jackal. It looks like they're just going to try and hunt down everyone. And, of course, having that man advantage will be very favourable with this kind of lineup. You know, Jackal's very useful in Villa, especially for finding those roamers and just applying the pressure onto the defenders. And even when they're sitting on site, because you can ping them and shoot through the floorboards. But that's not going to be the case with the Jackal being removed. TSS at least replies on that fuse. And this is one of the things. Fuse's gun, this, this AK is just amazing. It's it is an absolute beast of a weapon. It's a monster weapon. But Fuse is so rarely played, we don't really see it too much which is kind of a kind of a shame skirt does have the c4 but no one above the hatch and that actually blows it up for the attackers if they so choose to come down that pathway we're halfway through the round and it would be an even playing field if it wasn't for the unfortunate disconnect of rogers or rogers not sure how he wants that pronounced but we'll, we'll, we'll go with rogers 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 Ro uh, rogers rogers we'll go with rogers <laughs> Oh, coming up Astro it, stairs, it's... but the fuse, that gun that we just talked about hits like a freight train as he starts to use his utility and drop down those hockey pucks. Just starting to make things a little bit uncomfortable on site for the remaining defenders and they have gone down to two now. So the numbers advantage and they're still drowning. This is what I like to see. They're still continuing getting that intel. They're not using that numbers advantage and just going ham and blind sending because we've seen that happen tonight already and people not doing their due diligence and continuing to drone has it been the downfall of many around tonight and i've got confirmation it is roggers not roger <laughs> so roger Ro <laughs> roggers <laughs> is the one in there i'm definitely going to pronounce that wrong at some point yeah. Kartz is now on the back foot though massively but snakes has gone down if toms can try and even this out find one more then that's potentially doable Ooh. needs to run down the clock seven seconds why are you peeking tom no. cheesy oh. cheeses the round from the jaws of defeat and somehow gets that one as Bryant University get in the first round. Yeah, just maybe a little bit of nerves knowing that they're in the lower bracket, affecting the decision making there. And of course, you know, Tom's Tom's involved with everything that is going on right now and has been up a lot, like really early. So he's probably stressed out and uh, affecting his decision making a little bit. But valiant effort, especially with that little UMP, it doesn't hit hard. And uh, I would quote Canadian, but I don't think that's very safe for cast. <laughs> probably i hope not. you know probably the reference not. oh yeah i do i do we'll, 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 we'll keep it keep it clean everyone oh a different disconnect this time from the other side Ooh, evening things out so it's a five on four um potentially get this rehosted it doesn't look like it so we're gonna carry on i guess that is even stevens it's an even trade um, yeah even trade so all fair all, all is fair and love and war i don't know the the quote, something and, and like siege. that. All is fair and yeah. disconnects in siege and rehosts. <laughs> so again, we're seeing another not all too favourable operator being brought out in the form of the cap can, but again can just be a nuisance and especially when you're not looking for it. Like we've seen the frost come into the limelight a little bit more recently. People just don't expect it, especially at the high levels. And uh it's, it makes for an interesting strat, especially when you see it in the kill feed and you're like, no way. 
And it's especially with being on Villa of all maps, this is one of the largest maps in the map pool. There are plenty of doors, plenty of windows, and the ability to stack them up now is so, so huge on these entry denial devices. It's absolutely massive. And like I said, with Frost, it's, it, yes, it's people get caught out, but it's also everything else that the operators bring. Frost has the shotty, has the deployable shield. Capcan has that C4, as well as a great gun, so he's very good at roaming around and being you know, a bit of a nuisance beyond just the gadgets. And if you're looking Absolutely. for that sort of flex last operator to round out a comp, he's a perfect opportunity to pick him up. Yeah, my stack, we usually call it the lurky cap can because he is just an absolute menace. But the fights are starting to kick off and they're going very much in the favor of Cuzztown here. And two down for Brian. And but the blink of an eye, I'm not really sure what happened there and who swung out onto that as now Tom starts to get a little bit of Grefis creeping forward, but he's not covering his steps, he's not crouch walking, but he finds the knock and a second one for his money. Can he get the third as he's come alive in the game number two? Was a little bit quiet in game number one, but certainly seems like he's got his aim all warmed up now. I believe that was the entry to Nile devices we were speaking of. You can get caught out if you're not expecting them. And oh, just like that oh. on Q-Semi, he gets blown in half. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the cap can is from the dead. Oh. He's, he's absolutely popped off and it doesn't matter that he's not even in the lobby anymore. Just left with snakes stuff. now, and that F2 is a monster. The rate of fire makes it a formidable gun, but I don't think rate of fire is going to help with a sliver of HP. All it's going to take is one little beak. Oh, nearly. But cuts down here, playing very reserved and not trying to give too much away. But K okay, just decides enough is enough and ends the round decisively. Good start here from uh, cuts down. Yeah, 1-1. One, one. It's a good bounce back from the last one. Will all our players survive the most risky and difficult period of the game? The operator selection. Will they manage to make it through <laughs> to the prep phase? Or will one of them crap out? We'll have to see. Um, at the moment, Next it's been even. As long as it's even... <laughs> it doesn't even matter as long as it's even, but hopefully they'll get through. I want to see that full 5 5 because we're three rounds in and we haven't seen it yet. So we don't know what it's going to be like. It could be a, a little bit different and show us something a little bit unorthodox. I'm not the biggest fan of this attacking lineup. I would like to see something different from Cheesy. Um, my personal preference. I'm also seeing a lot of... Zofia, which makes sense with the LMG as well, especially with Finker being removed, so it's sort of substituting in that role. Um, but you could get a Maverick in this scenario uh, instead of the Nook brings frag grenades. So, for that yeah. role, decent gun. Could be an option. Oh, fantastic gun. It's one of my favorites. I absolutely love Maverick. And it's it's not just for those cheeky little peak holes that you can create. That gun just handles that like a dream. But it looks like we're getting a fairly turtled setup here, of course, just making little rotations and stuff but they're locking it down and no one really looks like they're going on the roam yet but we saw what tom can do and did last time as he goes off over towards the balcony of course just probably trying to uh meet them with some explosives again we got the maverick the mavericks come back into it semi's swapped onto him so they are running it's like he's listening to you uh, he's listening listening to the cast Double hard breach, very, very useful, especially on Villa, but the Nook is still in play. There is angles to approach, but you need to be very, very smart on the droning. It's kind of a risk because a lot of Nooks will kind of just walk in and hope. Just and blind like, send. Literally pray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just blind send it. And the thing is, is if they're not aware of it, it absolutely works every single time because it's so, it's so effective. But a good team who's checking their defaults and has the sense and has good positioning around the map and map control, more importantly, will be able to punish it. And Cheesy has to be conscious of that. Absolutely. And especially being uh, first one going over and it is onto head. And that is at the hands of Cheesy. So it looks like what we were talking about just, just worked a charm. As he does have Diffuser as well. So it's a bit risky, especially when you're the spearhead. But if you can get in, use that gadget and then 
just remain elusive and no one knows you're there, then it can work out perfectly. And now we're starting to hear some utility being dumped as the smoke starts to come in, possibly just to cover where the nook is coming from a little bit more than she already has. Yes, that chaos that you bring from getting behind enemy lines. You can kind of see it in the players, the panicking, they have to reposition because they suddenly realize it's a threat. But the... Ooh, Ooh, that what frag grenade is eight. great. Semi, fantastic stuff from downtown as well, across the floors. Now rising up Astro Stairs to take an engagement, actually gets slain by Tom. Skirts holding on to the deployable shield into Master Bedroom, Ooh. but it's not going to be enough because Snake slips through, slides into the site, and just like that, Skirt is removed. The Razor Bloom might be flowering, but it's not enough to take down any of the attackers and the mute has been literally forced off of sight. It's a four on one with four on one with cheesy left to stick the plant. Thundy getting tagged as well while trying to back out. Get chased down Bryant. Dominant, dominant performance in that round. Absolutely. After they got that initial frag from the nook, it kind of it was a change in pace. They looked like they were all set up and ready to defend and then it just caught them so off guard and we, like you said we saw everyone adjust move around a little bit and it kind of really caught them off guard which is perfect use of the knock that's exactly what she's there for and i'm i'm still surprised that you know slipped past all the defaults no one managed to catch any audio cue but cheesy you know making us eat our own words a little bit there yeah, I'm happy. I'm always happy to be proven wrong. I'm ha I, I, I love it because it, for me, it's a learning experience and then I can also appear humble on stream. So it goes both ways. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, I love that. bring it back around, bring it back around to what we're seeing. Small adaptation from the KU, from the Cuts Town team. They've still got a camp can, they've got the smoke, got the mute, got the thorn, but here comes the Kona stations for Thunderbird. So not only is the spear a mighty, mighty weapon, both in name and in action, but also you have the Nitro Cell, you have the Kona stations as well. That allows your team to take a bit more engagement, similar to how Finca works as well. It kind of works in both ways. Yeah, and especially if you double those up with some of the deployable shields, you can just hunker yourself down and it gives you that opportunity to peek a little bit more than what you normally would, knowing that you've got that little buff or you can just get regenerated even if you get tagged a little bit. So it's um, it's a really nice combination and it works so, so well together. And of course, with that C4 as well, if you know that someone's going to swing you on the corner and you're down to minimal HP, you can tick yourself up and possibly allow you just to get that that throw, just the last little fingertips on it before you bite the dust as a kind of a Hail Mary with that C4. Still haven't seen the C4 out onto bedroom balcony or bedroom roof. Quite oh, often you'll see teams... Them. They, they go into the closet and just yeet it out to get like the spawn kill. And if, if you're not ready for it and you don't shoot it out, it's devastating. Semi trying to force Ooh. his way through into Astro. Skirt gets rolled. And that's the IQ picking up the first of the round. Bryant doing a very good job to set the tempo, get the opening frags. And KU kind of falling by the wayside a little bit in terms of those opening engagements. Yeah, it seems that Brian really are the ones with the entry frags every round so far. But we saw that cuts down can steal one away as we do hear a C4 being ripped. I'm not sure if there's any audio cues or if they do have something up there, but that's right above your teammate. Ooh, that was brave. But one down and it's a 5v4. But someone is on minimal HP is that fuse again just being a menace from above and like we said it just makes it so uncomfortable as well as taking away some of that utility that you've got set up downstairs it also means that you have to scurry around and when you've got that sledge upstairs breaking everything reconstructing the room it makes it even more uncomfortable as now the frags do start coming in one by one it's the even traders we're down to a 3v3 now so cuts town evening things up a little bit but not for long as bright absolutely slaps him tom gets another one though and it is trading off and this is what you like to see the immediate refrags the crossfires and this is what it's all about 
Rogers did a fantastic job of keeping cuts in the fold in this one. But Bryant <laughs> has managed to get themselves in a winning position. TSS being the one to spearhead the offensive. KU is actually repositioning onto the site. TSS is able to use the can opener, the hard breach gadget, to open up a line of sight through. KU's aware of that, and now the time is running out. TSS going wide with the Ooh. spray. How has he got it away with that one? That's that was a little bit stormtrooper. If you miss all the kills, oh, oh my lord, the Cap Gas still oh, in it. Was He's just waiting. He's pretty far in the angle, but there oh, we go. No. Cap gets the second round, and my lord. That if he had just continued to close. hold Mouse One, he would have got the kill, but. They got the win regardless. That, <laughs> that engagement was um, interesting, to say the least. I said I wanted to see some good siege. I don't know if this qualifies as a good siege, but it certainly qualifies as entertaining siege, and I will take that. Absolutely. But... Even round count here, and this is looking like a more promising and longer game than what we've seen so far. So, going into it, of course, we're only playing 5-5 five, five split here. So, the next round kind of is going to be very important at the switch of the sides. Very, very important. Very, very important. Oh... This is where we're going to see one side win it, one side lose it. So far, we've seen only six twos in round scores, or six ones. No team, no losing team has gotten three rounds, or more than two rounds. Um, both these teams seem capable of pushing the other one out. I feel like Bryant has been setting the standard, but Cuts Down has had some exemplary individual performance. Pretty much off the back of Tom's, like straight, I'm like off of the back of Tom's to pull through two rounds. And that shows, you know, the impact you can have as a player. We always talk about the team aspect, but sometimes, and if, if your teammates aren't, you know, they're not having a good day, they're tired, they're not hitting their shots. Well, sometimes you need to step up to the plate and carry them for them, you know? You need to be the one to bring them across the finish line. Tom's is currently doing that for cuts. Question is, is how good is his stamina? Because this is a marathon, this ain't a sprint. Absolutely, as we can see that he does have a nice, tidy kill total as he moves over to the pulse. And of course, pulse is deadly on Villa if used correctly. But just on your screen now, we're seeing snakes and uh, just clearing out some of that defensive utility while downstairs Tom, the fragger extraordinaire for cuts, is just getting the drop on what's going on above. Of course, he'll be feeding that intel back out to everyone and just relaying locations and where to look as they have already got a decent foothold inside upstairs. Yeah, decent map control. See Thundy. Entertaining the possibility that someone's coming from underneath. It's quite often a tactic to clear out any uh, Cade Electric Claws. <laughs> Tom's Christ blows cheesy sky high with a C4. I believe that was a pre play. No, 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 that was, of course, with the pulse using the cardiac sensor to detect as best as he can and then throws the night cell easy peasy lemon squeezy. And that puts Brian on the back foot. Oh, Tom's Brian. once again being that difference maker, being the key ingredient to push KU to that next level. Absolutely. And we saw that the Ying took an absolute battering as well. So the HP and numbers advantage firmly in the favor of cuts right now. But Brian, they're not one to back down. And they have continued the momentum as now they're creeping up. On to 90, as we can see, Semi on the IQ, trying to track down that elusive man of Tom's on the pulse. He's been very elusive, hasn't he? But that's what the IQ's brought for. It's brought for that purpose, to sniff him out. See what he can find. <laughs> so far, the IQ, not smelling anything. Tom's has gone away scot-free, wasted so much time. 25 seconds is left in the round. 
Bright's no closer. That's going to certainly help. You've just removed the pulse from the game. He's no longer in the round. The Toxic Babes are going out to deny the attack is the entry. They're just going to have to run through the smokes. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Roger Roggers oh, at least gets no. killed by his own Toxic Blue. Tier goes oh, oh, down oh. through the C4 as well. Semi's just going to stick it in the last split second, but I don't think it's oh, enough oh, defenders. Round, in cuts down have won the round and the half but they didn't half make it close three two at the half they did indeed but of course that pulse remaining so elusive and taking up so much time meant that there was 25 seconds it had to there was something that had to break and it just went all in one as Bryant just full sent and unfortunately when there's a smoke there and in 25 seconds you are going to be blocked out and you're not going to have a fun time of it. Not at all, not at all, not going to have a fun time and Bryant maybe they're going to be kicking themselves because a couple of rounds, a couple of moments that could have gone either way and we'd be in a very different situation as we are oh. now. Two players actually crashing again but it's from okay, either side. Bombs as they can. So even, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> there we go. No Easy peasy. Here. Play it. <laughs> Tom just said, play it. Yeah, I I agree. Play it on. It's even. Why not? Even trade. Even trade. And I mean, Tom might be cutting himself short there because he's not going to be able to add to his frag total with only four members at the start to uh, to mow down. But he did only manage to get one last time. But it's not always about fragging out. It's about wasting that time because time is your sixth man. It's the sixth man. Five seconds left before it's the one that applies the pressure, the unseen, the unseen member of the team, the unseen hero, one might even say. But then that pressure switches round as soon as the diffuser gets planted. He's a traitor, a, du a double agent. That's the one. <laughs> Double agent. <laughs> but this is the first offensive round for Cutstown here as they start to get a little foothold on the building. Not seeing all too much droning, but I will eat my words as Head is going in and just setting up a pre-placed drone just to watch the site and try and get any intel. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to have anyone watching that. Possibly now that the two team members have reconnected to the server. Will they be able to watch the cams? I'm not sure. Head should be able to. Should be able to once they're back in. Oh, but Roggers is having more problems. Unfortunate. But it doesn't matter in this one. He's already been dead before it started. Um, oh, and Soviet's having issues as well. At least it's not the people who are currently alive. Speaking Woo! of alive, TSS is no longer and Custown of rallying on the attack. Skirt really taking this entry game seriously. Just loses out to Semi. No trade possible. The alibi slips into the night and backs off that corner, backs off that ankle, but is now on the study door. Could potentially peak. Nighty Control has gone over to Cutstown, and they're going to start aggressing towards the bank vault, opening this up. There's nothing to deny it. The frag grenade goes through that. Shouldn't catch anyone who's standing around the corner. Could have maybe saved that utility, throw it deeper, but it is what it is. The drone goes out, and this is good. Cuts down, getting more information in that position to fight. You know, they've got time. They've got time to waste at this point. May as well get a bit more information in the process. Or with Tom's getting another kill onto Cheesy, that's pretty big. That is absolutely huge as the diffusers going down and the alibi though remaining elusive and of course being a three speed you can sweep and potentially catch him off guard but not heads he's ready and waiting but is he ready for snakes? Peak battle starts and oh no snakes actually manages to clutch it out and he'll have plenty of time to get the diffuser from the clutches of death they swing back to win a 1v1 and that, whew, that was a little bit spicy there. That was one of those 1v1s where you whiff your shot and the opponent whiffs and then you both sort of panic because one of you should have been dead by that point. Yeah. <laughs> it just, the, the two original whiffs enable more whiffs to happen. <laughs> it's like whiffception. Uh, it's a whiffception. <laughs> Are we in the real world? I don't know. <laughs> 3-3. Three, three. Looks like. Ooh. 
players are leaving so there is a possible re-host coming on the books it does look like that cool cool so we're going to jump back to our cams you can see our lovely faces <laughs> all the way from across the pond across the across pond. pond i like saying that that's that's just that's just fun i don't know um, why we like saying it so much as brits it, it just it's such a fun phrase and oh across the pond it's actually a massive pond. ocean um but pretty interesting and very very close and this is the closest game we've seen so far and of course it's because it means so much these teams know that if they do not step up that's it game over and we're really seeing that and we're seeing more due diligence come out in the form of droning later on in the rounds which watching early i didn't really see a lot of that from these two teams on their offensive halves and it's good to see that they've stepped up kind of had a word with themselves give themselves a little pep talk and uh they've come back and they're bringing the a game and i mean they have to yep have to bring their a game at this point i thought kind of counted uh cuts out at one point because i thought yeah they're, i don't think they i don't think they've got the legs to get through this i don't think it's going to be enough but actually they've proven me wrong they've stepped up to the plate really well and we're starting to see some good individual plays not just from toms i think that's the most important thing skirt was great on that entry mm. really really good job and the rest of the team just doing quite an a, like a sort of nice team play to trade off each other make sure they're doing their droning often when um you, you kind of want to run in just start clicking heads but you've got to go through the steps first you have to jump through the hoops that need to be jumped through uh if if you want to have success in the round and if you're too busy trying to click on heads and not droning you don't know where the enemy is and then you get shot it's kind of on you and it's good to see that cuts down even in this situation same for bryant they're not counting out the importance of that steps that they need to take absolutely me and gibson call it the little checklist of things that you need to do in a round and like yeah. you said droning is so so important that knowledge is power it's an age old phrase and it's a phrase for a reason and if you've got the drop on someone that potentially hasn't spotted your drone if you've got it in a sneaky little bush or a spot and even if you just hear a footstep of someone running to try and flank or relocate like the alibi in the previous round even the audio cue from that drone is going to allow you to have more intel on the uh, on your opponent than what they're going to have on you and it just really does swing the tide but again another thing that you mentioned is they're playing a lot more together they're playing for those trades which is nice to see the cross angles which i think maybe in the first games they were playing a little bit more loosey-goosey and i think getting picked off one by one and keep giving players one uh one v ones as opposed to having those crossfires or that kind of dual roam or cover roam going that's why we're seeing these two teams in the lower bracket yeah they, uh, but it's also showing how well they're fighting from that lower bracket position isn't it like the worst thing we'd want to see oh uh, the worst thing we could see is if one of these teams just rolled over and died they're like nah it's fine you can you, you can carry on it's nice to see <laughs> that they're like no, no 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 we want to stay in this we want to do our our university proud we, we want to keep fighting and that's a very very positive sign uh, from these teams and it shows that maybe if one of the uh teams who are currently you know further down the line if they disrespect the team if they i don't know you know underestimate them and get into a fight and predict that oh they're going to be easy or whatever they can potentially upset and do a bit of a surprise and maybe take them uh take them take take a bit of an unorthodox approach and once you get that because this is a best of one until the finals you know we always say anything can happen and that is that is true you can be the best team in the world but the best of ones are best of one you know or you only need so many rounds you don't have the safety of a best of three or a best of five so teams have to be conscious of this and cuts down right this is where you find your mojo your your confidence absolutely and that confidence that you talked about and you said about this earlier with um i think you said it was g2 and they just think any team doesn't matter if they're world champion doesn't matter we treat them exactly the same confidence if you're not confident that you're gonna want win a gunfight you've probably already lost it you need to have faith and confidence to take that fight to swing to peak and that confidence 
especially after losing your first game and being down here, you have to maintain that. You, you just can't let the pressure get to you and you can't let that first game hinder you, your confidence or your performance. But it's it's one of those. We're, we're seeing great resilience coming up from both these teams. It's so close. It's so even. And it's exactly what we want in all of the remaining games because there's a lot on the line. And like you said, it's not just the money that's up for grabs. It's the bragging rights. It's the glory. Yeah. And, you know, anyone badmouths you, like you said, Oh, sorry. Where did you finish? Um, oh, was it below us? Yeah, it was. Thanks. Um, so it's it's um, bragging rights and glory is uh, is uh, just as important as the cash prize in my mind. Absolutely, we saw it in the previous interview with, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna say the acronym because I will get the acronym of the. Um, but he was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, you're gonna see us again. Don't don't worry about it." It gives that confidence because you know they, and they they just want to do it. And the brain writes, okay, we've got slight round difference in correct. So going to have to rehost once more and get everyone back in. Um, it's currently three three, not four two to cuts. It's even Stevens, which means mm -hmm. teams are halfway to victory, but also halfway to losing. We've played half the rounds available to us in regulation. Absolutely. And just to remind everyone that we are playing the 5-5 five, five split. So there's actually, in fact, less time to uh, to acquire the rounds. And there's more pressure on you with, with the lesser round count. It means that you really cannot even drop one round. And uh, again, that just adds to the pressure. And um, it's um, just one round. You might think, oh, it's not that much from a half. Oh, it is. It really is. It doesn't give you that buffer. It doesn't give you that safety net. And it can punish you. And like we said, you have to bring your A game all round, every round. So we are just setting up the next lobby. It should be very shortly. And these uh, these pauses, they can play terror on a team's mental because... You know, this is a very back and forth game. This is an elimination game. Very, very tense. Um, and um, it, it sort of causes, you know, this this pause. You just wait. There's nothing you can do. You can't play. You can't warm up. No. You're sat out. You, you, you've got to sit there while, like, waiting, you know, maybe chatting to your team, you know, like, but you can't play the game. And that is so frustrating. And you, that's all you want to do. You want to it, all that emotion. You want to exert into one direction, and you're being told to stop. And quite often, players who are relying on that adrenaline, that's when the pauses cause the most havoc. Because adrenaline is a very temporary, uh, sort of like an emotional response. Um, it's a great motivation tool, but it will run out when you get the pauses. And this is where the more consistent players should rise to the top and we'll, we'll get the best players showing us what they can truly do absolutely and again with the pauses momentum if you find yourself you know maybe losing the first couple of rounds and then you get two back and even things up that cut that break you can lose your momentum and like you said you're not warming up you're not keeping your aim warm and you've got nothing mm. to do but sit there and yes you can talk about stretch you can talk about what went wrong what went right but you're still cooling down. And like you said, that adrenaline and your cold hands will come in to it. And people think, oh, it's 15 minutes. You, you can't cool down that much. Remember, these players have been waiting a couple of hours to play again. So and unless they've gone back and gone to another PC and just cracked on aim trainer or dropped into some uh, unranked, then it's, it's, a, it's a long time to go without doing anything. And of course, with the switching coming in and out after each game you set up your gear and that's it you're in the lobby there's there's literally no time to play so it can be a little bit of a hindrance just on top of the mental aspect that you're talking about but then also on the flip side it's a it's an opportunity for you to speak to the team you know i believe we've got all 10 players so we are going to get back into the game asap but they've had that break and we've been talking about the negative aspects of the break of ah you don't get to play whatever you do get to talk to your team right absolutely um, absolutely and 
that's huge. Yeah, especially when you're coming off the back of a lost round and you go, boys, what what went wrong there? How can we change that? And then you've got all the time in the world. Well, not all the time in the world, but you, you, you've got a decent decent chunk of time, more so than a tactical timeout, to kind of come up with a counter. And that's what Siege is all about. Uh, me and Gibson, we have a little phrase, uh, chest with guns. And if you can figure out your opponent's next move, their strategy, if they're going to recite the same strat as they just pushed in with, you can counter it. Same goes for the offense. And that's the more important time. Because if a team has been able to set up on a site and they're picking the same operators, you kind of loosely know how they're going to position themselves and how they're going to use their utility. With that little five-minute break, you can then come up with an efficient strategy to dispose of that. Yeah, you can sort of theory craft and almost <clears throat> do dry runs in your head, right? You can sort of go over it and go, okay, team, well, what have you played this? And you can go, you know, for instance, you can go, Skirt, what have you approached this? Can you play Sledge into this matchup and go down this? And when you go, oh, well, I tried that last round, but it didn't work for this, this, and this. And you can sort of come up, theoretically, go over options in your head. Like you said, come up with something maybe a bit better and optimize your your plan before it even hits the arena, before it hits the, the server. But we're back in this. We're 5-5. 3-3. Five, five, three, three, and all to play for. Backs against the wall. Let's see who's going to take the lead. Is it going to be Cuts Town? Or is Bryant going to take the lead once more back from them? That is a very cheeky C4. And it still catches people out, even in pro play. Yeah, and did you see the X-ray? There was a little to tootsie, a little, little toe there that could have potentially been caught there. And that would have, of course, done a little bit of damage to the planter of Sir Claymore. But we're seeing Tom now adopt the Bryant strategy of going over onto the Nook. Of course, a very different lineup to what we saw Bryant do on their attacking rounds. But Semi has been a nuisance on the alibi. And of course, being so fast and so quiet, that's what she's built for. And that gun is an absolute laser. Absolute laser. Well, that's some recall, but not a lot at all. And if you're sharp as well, with your aim, you can just absolutely annihilate people with that. But so far, this has been a fairly quiet round in terms of Activate sort of blood spilt. The Nook getting active, going aggressive, Semi getting tagged. Toms is going to pre-fire around the corner, but is going to get aggressive on the Alibi. Just runs straight in. Ooh. Semi, a little bit of a misplay, but at least Cheesy's finding something on the other side of the map. And four and four as we hit the halfway mark. That was a crazy engagement there, and the alibi speed, probably a little bit of a detriment there with that shift W sent through the door, and Tom was just ready and waiting, but like you said, even trade is now we can see the utility dump coming in, and that tip, tick list is being ticked. But checklist is being ticked as they get the wall open. I will get my words right eventually. Ooh, Ooh Tom's... Stepping up to the plate for KU. He's currently on 10 kills. Don't be fooled by that 2 nil in his score bracket. The first six rounds, he has been a monster oh. on the server. Thundy as well chiming in. This is so much better by cuts. So much cleaner. Where was this team in their first game of the day? Bryant University now falling by, falling behind and cuts down. Will take the advantage at 4-3. to three. Absolutely. And, you know... It it seems like they, they went away and had a little word with themselves. And it sometimes can be just the basics that that let you down. And it, you know, I didn't drone you in or I didn't drone myself in. We didn't stick together. We didn't create a crossfire. We didn't do our checklist of uh, getting rid of defaults. Anything like that. The basics. When you come to a land, when you come into competition, sometimes... They, they're the ones that you forget because you're in a high-pressure environment and it's worrying about the sneaky angles or the utility or who's creeping around as the pulse or the nook. And sometimes those basics, those foundations that you build siege on, they sometimes get a little bit forgotten in these uh, high-pressure environments. 
activated device. It's like a catalyst, isn't it? The pressure builds because you're in the lower bracket. The pressure builds because you're behind, or you're ahead and you're expected to keep that lead. It all feeds into the system, and this is where the cream will rise. You know, and what will get the cream of the crop? Uh, sorry, I like I, I stole. I stole it. No, 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 no. I was. It's something that Ian Chambers always says, but I completely butchered it and forgot what he usually says. <laughs> <laughs> so I completely ruined it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> anyway. <laughs> changing, the changing the subject. Changing the subject. Yeah, yeah, R6. Byron versus Cutstown. It's a tricky one for Byron. They're starting... Again, on uh, they keep seeming wanting to play catch up. That that's what they want to do. And cuts down has just awoken right now. Absolutely, as the frag train doesn't stop there. Skirt gets another one and two down in the opening minute, and things are not looking good here. But we do have Lurky Sammy again on that alibi as cuts down just systematically sweep and clear, and it looks like they're droning for one another again, doing those basics. Now the alibi has been revealed, but. Only two bodies on site. If this gets droned out, then we might see a very, very aggressive push coming out in the next 20 seconds. We could do. We could do indeed. Might be a bit of a tricky one. We'll have to see. But be very, very oh. patient with it. There's the kill from Tom. CSS replies, but I don't know if it's enough. We're halfway through. Thundies throwing a lightning at the back of Byron and that's just Semi who's just oh! left alone somehow gets that kill and Astro was not spotted bit of a misplay but hasn't been punished no, for it there's another again! misplay by Karts Diffuse has been planted Tom's ends all these shenanigans and cuts down University they move on to map points that was a crazy misplay there I talked about Alibi being fast and sneaky and light on their feet but come on you've got to give the call out you've got to give the call out and caught two members sleeping i'm not quite sure where the second member was actually looking coming through the rotation hole but yeah that was a little bit closer than it needed to be there definitely definitely a little bit closer certainly than it should have been now cuts down one round away from eliminating Bryant University or Byrant University um, from the fold. Cuts down looking very, very strong. Certainly found their form. Definitely. They look like a different beast coming into this. And it's nice to see, especially since they're the hosts of this great event that they are putting on for all of us today. So a big shout out and thank you to them. Of a bomb. What? Okay. So back to AVG. Pretty standard one. I think what I remember, Cutstown did a really good job of attacking this, but then kind of fumbled. And Snakes was able to recover the round, if I recall, in that. The whiffception. Yep. The, the, the whiff off. <laughs> That's going to be a thing now, isn't it? Whiffception. I'm, or, I'm or the whiff right down, the showdown of whiffs, the whiff down. <laughs> Absolutely, but potentially the last round of this game, and it is do or die for Brian. But can cuts down hold their nerve? Can they do their due diligence? Can they remember the check sheet? And can they clean this up in its brilliant style after coming back? And they've just been on a roll. Like we said, they just look like a different team. And it would be lovely to see them finish this off in style. But of course, we don't want Bryant to, to go down without swinging. Going down, swinging. That's certainly the case. Bryant. Is that a Fallout Boy being... reference? Uh, it's not, but I'll happily take it. I will happily take the <laughs> reference. <clears throat> yes, it was it was it was deliberate and dance dance cheesy as he backs off from the grenade flashed <laughs> in the process but isn't gonna go down. This could be a little less sixteen candles, a little no I'm not gonna do any more. Oh than my Scott god, that would have been fantastic. Overhead gets traded, it's a one for one, it's four on four, the Kona station 
He's going to bring some of the defenders back up to a suitable oh, health, but it looks no. like Karts is going to rip them to shreds. Two more, one more, and the last player standing. That is it. Cuts down have eliminated Bryant University. GG's well played. Cuts down live to fight another day. They do indeed, and that's going to be huge for them, especially as the host. You never, you never want to see the host go out early and coming back and putting on a really good performance. Like we said, it's like they've woken up. It's like they found themselves. And it bodes well going into their next match because, it, like we said, it was a very, very different team that we've just watched to what we watched in game number one. And going forward, that's only going to be a confidence booster as well. Not so much looking at, you know, oh, we need to, we need to not lose this or, or we're out. It's we've just won the last one. We can do it again, boys. We can surge forward. And like you said, you might just get your underdog story. Might get my underdog story. Certainly so. Uh, we will be preparing, I believe, an interview, um, which should be coming very, very soon. I'll get confirmation of when that's coming. But that that was a good one for lower bracket. Um, I'm just going to check production. Can we bring up the lower bracket? Because we haven't, had, I know it has probably hasn't been updated, but can we have a look at it? Is that possible? So we can kind of set the scene. If not, don't worry. Don't worry about it. Not an issue. Um, just because I believe our next match as well. Um, okay. Oh, we've got the low bracket. Let's bring it up. Let's have a look so we can kind of set the scene and uh, look at who cuts down might potentially be facing because I believe that their future opposition is going to be our next game of the day as well. Um, let's have a look at how this is sitting there you go lower bracket cuts down so it has defeated bryant and it's robert morris versus drexel that will be a very very good game which i believe you and gibson are taking crop i believe so and uh, again it's nice to come in after seeing all of the boys rocking it so far and now i get a chance to be in the action live but again it's two good teams drexel Obviously, they only played the one game. They got the bye in the first round. And um, maybe that was a little bit to their detriment because they hadn't had any time to get on the old mouse and keyboard and get warmed up. But like we've just seen with Cutstown, is it going to be a different story? Are we going to see a little bit more structure and uh, a little bit more aim warmed up? Okay, we're going to throw it to a break, but there will be an interview shortly between our lovely, wonderful host, Connor, who's looking very dapper with his bow tie, oh, bow tie and cuts down University Tom. So don't go anywhere. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome back to the Kutstown land, the takeover, the breaks over, and to Bryant, we say thanks for the memories as we move on. And my name is Gibson. I am joined by Crot. And Crot, how are you doing now? You can call me cringe stuff. I wish I'd never mentioned them. <laughs> oh my goodness, what a, what a reference. But they did go down, down. Sugar, we're going down swinging. But yeah, so we lose our first team and it's been a long old day for them. But the siege action does not stop and we're potentially, well, not potentially, we are about to lose another team as our next game is going to be the second losers bracket game and it's like we said in the last game it's make or break it's do or die mm -hmm. and uh you only get one shot one opportunity no i'm not gonna do that um you only get one <laughs> shot at it and any slip up any mistake any just around can be just the end of it and like we said it's mm -hmm. not just the prize money that you're paying for it's the bragging rights between the other universities so a lot on the line and uh you got to bring your a game you really do got to bring that A game. And this is the loser's bracket. Let's bring it up again to remind everyone. Right now, coming up next, we got Robert Morris versus Drexel. Two teams that I think are yet to show us what they have to try get on. And they will book themselves a game against Kutztown in game number eight. But Krat, this is a situation now where every single move you make matters. Every decision that you make as a player has an impact because this is the loser's bracket. There's no second chances. You make a mistake, you get punished, and you're packing your bags and you're going home early. Yeah, it can be as easy or as simple as just peeking something when you need to sit back. You've got the time. You've got the man advantage. There's no need to peek. There's no need to give away frags. It's silly little things like this which will make or break. And... It, it can even come down to just misplacing 
some utility and we've seen mm-hmm. it tonight peaking when you shouldn't have not letting a timer run down but again it's that pressure and especially knowing that you're about to go out it adds and it sometimes can cloud your vision and decision making it can and the big thing that i've noticed from all the teams that have won and especially the ones in the t- in the winners bracket is their utility usage has been second to none you know as well as playing the hard breachers they're using the second utility like thermite using the smokes using the stuns using the flashes we're seeing situations with some of the teams in the losers bracket they're using their primary utility but they're forgetting about the secondary utility it's almost as if you know I got the wall open, my job is done. Or, you know, I got the entry pick, now my job is done. We need to see these teams really up their game because they're here for a reason, Croft. These players are all super talented. They're some of the best in the nation at the collegiate level. And I want to see them show up, show out in the in the next map. Absolutely. And, you know, that utility usage, the secondary especially, mm-hmm. it's so, so important. And people really don't understand especially in lower levels of siege, as you, as you come up, you come up, you understand that that is another weapon in your arsenal, aside from your primary and your secondary. The damage mm-hmm. you can do by time delay or obscuring lines of sight or even getting rid of defensive utility, it's so critical to building the foundations for that win of every single round. And it's... it. it it really is building blocks. And we talk about the check sheet, Gibson, and that you've got to tick it off, mm-hmm. got to tick it off, got to tick it off. If you've still got utility in your back pocket at the end of the round. And we are in and ready to go. We're going to bank. So it's the sixth different map that we're going to see in six different games, which is exactly what you want to see. Crot, the first band's going to be the Jackal as they're going to go heavy to stop any you know, ability to detect those defensive roamers. And on a map like Bank with three stories, lots of little hidey holes, especially in open area and and up in stock, that is a good ban. Absolutely. We see Jackal always banned in Pro League or used to be a lot on Bank. That's going to be followed up by Thatcher, of course, just making that entry a little bit harder and giving you a little bit of safe haven, especially on the basement site. But it looks like it's going to be a store game from one and it's going to be an anti-roam game ban from the other and then again we're trying to get rid of that stalling and uh well this is going to be an interesting one it is look the last ban usually this is where we see a mirror mark but it's going to be the smoke and do you know that's actually a ban that i I like like because if you've been watching some of the other regions especially in apac and oce in particular when they play bank, that smoke has an absolutely massive impact on the game, especially in that basement site looking out towards server. We've seen Tachanka be brought, which is actually what's happening right now. So these delay operators can just completely lock down the basement, which is the site that they're going to. So the smoke van is a very good one. We are going to pause while we wait on one of the players to come back on in, Crot. But looking at that defender setup already, you got Vigil. You got Wamai, you got Valk, you got Tachanka. Apart from apart from Chanka, there's a lot of mobility in there. Absolutely, and it's not only that, it's the intel. And oh, just Valkyrie on bank not being banned, that could be huge. And I mean, we said we both like the smoke ban, and obviously they're bringing the Tachanka. Tachanka now can be used in a very similar fashion. So it seems like they've got strats for this and they know what they want to do and they've got a clear and concise plan in their head. And then having the Wamai and the Vigil to remain elusive and the Valkyrie to relay info, monstrous, especially if they do decide to go roam heavy, which we've, we've seen a couple of roamers, we've seen a couple of lurkers, but there hasn't really been a well-established hand-in-hand roam so far. And I think if that's what... Uh, Drexel are going to bring with controlled aggression and using the roam correctly and not just swanning off by themselves it could be huge and really catch RMU off guard and that's what they're going to hope to do and something as well about the roam game in particular is and I like to say this in multiple different games Crot is mobility is winnability especially on defense being able to make your way around the map keep those attackers on their toes at the end of the day, as a roamer, getting kills 
isn't as important as people might actually think it is. Being a nuisance, delaying time, and just staying alive and keeping the attackers thinking is every single bit as valuable. If you get kills as the roamer, it's just a bonus. Absolutely. And we touched on that in the last game, me and Novi, and th that time as a defender is your sixth man, essentially. And if the more you can stall out, the less time that you give the opposing team to set up their push, to take apart your defensive setup. And you can simply do that by just being a nuisance, taking some shots, then running away, relocating, especially with these fast operators. The fast three speeds, like your alibis, absolute chaos incarnate because you can just shoot a couple of shots, shift W, and you're you flanked and you can just lay a couple of shots while that team then have to send one or preferably two members to deal with you even if you don't get a frag you've denied 50 60 even more than a minute of them and actual manpower which then means that the rest of your team they can really hunker down and focus on the push that's coming in if they have sent two over to you and you've managed to use that fast elusive operator to go to the other side of the map and pull them away from their team potentially trying to get a fight more on your favor more on your grounds then they have to reconsolidate with their team for the push and that takes time again it does and time is key it's everything that you want to do on siege revolves around it you said it earlier i said it earlier it is essentially the floating player between both the teams at the start of the round time is on the attacker side but as you get deeper and deeper into the game that time it just starts to change its coat change its jersey as it goes to play for the defending side so it will have an impact just so you all are aware we're waiting for the players to get into the game and while we do that i think we should jump on over to a quick break to let the players get ready to go and when we come back we will have the next game ready for you and hello and welcome back on and we're back we got 10 players in the lobby we got two casters we got two observers and we got a hell of a producer keeping us up and running today Cro we're going to bank we're going to basement warden is back in and connected and we got our two lineups ready to go what are you looking forward to see here on the newly reworked bank well i hope no one picks warden on the opposing team because that could get very messy very quickly but rework makes things a little bit more interesting you kind of got to rework some of the old faithful strats but it's gonna be you know the end of the line and all the chips well if you don't win this map they're going to be stuck in that vault and the chips will well and truly be down as you will be going home you will be going home with your tail between your legs while your rivals go on to the next round and crot with this setup being in basement it is so important that you can delay the push through server and catch any of those attackers that decide to go through other directions the garage push isn't quite utilized as much as it used to be but it's something you definitely got to keep your eye on because most good teams crot they don't attack sites linear. Yes, they might go horizontally all on the one floor, but you need to pressure the defense on two or more different fronts in order to create those little avenues of entry. And that's something that RMU have to get going nice and early. Absolutely. And, you know, we've already seen an abundance of knock and the knock going through the garage is such a good push when it goes right. If you're droned in and there's no one holding it, but typically we do see someone sat a little bit further back with those long angles. Of course, we've got some defenders now with a little bit of zoom on the scope so they can do just that job. Of course, it used to be the maestro's job when he had that ACOG on that beautiful elder and, uh, that would be a power position, but we don't see that now, obviously. Bring back, oh, the old Alder. Oh, what what dreams were made of, Gibson? You're, you're bringing back memories, talking about Maestro here on bank and hot and cold. Well, let's see if one of these teams Whoa. can blow hot in this one. As Shrog pushes up in the garage. We spoke about the fact that we don't see that push very often. But with a little line of sight now, Shrug may be able to get that open engagement. The ace charges are out. And that's going to create the line of sight down and through red to gold. And that forces the Mira off the window. Crot, this is those little things that... Oh, no. 
just absolutely sent it through there. That's a, is, is that a Kobe, technically? But now meeting some resistance. Of course, the Salma Charge is coming out. Will reveal his location. He does have the zoom on his scope, though. So should have the advantage in the fight. And notice the crosses. But doesn't really get too much damage on the mirror there. Oh, but elsewhere, it's going to be the first trade. And that might incite the push. As they are already set up. They've got hatches open. And it looks like they're taking the ball by the horns here on bank. They are goalie gets the open and little move of the round gets that kill on the trob So it's now a 5v4 situation warden is working hard to stop themselves from getting flanked Around the map as goalie is just going to play on the hatch looking through it seeing if he can spot someone out monkey though pulls one back Gets a nice kill on to whiskey and here comes the gunfight looking in towards tellers warden He's in blue. He's got his back against the wall but one thing he does have with that AKM crot is 41 bullets. And hopefully he can just find the one he needs for the headshot as we jump into the solar engagement. Havana going up against the vigil here. And uh, not used to that, obviously, being from the same region. But Ace does go down. And so does Finca, who is out. But evening things up again. Really, there is the Habana as the drop comes in, and this is ballsy. Do they know where everyone is? Do they have the intel? The plant is going down, and Habana just needs a cover as comes in, and it's great cover, but the planter does get denied. The Chanka, though, coming in absolutely huge here. The plant is going back down, but do you have the time? It doesn't look like it. The Chanka, well, we said about the smoke being off the board, but that was phenomenal use and just shows why knowing the operator and adapting and taking out that comfort player of the smoke, which is so huge on bank. You take that away from a team that don't know how to use the chank properly, you have the upper hand. You're going to be in such good stead. And then when it comes to their basement holds, where we would normally see the smoke, they're going to be left a little bit stumped, Gibson. They are, but the chank has said, burn, baby, burn, basement inferno, as they go and get the first round in the favor of Drexel. Second round now, RMU, they find themselves one down, Croft, but on attack, being one round, one round down is not the worst situation to be in. No, not at all, and there's plenty more rounds. You're not going to stop, are you? You're not going to stop. No, never. But uh, obviously, the next time Chanka comes on, will that be relight my fire? Oh. Uh, your love is my only desire. But now Drexel setting up for top floor defense, go. getting the Malusi devices down. Of course, not only great left. to stunt the movement, but that audio cue is huge. And if you're holding a cheeky angle, then you can catch someone so off guard. And it looks like Trob is wanting to do just that as he opens up a cheeky little peek hole and then just checks the cameras to see if he can catch anyone sleeping and uh, a little bit too focused on their push it to the building. Yeah, just looking around, getting that early intel to work out where the attack is going to be coming from. On the other side of things, Warden droning in too. Having a little bit of a look at top square. A little look in to the little stock room to see if he can find out any weaknesses in this defense. But this is the important thing. you got to save those drones. Drone economy is such a big deal. But anyways, two minutes and 20 seconds gone. Trob gets the opening kill, Crot, and we got ourselves a 5v4. Absolutely, and that's a thinker. That's huge. That's nades off the board. And of course, that adrenaline surge can be useful if the time is right. But sometimes a lot of players really don't like it because, of course, you, you're used to your recoil, right? And then that alleviates it, and it makes it a bit of a nightmare where you overcompensate. But Shrug now creeping crawling trying to keep his audio cues to a bare minimum as he goes on a little bit of a low flank and of course the buck's gun is a massive and monkey finds that out first hand as he gets his head clean blown off his shoulders and now this just allows uh rmu to start setting up and getting that checklist done and opening things up yeah, well, they've got square control. They got the breach open. That is most of the tasks done and out of the way. One minute and 20 seconds, though, so there's still plenty of time for the attackers to start making more inroads into the site, but they need to find that next pick. They need the numerical advantage, so when they push in the site, the opportunity to plant and have some cover is a thing, but Spoopy gets the kill on the shrug. One minute now left on the clock as Warden 
dances around the corner. Goalie gets a big kill onto the Italian Mafia as they fall on down. And look at this. They got the intel on the Lamella. See as Ooh. well. Spray oh. comes out. But Traub gets out of there with his life intact. Yeah, I think that ACOG on there would have been a determining factor. Of course, too zoomed in to really see how tight to the wall you were through that barricade. And now that is going to allow them and Lucy just to live and fight another day and still be a thorn in the side. Ace, though, moving forward of Zetrick as he's just going to get some cameras out, trying to get them a little bit more intel and just figuring out how to take a fight as Pro Malusi. Oh, living to fight another day again. And it's Boopy that gets the next kill, and that is going to be on to the ace. Now, surging forward. Oh, just caught from both sides, and it falls apart very, very quickly. And a great, clean defense there. The initial pick did go to Drex, uh, against Drex. But they held strong. They believed in their defense. And they managed to clutch it out for 2-0. Going in it to the third round. Yeah, Drexel, they're going to be happy. But they need to win the next round to ensure that they win the defensive setup. You know that the third it's a cliche at this stage, but the third round is normally the one you see the attackers win. We're going to that tertiary site, the one that they don't play very often, but now we need to see who RMU really are. And with the attacker setup they have, Krat, there's... I'd say they're selling themselves a little bit short on the nade front. Yes, you can attack, attack a repick all the way through the prep phase, but with only two nades on Shrug, they don't have a lot of explosive utility. Yeah, and I think a lot of these teams, like, of course, there's so much defensive utility, your Jaeger, you or mine, that can stunt out the use of nades. And if you're not really bringing a setup with the flashes and that extra burner utility, so to speak, to get rid of them, then what's the point in bringing nades? But some teams just really don't understand how destructive they can be, not only for getting people out of their little corners and destroying utility but for those initial picks if it just bounces wrong or it's cooked to perfection that's a freebie gibson it is and you see a lot of up nades and little things like that being done because it's a free way to pick up a kill getting a kill without putting yourself in any danger now speaking about putting yourself in danger there's one rumor on the top floor and warden needs to drone to perfection to work it out they know that stock hatch is solid so the likelihood is there's going to be a player up here to disrupt and there's the soft ping they know that malusi is up there the engagement's getting ready to kick off but through the wall there's the shoulder popped on out but shrug just shrugs off those bullets and falls back into stock one minute delayed already and the longer they go crop without getting this kill the more of a great job that's been done on the room Absolutely. We talked about this in the last game. Me and Novi is it's just that time denial. And again, they're now having to put you manpower and time into dispatching of this Roma who now tail between his legs, going to get back to site, reconsolidate with his team. And that is a minute 20 gone. Yeah. And Shrug is just crouching down marble stairs. Now, this is the tense part of the game. Not one player has fallen on either side. So both teams avoiding a conflict so far a bit of a pacifist round by both of these teams whiskey pushes back onto square goalie gonna get the flank watch up and running again they have a sledge though they need to start doing some interior decoration crot to open up those vertical lines of sight Ooh. and there you go there's your first kill first one that come in at the hands oh instantly re-traded back though it's spoopy uses the off angle that Lines of sight created by the attackers. Those lines of sight work both ways as he picks one up. Whiskey on 50 HP as well as this push is being stunted out. And it's a bit of an awkward sight. They have the map control. But like you said, they're not using the tools. And now with that sledge off the side, they're not going to be able to use that hammer to open up any more windows without using breaching charges on IQ. Jackers. 
Oh, the Italian Mafia wins the gunfight that he had no right to do. He was being held by two players. He got the kill, and he sneaks back off into the darkness. 23 seconds gone. It's a 4v2 now as Traub is just being a heartthrob in this one with the amount of points he's picking Ooh. up. Gets another one onto Whiskey, and that'll be it. And I think they're going to need a hard drink after that one, Crop, because that's been a great first three maps for Drexel. Yeah, perfect rotation so far. And, you know, we talk about that 4-2 split, but of course, with only five rounds each half, 3-2 split is looking good. So they've done the work that they need to do. Of course, we expect normally the attackers to get two rounds now. But with the way that they're holding, the way that they're set up, and the controlled aggression and time denial, I don't think they're going to be able to really take apart this uh, Drexel's defense. Defenders, protect your bombs from no, they need to do something. They need to change something, crap, because they're doing a lot of good things. You know, they're taking drone zone map control. They're using their drones to perfection. In that little book of strats, they're doing everything right. They're just not winning their ones. And if you don't win your ones, crap, you're not going to win the game. Yeah, and if you're not winning your ones, go as a two. Don't give them the option to get freebies. Janka doing some uh, reconstructive work there with the big dinner plate as uh, Monkey is just going to secure the hatches down. And uh, it's going to be another basement hole. And there's a lot of investment being put upstairs. And rightly so, we saw how efficiently RMU got those hatches open. And of course, Ace, I've uh, not yet. Yeah, Ace was the flash in, so, in, in game one. He literally was in at the back of the garage and open it up with the Selmers before anyone even knew he was there. It was so quick, so efficient. His distraction then allowed for the hatches to be blown, a lot of vertical control, but again, stunted out at the end and Drexel just managed uh, to hold on. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of good things, but they need to turn that positivity and the results croc because the only score that matters is the one on the top drexel three robert morris university nil and they're looking to go to four once again warden properly droning in we've seen this from him every single time the big thing is croc they're they're like i said they're doing things right the aggression is just not there at times but this is what you like to see zetrick is pushing on up already he's opening up a lovely angle towards that open area door let's see if one of those defenders will peek their head through the gap a minute and 52 seconds left on the round we're almost at the halfway point crot but once again just no engagements yeah it's uh you made a good point there about RMU doing all of the things, they're doing the checklist, but then they're a little bit too reserved. They get things open and they kind of don't really know what to do with it after that. And uh, Whiskey now attracting some attention as he tries to pre-fire, but Monkey hears those shots and says, you know what, I'll give you some bullets to pre-fire, and it gets that out. So Drexel starting strong once again, and the IQ off the board, that's huge, especially when you're going to loom down over the site and... Uh, not going to be able to ping out or get rid of those gadgets anymore as Monkey does go down now as he tries to rotate back. So that is going to be an even trade somewhat. Yeah, a little bit of a delayed trade. It happens sometimes. Monkey swung once and got the kill. Swung twice, fell down from the tree and sees themselves in a 4v4 situation. Now Shrug back inside garage. He's opened up those lines of sight as the game, but he's being held down by the pre-fire. The next kill is vitally important in this one. 40 seconds on the clock. Shrug looking down towards gold, but let's see if he can strike gold by catching the head. But that drone's going to get wiped out. He knows there's someone there, but he's a little bit too late to the party. Crot doesn't get the kill, and Spiffy retreats in the safety. Oh, and no! he takes it again and gets the kill. The dreaded repeat from Spoopy there, but things get traded out and it's that pesky Tchanka. We saw what he did in round number one and he will not be relighting the fire as a triple call comes out from Zetrick as it goes to a 2v1 in favour of the attackers. The plant has been initiated and now they just have to hold, they have to cover this, but Scrob is there and that vector, the rate of fire is nasty and the C4 still in hand if they're too close. That could be GG's but no, gonna swing hard but oh, the server's just doing enough to keep the uh, alibi alive.
Uh, how about I even? Yeah. Sorry. Warden just protecting that section of the map. Looking into the stairs, Mira loses her head. And that is the first round the way of Robert Morris University. And that is exactly what they needed. If they can pull back this next round, Crot, all is not lost. They go 3-2 into the split. But for Drexel, if they can carry a 4-1 lead into the attack, in this 5-5 five, five format that we're playing, Crot, a 4-3 or three round lead is a massive deal. Yeah, it's going to put them in really good stead, especially if they show the same sort of regimented force that they're they're showing on defense. They they are working in unison. The comms seem to be a lot better. Everything's kind of been tweaked and fine tuned since their first game. And if they can bring that into attack, then that's going to be huge for them. But we see a lot of teams that really struggle on attack, like we're seeing here. RMU. They're doing the checklist. They're checking it twice. I'm not going to finish that. I'm not going to make that joke. They're going to find but... out who's naughty or nice? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hate myself. I'm sorry, chat. But they're just not moving after they've done that checklist. They're kind of a little bit apprehensive. And we talk about controlled aggression. But then there's also being too reserved. And you not making a decision, that's going to burn time. We, Me and Shields and Gibson, who uh, you casted... Rainbow Six League together, we had a phrase of doesn't matter if it's the right decision or the wrong decision, you just need to make one. And sometimes you think it might be a risky send or swing, but it's going to open things up and potentially catch someone off guard. Yeah, that's exactly what they want to do is catch them off guard. But Crop, you know what they say, you give Drexel a gun. They'll rob a bank. You give Drexel bank and they will rob everyone. And they've been robbing all the points so far in this one, bar one. And they're looking to add a... I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <bro>. Alright. <laughs> yeah, Barry. We're professionals. We've We're back. We're good. We're professionals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the early work going out as Warden's drone is going to get taken away from him and there's been a little bit of shift the castle being brought of course very prominent on this top floor site of course barricading off those windows making it a little bit harder and of course just meaning that more offensive utility and gadgets have to be used but it's going to be the zero that opens things up this time and RMU well it looks like they're starting to swing bank yeah, they're having a little bit of a look. Zedek has actually <laughs> repelled down the skylight, which is a big boy that play right there. That is <laughs> How does he impressed. sit down with balls that big? <laughs> we'll not... I, I'm going to move on. Moving on swiftly as Whiskey has a little look towards Marble. Once again, they've got a lot of map control. They've got the man advantage, but they need to keep on building, keep on growing their capital crot here on bank. Oh, God. And that is going to be another one off the board as the initial trade went their way, but it's not going that way anymore. Whiskey now down to about 50 HP. He does have a surge left, so he can use that, but he now has to recover and they need to reevaluate their push as it's all falling apart. And they don't have a hard, their primary hard breach. They have got the Habana, but of course. Oh, a two for one though. That might change the fate as now they pick apart Drexel, maybe getting a little overzealous, trying to take the fight, knowing they had the numbers advantage, but things have been flipped on their head. And now it's just to one lone mirror. Watching you gets one, but it's going to be an impactless frag as RMU, they swing back. They do. They pull it back and crowd goalie going seven and three and do you know why goalie is so good on bankrupt because he's because he's great hands. at saving oh god's <laughs> sake man <laughs> <sighs> oh this is so, so good I'm, I'm not sorry chat. obviously obviously with that commanding lead that drexel had i would have put all my stonks onto them originally but the fight is coming back as we now okay, reach our halfway point and the sides are switched now can we see that first three rounds of efficiency and regimented pushes that drexel had on their defenses or 
Is it going to go the other way? And are they just one of these teams that really don't know how to attack? Because we see it time and time again. And RMU, they started out that way. But in the last couple of rounds, they got it together. And they put themselves in, in what we would call the normal split, Gibson. Yeah, exactly. And it's a situation that RMU can build on now. They've got two rounds. They're on defense. All they got to do is win four out of five. Four out of five rounds, and you are going to the very next round. But if Drexel could just chip away at that, we might even see a little bit of overtime. But speaking about overtime, we're just over the prep phase and now we're into the game proper a little bit of creative site setup being done here that rotate into janitor the rotate into trump office as well they're just creating lots of places to move oh. and trob with the knock knocks on the window knocks on the door and takes out whiskey of course that knock coming in and just catching whiskey the jaeger off guard and then sending up a lovely little nade that is going to do some ship damage to the echo there but ah, there was another player up there and they didn't know about it obviously probably the echo in the elevator as now they sweep and drone themselves in down below now this is great work there we love to see a little bit of droning going on as sometimes it gets forgotten that you have to drone your teammates in the spearhead that power gun at the front of your push you need to drone them in you need to give them the intel you need to give them the edge in any fight because the defenders they're set up it's their house they're paying rent on it and you're coming into their home they've set things up and they know exactly where they want to pinch you exactly and now we've got all of the members of drexel they're in the side bank they want to withdraw some points out of rmu in this next <laughs> one the spray coming in from monkey with the lmg towards trump that long line of sight but no bullets landing crot but reloading with 80 still in the belt yeah it's uh, i mean it's better to chuck 150 at someone than 80 and he's gonna make these next one count as now they get two opening throb is gonna get another one and it is not looking good here for rmu as now the sharks that are drexel start to surround the site but the echo behind the deployable shield is gonna put up some resistance and it's just gonna be a hindrance but Thinker goes down and things might start to fall apart here if they're not careful we talked about that team is not being aggressive enough but sometimes there is being too aggressive as not goes on a little sneaky mission catches the echo but no he shuts her down immediately echo gets the kill it's a 4v3 now but the defenders they're weak the attackers they need to try trade their way to victory the diffuser is going down what? but monkey with the lmge gets the triple baby and drexel win round number six and they are just inching closer to closer to picking up that interest and moving on to the bank with a profit I'm, i need to stop two sets <laughs> on that round uh I'm glad that Monkey... I, I hope you got that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Glad that Monkey did reload because he did make those extra uh, 70 bullets really count in the end with that cheeky little triple. And uh, yeah, firmly putting them next to match point. They're nearly there. They can smell it. They can smell the next round. But RMU, what are they going to have to say? Are they going to be able to answer back? Well, that's it. They find themselves 4-2 down. Now, just a reminder, if you're watching from home, this isn't the 6-6 six, six format. It's the 5-5, five, five, so it's not as if we've just seen a normal game in this place. We've seen some very good plays. Like, Crop Drexel, I think, have been very good in every single round that they've played so far. RMU, if you were to split the game into three phases... In two out of three, they have been perfect. When they were on attack, their drone work was incredible. Their ability to take map control was so good, but they just couldn't clutch out the victories. On defense now, we need to see them put all three phases together to get these rounds. Because if Drexel win, if Drexel win this one, crop, they're on match point. And RMU will be at a serious risk of going out. So they, it is vitally important that they win this one. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's such a crucial round. Again, we've talked about pressure all day long. And getting onto match point and having that looming over you, that just adds so much pressure. And 
you know, it can make you play very differently, knowing, oh, if we lose this round, that's it, game over. And it can make you not peek things that you'd normally peek, take less risks, which of course then allow the attack to come smother you before you've even peeked to get the intel as to where they are. Exactly, and intel is key, Crot. It's wide siege. Oh, Shiro gets the kill onto Monkey, but it's why siege is so different to other FPS games. It Yes, getting the kills is important. You know, the mechanical aspect of the game is incredibly important. But there's so much depth. There's so many layers. You know, in the word of the great Shrek, there's layers to siege. It's like an onion. Absolutely. And, uh... <laughs> Does look like RMU are uh, trying to get the Drexel boys out of their swamp, and they are putting up some good resistance. But Drexel moving forward, doing the checklist. But there is a sneaky little roam on the stairs. He hears the footsteps oh, no. of Italian Mafia. Oh, no. He's going to get caught sleeping. Oh my god. And it's the MH. <laughs> no way. Buck getting taken down by a shotgun from a Jaeger. Oh, the irony. Oh, bootless. Laying out some pain. Trob gets one. Goalie pulls one back. As it is a two versus two. Goalie playing inside the vault. Zedek is roaming on the top floor. So in reality, it's a 2v1 down on site. If they can capitalize on it. Zedek, of course, using that new Irish operator. Just want to throw a shout out to the, you know, there's... There might be someone Irish in here if you see him, let us know. But anyways, Goalie having a little look. They've found Bomb A. They're pushing on in. They're doing their drone work crop, but they need to stop stalling. They need to get jiggy with it and start getting some leeway on the site. <laughs> oh my god. They do, but they are doing their due diligence and just trying to track down those two elusive defenders. Of course, we can probably put together that the mirror is going to be residing next to one of my mirrors. But, of course, Zedric, a little bit unknown factor here. But the drones are going to find their prey, but with 24 seconds, like you said, something's got to give. As now we see the utility dump come out and the drop come through. And it's just going to be spam and the Vector's rate of fire is not quick enough to win that one out. Zedric just... Holding the angle, but the plan is going down, and it's a covering fire there. Just a cheeky little peek. Oh, oh and the air jab, fantastic plan down, and now we are in a post plant situation. Yeah, Zedek now has to try pushing and needs to find the luck of the Irish pushing on in. And look at that, the flank going up to the hatch as well, Crot. This is virtually impossible for Zedek to now win as Drexel have just set themselves up on this post plant situation absolutely perfectly you need to get the frags you need to get the kills the shots come on out and zedek has realized this is unwinnable and spoopy gets the kill attackers win round seven and all of a sudden drexel university find themselves on match point valiant effort there coming out but it's not enough and now as you said match point ladies and gents and this is is huge. Can Drexel hold their nerve and put together another successful push? Or are RMU going to lap up that pressure and lock it down like Fort Knox? Ooh, this is a big, big round for Drexel now. Win this and you're through to the next round where you will face Kutztown, the actual host of this tournament in the next stage of the lower bracket. Both of these teams have tasted defeat so far in this tournament. But Krat, on the bright side, that means that one of these teams is guaranteed to taste victory in this one. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's coming down to the wire in, in the sense that Again, RMU, they did they do so many things right, but it's just simple little mistakes that are allowing Drexel to get that opener, to gain that ground, to get that map control. And it's that it's that domino effect, Gibson. When one thing falls, everything else crashes down around it, and that's not gonna help the cause as uh Zedric disappears from the lobby. Oh god. Oh god, poor... And it's it's that Homer I'm... Simpsons dipping back into the hedge meme. Oh, you know what, no. match point. I'm out. Yeah, I think there's a very good chance this will be a re-host, especially considering the fact this is a match. Think, I don't think it was... It, was it, it happened face. before the drone... Oh, I don't know. It was look, literally that's... As, as the action phase started. 
Yeah, well, look, as casters, it's uh, up to the admins to decide, so we can just speculate, so we'll keep on casting while all the activity moves on. Mikey pushing right up on the site. They've already got the numerical advantage, and Monkey, oh, no, he's pushed on Ooh. and spit. Gets the kill on the show because they trade each other out. It's a 4v3. Whiskey gets one. It's a 3v3. And Warden was very close to falling all the way down. But he goes down anyway. As it is now a 3v2 on the site. Mira's in position. And Warden is gone. Crot the... This is the perfect opportunity now for Drexel to withdraw from the bank and take the win. Absolutely. But, again, Whiskey... With the Alder, it go brr, and a lot of bullets in it, and it is a monster. And if you can catch these attackers sleeping, or oh, the angle's being open, the C4 goes up, but it's just a little bit too delayed. Great thought, but just a little bit too slow on the execution there. But now, the attacker holding the angle. Oh, punished again, but good return. The shot's coming down. It's now not even 50 HP combined for these two defenders, and it's looking like... It is not going to go the way they want, and it is going to be Drexel withdrawing all of the points from this cash cow. Yeah, but Crot, the, you know, whiskey, much like the money that I get all the time, it's not, is not alone. He's got a little bit of a friend inside. I need to stop these bones. I'm going to get sacked, but we keep on going. Spray comes out from Mira. The two of them are pushing it, and it's 3v2, but great spray by Goalie as he gets one down. Tries to get the other, runs out of our shotgun. 1v1, but Spiffy wins the round, and Drexel take the game. They move on to the next round, and Robert Morris University, thank you for coming. Thanks for the great plays. But we are going to have to say good night and goodbye to you. Yeah, so it looks like a couple of the players are confused. We will need to look back at the clip and see if we are going to play another round. But I'm like 99% sure that it was just outside of the prep phase. Also, we do have a, a little message as well for one of the players in a winning team of Troll, it's his birthday today, so happy birthday, my man. And I hope that winning that game and potentially getting yourself through to the next round was the icing on the cake. Yeah, this is the point now where we get told that it's not actually his birthday and we've just been trolled. <laughs> but, uh, Absolutely we'll... looking like idiots. We'll keep on moving, though, Crot. That brings us to the next stage of the loser's bracket, which I'm sure we'll be ready to view pretty soon. But Kutztown are going to take on... Drexel, who are in great form after that one. The the winner of that game then takes on the loser of the winner's bracket between Penn State and UMBC. So it's a very tough set of fixtures. The cream has risen to the top. Yes, I I got I got you. Bracket, and, bracket yeah. It's uh it's one of those, like, yes, you've just won your loser's bracket game. But it doesn't get any easier. Every team that you now face, they've won games. They're feeling themselves and they are looking towards that prize and the glory. Yeah, they are. Drexel say thank you very much as they move into game number eight against the hosts. And Crop, one thing I want to say before we jump into the interviews is, you know, Tom has spoken to us quite a, quite a bit from Kutstown. We saw his interview too. Comes across as such a nice and genuine guy but drexel are gonna have to watch out for him because he is a bit of a bite to him too when he's in game absolutely Reese. he was a little bit quiet in the first game and then all of a sudden he just uh, we we talked we said different beasts during that game but he was a monster he came out and he mm -hmm. fragged out of his mind maybe with the teven problems at the start of the competition somewhat resolved apart from the pc crashes He's been able to focus on his fragging and focus on his game without the initial teeth and problems. And again, it just seemed like they had had themselves a little chat, a little pep talk, and they came out swinging, Gibson. Mm -hmm, they did, but Crot, we're just getting word from the production team that we are going to re-host the last round. So we're going to go back to back. Okay. So I think with that, we jump to a quick break. And when we come back, we'll replay the round that we just saw.
Welcome back, ladies and gents, and we are straight into the action as we are going to the Rehos. Now, Drexel, can they recreate that? Can they clutch it out? Or are RMU going to swing back? Are they going to take this away? And it would be an upset if they managed to come back from here, Gibson. Well, do Drexel feel like they owe RMU and I owe you after that last round that was re-hosted? Having a little bit of a crown. Zedek going for the same setup. They've got the mirror. They've got the thorn. And of course, Crop, they have to use the same setup because once the round starts and you the rehost, every player has to take the same operator. So we're knowing what we're expecting to see. Absolutely. And it means that they just have to follow out the execution of the push exactly the same. But, of course, the player exiting, I think, incited a little bit of a, a rush. Because, was it a talent mafia that was just in on site mm -hmm. instantaneously? As soon as they saw that, they knew that they had the numbers game and that they would kind of all be a little bit confused. And if it does get played out and the rehost never came in, then they did exactly the right thing. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. So we are replaying that round. So Drexel are going to have to wait a little bit longer. But we spoke about this during the break, Crot. If RMU come back now and actually win this game, this could be the turning point because they thought they had lost. You know, they were in that situation. But now it is the time for those players to step on up monkey roaming around the top floor they're doing their roam clear they're doing their jobs mira takes a little bit of damage crot and every single shot that you oh no look at this they've spotted out the roman jaeger warden does he have the shotgun or does he have the ar crot well we're just going to find out pretty soon ar oh it's not good italian mafia though with that shotty obviously a great attachment Somewhat nerve. Oh, the free fire comes through, but he's just going to miss it, which is going to incite the swing. But neither of them rewarded with the damage, but caught in a reload. The Jaeger goes down and bites the dust in itself. One, two in quick succession as RMU on the back end now, and it is really all falling apart. And uh, it doesn't look like they're changing their fortunes in this last rehost play. Yeah, the gun went da da da, and another one bites the dust as Boostless oh. gets two more. 5v1. They're making no mistakes now, as that will be that. And just as we've already said before, Drex will move on to the next round. Absolutely. And I'm sure it's going to be a little bit bittersweet. But again, it just shows that they found an opening, they got in there, and they picked them apart the same way, regardless if they have the full five stack or not. And this is exactly what they need to do going forward. They need to remain that disciplined, that regimented. And if you know your push and you know every step of your push, on the first line, the player dipped out. That's the mm -hmm. immediate opener. They full sent it. And it was the right thing to do. As I said, if that never got re-hosted and they kind of sat back, didn't move, and it went in RMU's favour... They'd be kicking themselves. They would be absolutely kicking themselves. And they played it right, which is what well, RMU, they kind of sat back and they just allowed for that next pick to come in and the rush to come in and be punished for it. But this time they sat up, they tried to put up some resistance, but mm -hmm. just too good. And it's, it's looking like, I don't know what's happened to these teams in the lower brackets. I don't know if they were saving strats in their first game just to potentially get around the big boy. But they look like different beasts. Slow starters, maybe, Crot. They've come into form at the right time, and we're going to see two of those teams coming up next. But before that, we got an interview to do. But before that, we are going to jump into a quick break. When we come back, I believe it'll be myself and Novi. But don't, hey, you don't have to wait very long because Crot will be back just after that. So we'll see you soon. Hello, Novi. We're back. So after that amazing intro by Novi, which was, I can assure you, the best intro that has ever been given I can't, for a I game can't of Rainbow Six Siege. I can't believe you so missed out on that. It was so good. I had good. to grab tissues. I was crying. It was... Yeah, none of the audience heard it. It was just, it was a disaster. It was, that was, look, my glasses have come off. I've gone red in the face because of how emotional and trying mm -hmm. that introduction was. But mm -hmm. in all honesty, what I was really trying to say was 
what happened in the last game? You were here for it. I wasn't. What? How did it f- go down? Because I was watching, and it seemed like maybe a potential sort of, I would argue, an upset occurred in that lower bracket. Well, what happened was Drexel went to the bank and they withdrew a massive Dob Novi. I love the mug, by the way. I love the hat. I'm loving it. But yeah, Drexel were very good. It was a top performance from start to finish. And I think the difference between them and you know the game that we saw from them previously was they were able to actually execute Novi. They committed the numbers. They got the and that gave them the win. But we're going into the winner's bracket now, Novi. We got UMBC against Penn State. This is a massive game between two behemoths. And the best thing about it is, really, the loser isn't out. We're still in the winner's bracket. Two big teams facing off. Penn State would definitely be classed as the favorites in this matchup. They are top 25 in the country. That is, of course, the United States of America. I will not displease the audience by trying to do a American accent, which I'm sure will be offensive to somebody because it will be awful. But UMBC is also no slouches either. They're not necessarily in the Premier, the Premier League, the top of the top. They are one of the top teams within the Open League. And they had quite a deep run into playoffs and almost made it through. So this is sort of retribution for UMBC, I would argue. And for Penn State, this is proving grounds of, you know, a team that is trying to punch their way up. This is their opportunity to punch them back down. And we're getting our sixth, wait, how many games are we on now? Sixth unique map of the day. We had, we started with Cafe. Then we went to, oh, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember what, what have we done. We've had cafe. I know we've had villa. That was with Croft. We've had Sky. We had, we've had Bank. We, yep. Yeah. Uh, we've had Oregon. Oregon. We've now got Club. Yeah, we're getting Ooh, the full making... line of and theme, and theme, and, and theme. Yeah. We had theme as well. So what? What are we? What are we missing? We're like Thanos at the moment. We're collecting maps. What have we not had? We haven't had border. Shally. Um, and Chalet, other two, which is surprising. Okay, so interesting for because the American viewership over in over in Europe actually. So I heard from uh, Sticular that Villa is one of like the main like maps that always gets picked, always gets played. Over in the UK, we said that we had Oregon and Clubhouse, as we're seeing today. But the other map, which has recently come in, so much more is Chalet. Uh, so many mm-hmm. teams are picking this up as a default map to play because it's slightly, uh, or it has been attacker favored at the highest level. Um, it's very dynamic. So many different ways you can um, sort of approach that map. So it's very interesting. A, interesting that we haven't had a repeat map, but also extra interesting that Chalet is one of the leftover maps we are yet to have yet. Exactly. And that's surprising. And. We might see it later when we get into the final, but I'm interested to see how the NA tech on Clubhouse is because, you know, we always say sometimes you don't want to take the boys to the club or you could call it dub house because we get so many good memories. And look at this Novi wasting absolutely no time and Maverick tricking into CCTV, but that's not the site. You got to make your way all the way over to gym bedroom if you want to make those gains and get that win in the first round of the map. Yeah, it seems a little bit questionable just because I'd rather see the Maverick have spawned on the Jacuzzi side, open up that wall, and then you can put the Thermite on the CCTV because this is just going to... Oh, there we go. They're opting for the Thermite gadget instead. Maybe not. Is there a Mute Jammer maybe behind it? Maybe that's why and they have, they're have they struggling to clear it. This seems a little bit of a botched job by Penn State, not quite deciding what they want to do. But they aren't seeing anyone peeking it. Oh, Jaws, a nice long angle all the way through, but it doesn't quite connect to the head of the Jaeger in KZ. Certainly a player to watch. He's a highlight on defensive side. Joe as well, who's already chimed in with the first kill. Mr. Sinister will be replying for that one-on-one. It's a four to four. And half of the round has gone, Gibson. And yet, Penn State don't look yet in a position to start their execute. 
Yeah, they've just about got in the building, Novi. They've wasted a lot of time getting that wall open. Like you said, it was a bit of a botched job. Joe, you spoke about him. He's got his tally open already. One kill. But they need to clear the rest of the team. And Buck Ding gets another kill for himself as Mild manages to get on in to into, into cash looking through that gap in towards Jim but they need another pick it's a 4v3 the defenders are in a great spot now and it's been made even better by the fact that Buckting and M Tackle get two players down and all we have left is Mr. Sinister and Dovey Joe just cleans them up that was Okay, interesting. Very clean. It certainly looked like Penn State had, I don't want to say issues on their attack, but they certainly looked weaker in terms of the execute, which is understandable. But we saw that earlier into, uh, into the day. So just curious to see even on this when they had the time, how it sort of fell apart from them. I would have expected something a little bit more coordinated. Uh, I don't know. I'm underwhelmed. I, I think that that's my reaction. I don't have much to say. I'm just underwhelmed because I really thought that Penn State would have come out the gate swinging, you know, for the fences. And instead, UMBC just smacked them back down. Well, you know the way, Novi, sometimes you have a round or you have a game. It even happens us as casters. We're just Murphy's Law. Anything that could go wrong does go wrong. For Penn State there, the minute that they botched the breach into CCTV... It just kind of snowballed even worse from there. And you get the feeling that had they have just gone done that cleanly first time around, maybe things would have been different. Yeah, I think that's going to be the case. They just wasted time and should have been making moves on the other side of the map. Oh, oh, oh okay. I have not seen that before. Uh, the extra claw inside the pot. I wonder if you could put it sideways. Maybe you could have done. They've decided to put it um, vertically, but that's really, really cool. I wonder if that gets shot out um, and if we see any action around that. Opting still for the mute as well. So big denial across the board. I'm not sure how they're going to manage dirt. Usually you would send the smoke down, reinforce the walls, put the deployable shield up, and then they essentially solo hold off dirt. The one thing I am noticing which is a bit different is the Wamai has impact, but there are no other impacts. Usually for basement, you would have, to, I'm trying to think, maybe an alibi, something like that, something which can run impacts. Maestro actually is quite often used, yeah. actually, uh, because you put a evil eye in usually on the uh, armory wall and then on... Yeah. Blue Jenny, you'd you put it somewhere around there, so you'd you'd have both or main stairs as well as the other one, um, and then you use the impacts to deny the breach, but that's not going to be the case. I guess it's because they've got the Kaid as well, so that's it's that extra protection for it. Um, uh, that's usually in response if Kaid is banned, so it, it, it's probably more likely. That, I like I've gone down this whole train of thought, but actually I've solved it myself. That's the mystery. Kaid is it, <laughs> isn't banned. Uh, that's that's why. But it's, it, it's still if you remove that Electra Claw, um, you still got to get the explosion off of whatever you're going to do. I don't quite like the fact that the Electra Claw is on here anyway, because oh my god, he hasn't noticed. They've got th no. Uh, they've got the Ace. Why have they got the Ace? Hmm, why would you not bring thermite? Because you could put the thermite on the floor next to it, right? And just blow it up. You could. Right? And I think the issue that they have now, though, is they've already opened up the floor, Novi, so it's going to be very obvious where they place that thermite. But Ace is going to start trying to do a little bit of work himself, and they get that open. UFO makes his way down, but Penn State have wasted a lot of time already. But they haven't got a single pick to prove. But Joe doing a little bit of damage. Back the other way with that SMG 11. We know how dangerous a player he can be. But UFO, he's playing on the stairs. He needs to try to get a pick. Try anything, really, to get down to the bottom of main. And timing will allow him to move up to the next spot. But Novi, you move down those stairs. You look down the corridor, and you see a shield. And that just, it's like the mirror effect. It's like, oh, no, can I push this now? He's a frag grenade. He can throw it down. 
I mean, there, there might be a magnet, but it should have come out earlier. This is taking too long. Might have almost killed him. Ran straight into massive. Gets rinsed. Seven seconds remain, and Penn State is coming up absolutely short at this point. Mr. Sinister goes down for planting. That should be the round just like that. Defenders win it. UMBC moved to 2-0. A commanding victory at the I was expecting this game to be close, or at least the rounds to look close. At the moment, Penn State looks a little bit lost on the attack. Yeah, I think US, um, or sorry, UMBC, they don't look like they're even, even trying to win those two rounds. They've nearly been gifted it because of the, you know, pa I, I want to say pacificity, but it's not a word, but the passiveness of Penn State is really biting them. They're not getting any map control. They're not aggressing into the building until pretty late. And, you know, UMBC, sometimes as a defender, Novi, you kind of get a little bit confused when nothing's happening. You're like, should we roam? Should we stick? Like, nothing's really happening. So, fair play to them for just sticking to their tasks and winning the two rounds. But this is the round now that you feel like they have to win. And in times gone past, CCTV cash, it actually wasn't that easy to get this wall open. But you kind of feel like getting that wall open now is, is pretty easy. And that's why we're seeing it be used as the third site. Yeah, at some point, that wall is just going to go down. Um, and there's nothing you can kind of do about that. So, could do the electric claw from underneath. That's always an option, just to buy a little more time. I'm not going to... I'm not quite sure if the Kaid's going to try and do anything like that. Massive has been a bit cheeky, I want to say. The electric claw, the electric claw in the pot, pot took Penn State a little too long to find out and remove. Um... But, all things considered, the UMBC, they've got to understand that that wall is eventually going to go down, especially with Maverick in play because Mav is unbanned, because the Hibana was banned instead. So what you have to do is what happens after that gets cleared. How do you deal with the fact that you can't just run across site anymore? So that's going to rely on rafters control and garage, as well as cash room control and construction. Red stairs as well is kind of... Yeah, sort of implied within that because there should be the rotation through as well but they need to be really really careful if Penn State once they get this open decide to pivot their attack from construction and then pincer from both sides that's when things are going to get really really rough or they could try and push for the garage but it doesn't look like they're going to do that yeah well Buck's job and garage is the player's life you stay there for the whole round, you stay until you die. And now his position's been given away. They're trying to get that bottom garage open to put some pressure in, but they're not able to do it. They've got a lot of nades, no way. They've got four nades, two smokes, three flashes, and I haven't seen a single bit of secondary utility being thrown yet. We're at the halfway point of the round, and Maverick is getting back to work to get that open. But, oh no, oh. Never mind, I thought for a second we had a little bit of a bug. But Maverick finally gets bottom garage open. But Novi, once again, it's a very slow attack from Penn State. Yeah, and this is very different from when we saw them earlier in the day. This feels like a very hesitant side. Maybe they just respect UMBC a bit more than their previous opponents. Maybe it's a case that they didn't quite expect UMBC to play to this level. They underestimated them and now they're a little bit worried. I'm not too sure. Could be tiredness as well, because of course these guys have been uh, in person at this land for quite a few hours now as well. So that's going to play into that factor. But Penn State slowly making their way through. I don't think Raft is quite clear. They're still somewhat on the top of it. Mr. Sinister gets thrown down by Buckting, who's on top of those rafters. Gets two for the money with the MP5. Now the Twitch in the garage Buckton gets oh my god gets a third is looking for the fourth as well no it's not gonna happen Jaws slays him but it's a little too late the triple kill has already come out and that is Jaws snapping shut that one with 10 seconds remaining Penn State has just run out of time run out of kills run out of bodies to throw at the problem Penn State's gonna go down 3-0 in the upper bracket final and you spoke about a bit of whiffception earlier. We had two whiff, two furious that time inside Garage Novi. As a, I think both players wasted a full mag on each other without a kill being picked up.
Man, this is um <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't I was not expecting this. I thought this would be the closest game we'd have all day. But it's well, just look. it's just not. It's 3 0. You know, it's not the end of the world. Yes, it's first to six. UM, UMBC find themselves on the way already, but Clubhouse, it's a map that defender used to be more ball. defender favored. You can argue now that maybe it's swung a little bit more, especially with the attacker repick and the prep phase, but I'm surprised we're not seeing as much of the attacker repick in the first round as maybe we would have expected. Jackal's going to switch on over to Sledge and. To me, that's a good move. If you're not getting into the building early enough, then Jackal's almost a wasted pick. We're going back to Jim Bedroom. And the issue that they had the first time, Novi, was they got stalled out trying to take CCTV cash. So if you're the IGL for Penn State, is this the point where you say, right, we're going to go Jacuzzi this time around and try attack from a different side? I think they should, absolutely. Um, this is not we're expecting and they need to just switch things up start throwing things at the wall strategically and seeing what sticks because like we've echoed all the way through this broadcast there's five rounds in a half not six and it sounds small just removing that one round but that's pretty big already with just three rounds umbc has won the half now it's a case of how much they're going to win it by and i just find it so interesting because clubhouses to me, like Oregon, it's the litmus test for, for how good a team is, because this is where everyone understands how to play this map. The, these sites have been attacked thousands of times in, in pro play, in comp. It is one of the most played maps, or the most played map in the entire in the entire map pool. So, fundamentally, that's where your fundamentals should show up the most, and if they're weak, that's where you're going to get punished the most. At the moment, Penn State is struggling fundamentally on this map i'm not quite sure why yet i don't know if it's a lack of droning i think it's what you highlighted i believe they're just going too slow aren't they they're just not moving quick enough it's like they're doubting their decision making yeah and they're not even getting rid of the default drones novi this is you know it's one of the things kz is just kind of saying you know there's a guy right there it's a minute and a half under the round there hasn't been a single bullet well I was, <laughs> there we go well ufo gets one but joe refrags one out the other way onto mi onto mild and ufo trying to maybe get another kill he knows there's a player below the diffuser is down and can we get Penn State to make a little bit more of an inroad? They're wasting so much time, though. They're still only inside cash, and we're a minute left inside the round. It's just a little bit too slow, a little bit too late, and maybe they're the team Novi that have been traveling since 2 a.m., you know, or, you know, 2 a.m. last night, because this is not the same Penn State we saw earlier today. Yeah, it feels like they've been caught sleeping just a little bit, but Destroy is going to be the one to make them move forward brute force their way into a more positive scenario they now have the man advantage problem is there's plenty of utility like you said still on the table two more toxic canisters with 30 seconds left and if the smoke isn't forced to bloom them yet they could be in a very troublesome situation because currently one of their players i believe is the finker is trapped on the other side miss sinister right wow, behind a soft located. wall there's a player just to his left get shot down that's disastrous now penn state it's all on ufo on the think of the entry with the lmg needs to spray on down it's not gonna be enough gonna try and res themselves but no gets knifed taken out of the round penn state fall down four to zero the top 25 team in the country is falling to the university of maryland baltimore county yeah and we speak about confidence being a big thing i don't know how much of the joe interviews that you heard but I think it's safe to say confidence is not something that he is lacking right now. And we spoke earlier today, I think it was me and you that had the conversation about forgetting about who the opposition is. You know, don't show respect yeah. to them. Play your game and think that you can yeah, beat anybody. Be well, really? That's what UMBC are doing. You know, they're playing this as if they were playing a casual game and they're showing no respect to Penn State at all. And it's paying up. it's coming up trumps for them. And the less respect they show, 
the 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 better the more frustrated Penn State's gonna get and the better the scenario is for UMBC. This is kinda like Penn State is bleeding out right now and they need to stem the bleeding. They need to cauterize the wound. Because if they don't, if they lose one more round, UMBC's on that point. Which is insane. Like no disrespect to UMBC, but Penn State was heralded as they're probably going to get to the finals. They're probably the strongest team. They're the most likely to win by far because they're top 25. And UMBC are, what, two rounds away from knocking them down to lower bracket? Is there an element here maybe of the fact that this is still the winner's bracket and the loser will get live to fight on another day in the next round? Do you think maybe there could be some strat saving? Maybe they could be trying to lull UMBC into a false sense of security? I just don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that we'll find out if Penn State do lose. You know, maybe they turn up again in that loser's bracket. But we're in the start of the round right now. Once again, 40 seconds have gone by. They've got absolutely zero map control whatsoever. They're doing a lot of drone work. But US, UMBC, they haven't really been roaming. You know, so they're wasting a minute and a half looking for a player that's just not there. <laughs> I was about to say, I was like, what are you on? But you're right. <laughs> it's the, they're, they're all on site. There's this whole trying to search the building, but no one's home. Just take the map control. And this is the sort of s slow pace that this Penn State is showing on their attack is a worrying sign they need to start applying pressure a little sooner because like you said if there was roamers you'd understand being in this position right now if there were roamers to deal with first completely acceptable makes sense and now we're seeing the impact trick just from the wamai denying that first selma charge the second one goes oh. off as well and then there's only oh, one I'm left i don't can the ace even open this up nope i don't think can Having to use this hard breach from the buck just to open up the hatch. Two Selma charges wasted. you got to wonder if this was a Thermite, if this was baited out a little bit more. Maybe they'd be in a more advantageous position. That's exactly why you impact trick. It is so, so strong on this side. It is, and that's where, you know, the likes of the buck and everything can have an impact as they can create those long lines of sight that make impact tricking very difficult. But we're 45 seconds left on the round, and now we're finally starting to see Penn State moving a little bit up. Those were my discs causing absolute havoc as they try to get rid of the shield, and Sinister drops the hatch. The executor's going down, the diffuser 75%, 50%, Mild gets a kill, and the diffuser is going to go down. Penn State have come to life, but can KZ takes the life of one member, but UFO trades the fact. 3v2, Penn State trying to pull this one back. Buckting in the 1v3, and he is surely not going to be able to clutch this one out, but he's being given freebies. He's being given 1v1s. Let's see if he's able to maybe long arm this diffuser. He picks up another kill to pad the stats. He's going to bait out that diffuser. Three seconds, waits for the kill. There it comes. Jaws wins the round and Novi. I am sure right now that Penn State, regardless of what happens in this rest of the map or this game, they're going to be happy that they can't get sweet swept now. They got one round at least. It's the biggest hurdle to start the game is to get that first round on the board and start to get the ball rolling. They finally managed to do that. But is it too little, too late? That's my that's my concern, Gibson, because UMBC, the objective doesn't change. They still need to win two rounds. Penn State need to win five. They need to go mm -hmm. flawless on their defensive side if they want to win this game in regulation time without going to overtime. And that is, a, even on Clubhouse, which is defender side, but at least in the current meta, is very, very difficult. We are going to see CCTV cache as the first site, the primary site being picked, and also potential bandit tricking. This is a bit of an old school play, backed up with the Kaid as well, with the Aruni as well, and the Sharia gates, with the Wumai Jaeger, a lot of anti utility. It is a very successful combination, but I'm missing something big from the attacking side right now. There is no mute on their side, on, on the side of Penn State. Switch mm -hmm. Zophir to Floris. Oh, I like it. 
I like it, but we're not going to see it. The round has started, but they do have six nades, two smokes, and they're going to be able to make a lot of noise, a lot of bangs, a lot of booms in their effort to clear out rafters. Getting rid of rafters now, that player destroyer is probably one of the most important things that you need to do on attack in this map. Joe now, he's going to maybe show us how he... Oh, I thought he DC'd for a second there in the Maverick trick, but he's back <laughs> underway. He's going to get the top half done now. He's going to get the bottom half done. And look, he's almost trying to bait the C4 a little bit there, isn't he? The way he's Maverick tricking this one too. Yep. Trying to bait it out. Because if you can waste that utility it remove, uh, without it hitting anyone, it just removes that stress. And then they can sort of start mounting on the repels. It's just a little bit safer for the attackers, but unable to bait it out. Mr. Sinister is getting tagged from somewhere. Destroyer's going to take the first. That's the Cade picking up the first one. You can see a bit of mm -hmm. BM thrown in all chat as well. <laughs> I like to see it. I like to see it. I was missing. Everyone was being too polite in the interviews until Joe came along and then he started talking smack and it was beautiful. Yeah, throwing out the smack like a, you know, a UFC fighter. <laughs> he said that they haven't even been tested yet on the way to this final. And they find themselves now in a 4v4 situation. Look at this though, Buck Ding. They're pushing up. You can't accuse them of being passive on attack as they're already taking a lot of map control. They're opening up that little hole that they can throw some nades from to get rid of that utility as well. Let's see. Oh, Jaws swings and takes out KZ. And now all of a sudden, UMBC find themselves a 4-3 down. Penn State starting to gather some momentum, peeking in towards the top of those stairs. But with 50 seconds left on the clock, if UMBC can get a pick, suddenly things swing back in their favor, Novi. Penn State still need to actually get in on the site. You can see they were looking into Master Bedroom. They're worried about the flank from behind, which means they don't have the information or the drones. There we go. UMBC, oh though, gosh. jumping straight in. <laughs> M Tackle just making his way through. Bugged in, going to stick the plant as well. And it's all on UFO. Oh, my Lord. Penn State was... Oh, wait, no. Massive has gone down. It's all up to Bugged in. 20 seconds left on the clock. UFO's just going to run in. Oh, gets the play. Who's down? Now it's left in a one versus one. Bugged in has everything to do. How have they left the three versus one turn into this situation? UFO hasn't got the sound cue the plant has gone down Bugdin's managed to switch out and now the timer has switched around no oh way. through the no wall way. the yellow pings come through that's huge oh, oh no my lord penn state this is not okay a triple kill for ufo hats off but umbc royally messed that up what did I just see? And I thought that UFO made a massive mistake by letting the diffuser go down, but that's what happens whenever a camera is left. The yellow pings came out, and that was as free a wall back as you're ever going to get. And, you know, a little bit of BM uh, back the other way as well, with UFO having a little bit of, look, of a look at the downed sledge. But you talk about momentum breakers, right? If you're UMBC, you've lost two rounds in a row now, and the way that you lost the last round is a huge throw. If Penn State win this next round, surely you have to say momentum is fully behind them then. Uh, yeah, 100%. 100%. Not like I, not even a question at this point, right? Mm -hmm. They just, it's so not dominant, but soul crushing because that was a three verse one plant should have been stuck and they gave separate one verse ones and those CERN checklists which were sort of bypassed to get the ball rolling and now not only does that damage UMBC's confidence but it's also what does it do to Penn State like we've been kind of ragging on them but not because we think they're bad because we don't think they're playing to the potential that we know they can so we know that they can be better if you anger them, if you irritate them, if you give them a foothold, they're going to use that to catapult themselves forward. That's what really good teams do. Has UMBC just given them not just a way back into that round, but a way back into the game in general? Well, 
That's what we are going to find out. We're going to that tertiary site to see if you um, are sports. Sorry, we're going back to basement. What am I talking about, tertiary? It's late, guys. It's it's just after midnight here in the EU where myself and Novi are currently casting from. But with 20 seconds, 2 minutes and 20 seconds left on the clock, the drone work is being done. They're trying to see if there's any sort of pressure on the Rome game whatsoever. And... You know, what I like about this is, Novi, the fact that Joe is checking every single nook and cranny. He is not going to miss throwing anybody. No, he doesn't want to be the reason one of his teammates gets picked off or what have you. He's making sure every single bit of information is checked, triple checked, double checked. You can also see... Interestingly enough, from Penn State, they've got a player who's on cams. It's UFO right now on the Maestro, checking to see on those defaults if any defaults gets cleared, uh, as well as who's droning where, because generally you don't want to just drone ahead without anyone backing up that drone, because the longer the lag between the player behind the drone, the less reliable that information becomes, and it actually starts becoming more dangerous, because it becomes a guessing game. The defender who knows that they've been drowned out can then sort of juke you, play in a different position, play an off angle, and it can become very, very dicey. So UMBC need to be on it with their droning, but interesting response from Penn State to counter that at the same time. They've had to come off, but they've got double, triple impact. Two have already gone from the Malusi. Buckdean takes a huge amount of damage. That's the Nitro Cell gone from Mr. Sinister. But the way you stop these impacts, Gibson, is you open up the floor and you start spraying down, stopping them from getting so close. You gotta do that. You gotta get some vertical pressure in. And Joe gets the first kill, but Destroyer trades it back. Gets the double for himself now, too. It's a very linear push now at the end of the round as suddenly... It's two men up for UMBC. Four members left. Buck is just going to breach and push. He spots out K or Maestro. Gets the kill on the Maestro. And that diffuser is being planted. If they're able to get a knock here. But they're or kill here. They're not going as Destroyer. Kills Buckting. Diffuser goes down. And just like that, new MBC lose three rounds in a row, and all of a sudden, Penn State finding a little bit of form at the right time. The exact right time. And now, like you said, that momentum has firmly shifted into the other direction. It is nowhere near UMBC's ballpark now. And the fact they're on attack, they're not even on map point. That's that's the worst thing is they came so close, they would be on map point, right? They would be in a position where all they need is one more round. Just one more. Just one more, Gibson. But no, they need two. And it, it, it sounds like, oh yeah, it's just an extra round. But the, the, the mental difference of not being on map point and knowing you could have been is so, so hard to pull yourself up from. Penn State, on the other hand, they don't care if the round was close. You clutch it, you clutch it. You The round score is all that matters in the end of the day. No fancy business, no techers, nothing like that. It just matters who wins and who loses. And at the moment, UMBC is losing, and that's going to play on their mental. It definitely is, and you know, the BM is coming back to bite maybe UMBC after what we saw a little bit earlier, but the opportunity is there. Penn State win this next round, we are all tied, and you know, it's been an interesting day, Novi, because there haven't been a lot of tight games. You know, we've seen a lot of 6-2s, 6-3s, 6-1s. This is the first time, really, that we're likely going to get into to 10 rounds at a minimum in a game, and I am all for it. This is when, you know, the, as you said earlier, the cream rises to the top, and these are the two teams in that upper bracket. They are the two teams in the upper bracket, and this is the fight that we wanted, right? 4-0 and was not the scoreline we were expecting this game, nor was it the scoreline... Penn State, I mean, UMBC definitely wanted it, but Penn State certainly didn't. They wanted to still be in this. They wanted an opportunity to fight. Going down into the lower bracket is not what they had planned for this evening. UMBC, they're just looking to take it as it comes. This round, into the next, into the next, whatever comes, whatever comes, is, is what happens. The issue is, 
Penn State have now played enough defensive rounds that they should have a good idea of how UMBC wants to approach this. So any cheese or su surprising really tactics should be in pocket now for Penn State. They should be aware of what's able to come and plan around that. There is a player inside of Cash Room though, Gibson, and it looks like they're even going to use the Thermite as They're deciding which wall to open up to give them the angle through. They opt for the security side on the wall. Spraying through, destroyer swings it on the alibi. The MX Storm domes massive, and that is a massive impact frag. Oh, that is a big one, and Penn State really feeding themselves right now. They get the kill, and then they fall back and retreat. There's no mess in the boy, but Tackle gets a kill onto Mr. Sinister with a big headshot. KZ making his way into cash. Next up on that list is taking control of construction as Joe gets back on the move, getting agile. I like to say mobility is winnability as they make their way around the map to find a new angle to attack from. Looks like Buckting getting ready to drop the hatch, but he's waiting on Joe to provide a little bit of cover. The first need is going to be tossed. Nobody is going to be found, but it's just going to slow down. UFO gets the kill onto Joe. KZ takes a lot of damage too on the window. UFO takes a little bit of damage back the other way but we are getting close to the final 20 seconds it's just KZ left and he falls and Penn State tie us up and Novi you said a flawless defense from Penn State will see them win well they have been flawless so far oh dear oh dear oh dear if you're a Penn State fan you're about to get very very worried 4 to 4 and Penn State still have the advantage, and they're now circling back round. This is the important thing is, right, is there's only five rounds, so usually in a six-round series, you'll, let's say you've won every single defensive round. So you go for your primary, secondary, tertiary, primary, secondary, tertiary. Because it's five, you go primary, secondary, tertiary, primary, secondary. You don't have to opt for that third option, because it's not even necessary. And that means that on defender side of maps or any team that is way way more comfortable on defense has a significant advantage uh, if they can secure those primary and secondary sites it's super super important UMBC certainly felt like they were a team who could do it but Penn State is showing them up in a whole different capacity Oh, they've been so impressive on defense, and if they win this next round, they go on to match point, but suddenly a win in this round from UMBC could shift momentum back the other way and put them on to match point. We haven't had a single overtime over the course of the day, and we may be getting one tonight. We're getting closer and closer as these two top sides battle this one out. 2 minutes and 40 seconds on the clock. We're going to see CTV cash and uh, we're going to see a little bit of bandit trick in here, potentially. Oh, the bandit trick. I'm not a fan, my personal opinion, especially on this site. I just feel like it's going to go down anyway. You may as well use something else. Switch off the bandit onto something more useful, perhaps, like... Uh, what would you potentially bring on this one? A mute, for example, just to clear rafters a little bit, deny more information. That being said, Penn State, they have a plan. They stuck to it. It won last time. Why change the formula? You know it works. I especially like the fact that they've sort of got this weird pseudo hold into construction, but that is a great opening kill. UMBC, take that first blood. Is this where we see the momentum shift, Gibson? Is this where it starts going the other way? Because Penn State it has been their show in this middle portion of the game. It started with UMBC. The ball got turned over to Penn State. Is this the opportunity where UMBC have tackled Penn State? It is turned around, and they are now the ones sprinting for the end zone. Well, they are making the Zen. I like the uh, American football reference that we can do Thanks. here, that we can't really do too much <laughs> in the UK and Irish scene. So KZ, oh, KZ's like, oh, no, 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 as he nearly gets taken out by his own need. But do you know what? He's going to try it again. Maybe he's given a little bit of a ping to show you a little bit of utility burn. And here comes the need. They're getting ready to push in through construction. They've 
Oh no, they didn't get the electric claw or the bandits. Or the electro claw, I think. So they're going to have to try again. KZ holding the angle. But something we didn't see a lot of earlier, Novi, was Aruni. And Aruni's proven to be a little bit of a, an obstacle here as well for that push through construction door. Both the Shuria gates, but also the utility usage that comes out to try and remove the gates themselves. George just goes aggressive into construction, slain by Buckting, but has already done the damage, wasted enough time. Now you can see the concussion going through from the Zophir. That's it. UMBC have pushed themselves onto map point. One round away from knocking out the top 25 team in the country to lower bracket and one of the best teams in this tournament, the favorites to win it, they're one round away from getting sent down to hell. Oh, I love it. I love a good underdog story. And you know, Novi, you speak about underdogs. Well, look at the team logos. Come on. UMBC, they've got oh. the dog as the logo. They're the underdogs in this one. But they find themselves on match point against Penn State University. Uh, this is certainly living up to the height. It didn't look like it was going to at the start. One round away, but also Penn State. One round away from forcing it to overtime. And we all know that overtime is where the strat book is thrown out the window. You've played all your cards. This is where the IGLs really separate themselves out for how good they are at the game, how good they are at leading their team. Currently, UMBC have rallied. Can they drive it home with one last hammer onto Penn State to knock them down? Or is Penn State going to rally for that overtime? Well, we are going to find out. This is it. Match point round number 10. And it's either going to be overtime or UMBC time as the winner of this secures their spot in the grand finals of the Kutztown LAN. And, you know, you got to say, these two teams have been fantastic over the course of the day. But the winners of the Kutztown game on the other side uh, against Drexel, they're coming into form at the right time now too, Novi. Yes. And that's scary for Penn State. Coming off of a loss and then going down into lower bracket, you're the favorites, you drop down. It's not an ideal position for any team, but especially when you are the top dog and you're going down against an underdog. It's just not a good, it's never a good position. That's why I'm always a favor or a fan of the underdogs. It's such a strong position to be in. Being, an, being underestimated is always a strength in these sort of scenarios. Maybe Penn State just underestimated UMBC a little bit too much. But are they going to smarten up? Are they going to respect them, bring them to overtime, and then snatch this defeat or snatch the victory away from UMBC? We are going to find out in the next minute and a half whether we're going to overtime or whether this will be this. Joe takes a little bit of damage from the Electro Claw as he tries to Maverick open that hatch. KZ's cooking up a nade. Can he catch somebody with that little Pokeball that he's going to throw all the way in? And, you know, I've seen the Pikachu all night, Novi. It, it was just a matter of time before I made the Pokemon reference for you. <laughs> there we go. Now, Penn State. Uh, I was going to do something about catch them all, but I can't think of it in this context. I'm sure it'll, <laughs> I'm sure it'll come to me. Let, let it stew in the back of my mind, and I'll eventually come up with something. Now, the hatch is dropped. Moto going straight down, massive into the corridor. as the prone angle, but Sledge is not able to find anything. Bugding, looking for any Penn State members, but they've all backed out. Massive could be in a position the default was up for a dangerously long time. Potential to be swung from here. Mm. There we go. Exactly as expected. The default was up too long. At least KZ is prepared for the trade. But that evil eye all the way back at the other side of church is going to cause a few issues. It's going to spot them out. But it doesn't matter. The LMG is doing work for KZ. UFO has gone down. Penn State one player away from getting knocked down. A frag grenade on the floor. And that is it. The favorites for the tournament have been sent down into the lower bracket by the University of Maryland Bolt. Baltimore County, who will go forward to be our first official grand finalist. And they deserve it. Look at that performance. 
Buck Ding and M Tackle picking up the mantle from Joe and KZ in the earlier games as they both go 12 and 8 and 12 and 5 respectively. But Penn State, they're going to get a little bit of confidence because it wasn't necessarily a good start, Novi, but they played themselves back into a little bit of contention. And had they been, you know, 6 0 which at one point looked like it was a very real possibility, they would have been going into this map with their heads down. Now they're going to just have a little bit more confidence whenever they take on the winner of the Drexel and Kutztown game. Yeah, it's a tricky, tricky position for Penn State to be in, but a great one for UMBC. They've certainly, I mean, for them, they've got, what, two-game break until they mm -hmm. play that grand final? Okay, if anyone is, I doubt they're listening, they're probably, you know, taking their kid off and going somewhere else and going to have a break. If I was them, and they are really serious about winning this tournament, go back and watch that game. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Watch back that vod. What happened through that? Um, because there's a lot that can be, there's a lot that they did really, really well. A really, really well, especially on their defensive side. But there is times where their attack went a little bit awry. And if you can correct those going into the grand final, if you can watch your opponent, watch your own vod and fix a few things, then. You know you can beat them once, but really in that game you were 4-0 up. You could have closed that out in theoretically 6-0. And that's what UMBC need to find is how they managed to drop four rounds there. Not saying that Penn State, you know, they would have dropped them, but it's always good to look at how you can do things better. Speaking of doing things better, we have got the bracket. And as you can see, it's a lot better than it was beforehand because we've got all these lovely numbers filled in. You can see 6-2, 6-2, 6-2, 6-1, all in the upper bracket until the upper bracket final went 6-4. It was one round away from going to overtime. But UMBC will be graduating to the grand final. Penn State dropping down to that lower bracket where there are two teams remaining in the lower bracket alongside Penn State. So there's four teams now left. This is the top four. That is Cutstown versus Drexel. One of these two teams will be eliminated in our next match. And then there will be the final for a uh, lower bracket final of the winner of that game against um, Penn State. And that will then decide our second grand finals. Will it be the tournament favorite gibson who have just lost or is it going to be that underdog the hometown heroes in cutstown or drexel who look like i wrote them off right at the start after their first game and they have just mounted this comeback in this upper bracket who is going to be our second grand finalist we will find out very soon but we're going to jump into a quick break and when we come back we will have our lower bracket semi-final i think that's what we class it as novi but we'll see you all very shortly hello there we welcome back. back with we a are brand back. new rap <laughs> a brand new rap no we are oh, no 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 no. it is way too late to be to be rapping <laughs> with all this rap music gibson god hey no to be fair to be fair look the reason why we're a little bit quiet right is because it's it's very late here and both of us have people sleep we're in so we kind of have to be maybe a little bit quieter but we're here with game number eight of the night we're inside the lower bracket semi-final drexel against the hometown heroes kutztown winner goes into that lower bracket final loser goes home and novi how much do you think it would mean to Kutztown University to see their team make it to the lower lower bracket final at a minimum. I think it'd be huge. They've already made top four, but to get top three, to say we finish top three is huge. That top 50% because of six teams competing. And also, Gibson, we, we made a Thanos reference last mm -hmm. map because we said, oh, we have played every single game. We've had a different map. We've had bank. We've had Oregon. We've had Club. We've had Theme. We've had Ooh. Skyscraper. We've had... I'm struggling to remember the other... Cafe. There we go. That's <laughs> another one. We've had... Ah, oh, I'm missing the other ones that we had. We've had a lot. We've, we've had every single map, we've though. Had, we've had except every, for one. And now we've got Chalet. Which means there is one map, I believe, in our Infinity Gauntlet that 
that we haven't had yet. And when I work out what that map is, <laughs> I will let you know. But the fact that we've got all unique maps is super, super interesting, isn't it? Attackers need to locate and defuse bombs. Was it Villa? Have we had Villa? We've had like, Villa. I'm to think. That was the we, one I we have. remember. Border. Yeah, we've border, had. Border. That's the one we haven't had. Please do not attempt to board the helicopter. But we are here. It is Drexel against Kutstown here on Chalet. And, you know, this is something we touched on in the last game. Chalet is probably every team in EU's third map. You know, Oregon, Clubhouse, Chalet. Those are every single team's staples. We have waited to game number eight to see Chalet. And this map, well... To say this is a roamer's paradise would be an understatement, wouldn't it, Novi? 100% so. This is massive on the roamers for a couple of reasons, because it's not the biggest map in the pool. One of the reason, uh, reasons why it is so successful, roamers, is the ability to move through the floors is a lot higher because of that mezzanine in the main lobby that's one of the main reasons why but before we even get into that skirt is already taking the head off of trop taken out of this and drex will start the round start the map a man down already yeah, that is possibly the worst start possible for Drexel, especially being on defense, but that's what you get for trying to get the early spawn peak kill. If Trob picked that kill up, you'd be saying that he was an absolute king, but he didn't, and suddenly Kutstown have the advantage. Two minutes left in the round, and Novi. You gotta say, Kutstown, it's a nice start, but they need to build on this momentum need to start getting that momentum rolling and as oh defenders one of the options is to go a little bit hyper aggressive there and take someone out to try and bring them back into the fold that's exactly what spoopy does it's a risk but it's a risk with a high reward now with the even man count they're in a far more comfortable position but as Thatcher's is going to make their life a little bit of a pain because they can open up that wall into the office from the mezzanine head has the headshot angle but the wall is in the way it allows the player to back off monkey actually monkey see monkey do finds roggers that leaves head without a head to shoot at and a man down on the side of Cutstown University. Skirt is skirting his way around the floor as well, across walls, trying to find a single player around the corner, but Spoopy goes down, and the Thatcher is on the side planting. Yeah, that could be the execute. It's a 3v3, but if they get the diffuser down, suddenly everything is in their favor. They've got the bigger firepower, but Bootless boots the head of head out of this round, and suddenly it's three defenders, but the smokes are coming on out. Skirt is going to get in a gunfight, wins his, Thunday wins his one as well, and all of a sudden it's all down to Fiery Combat, who runs out Fluke Balcony, gives away his position, and the hometown heroes, like you said, take a one nil lead and winning the first round on attack has a massive impact on a game huge huge impact on the game and it also shows that cuts down is playing to a fairly high level here as well chalet although we say it is a more attacker sided map especially with the attacking repick is still only attacker sided if played at a good level of course, Drexel did seem to suffer just a little bit, but played some generally quite good Siege. This is something that we've seen from this team before, how we saw them previously play. They can play in these weird, hyper-aggressive moments, and they seem to pick and choose them really, really well. The issue is sometimes they don't know when to back off from that aggression. They stay a little too long in a position that's too risky, get punished for it, and then the other team has the advantage can close out the round. Cuts down for them. They just need to take this slow. They need to wait for the aggression from Drexel and then turn around and punish it. Because if you know they're going to be aggressive, you should be able to plan around that. 
You gotta be able to plan around it, putting down the plan and execute it. But Novi, we all know you can plan to your heart's content, but unless you execute, it doesn't make a bit of a difference. First time around, Trob got caught out getting a little bit greedy going for the spawn peak, and we saw Kutstown massively be able to take advantage of that. But we're going to see the members of Kutstown push up and try to get library control. Make their way from the southwest section of the map in through the building, taking room by room and maybe taking some names on the journey as well. Head doing the drone work as you expected to do, using his head early on in this one. But look at that skirt is going to get knocked. But the question is on Fluke Balcony, is he safe? Well, he might be Novi as Tom gets the knock on him. Oh, sorry, he wasn't Fluke Balcony. He was inside library. Where's Skirt? Currently down to Sledge. But still, if he can get picked up, that's Cuts down in a very, very strong position. They've actually pushed Fiery Combat, who's had to back off and work his way all the way around. That is one of the reasons this is Roma's Paradise. There's roots on every single floor all the way across. You can maneuver between floors, not just easily, but also horizontally. You can move laterally across the map very very easily on every single floor lends itself to easy rotations now the selma charges going off will start to open that wall but they need to take the top floor first before they start working with their way down otherwise like you said the roamers will have an absolute field day and be able to pick them apart yeah and we said it before it's a roamers paradise but let's see if it is a you know, a, f a false paradise for these members on defense. They are a man down as Monkey has fallen nice and early, but there's a minute left on the clock for the attack inside to continue building some momentum. Trob is just playing around those trophy stairs, trying to make a little bit of noise and keep those attackers on his toes. And, you know, Trob is being very, very mobile. He's running around this map. He's making a lot of noise and as a roamer, Novi, sometimes making noise is enough. Attackers have recovered their defuser. Just need to make noise, distract, run that clock down. That is just as important as getting kills for Drexeld right now. They just need that clock to hit zero. Doesn't matter about the man count. Suddenly helps as Spoopy's gonna find two kills on the trot. Looking for that third through the floor. That's huge. Tom's manages to at least reply with two but fiery combat is chiming in will get downed in the process and now we're left in a one-on-one -on -one. tom's versus trob jaeger versus ace doors open but he's looking the wrong way that shot is going to reveal where he is two seconds one second runs around the corner trob a huge risk but gets away with it anyway I would have preferred it if he just hid instead of <laughs> sprinting out the <laughs> around the doorway. But who cares? If it works, it works. And Drexel University ties us up on 1-1. One, one. Yeah, if you had a lost that 1v1 there by swinging it, there would have been a very different bit of conversation going on in the chat right now. But as it stands, Drexel pull one back. Round three coming on up and we're going back to Master Bedroom Office and... It's one of the maps, Shally, since the rework, and especially since Attacker Repick has come in, that Basement has now become almost the fourth site, hasn't it? No, people prefer the top floor and the two ground floor sites, Kitchen and Bar Games, because if we're being honest, Basement can be incredibly easy to attack now. Can be easy. Can be easy, for sure, but... See some interesting, interesting uh, holds of some of these sites because even with the attacker repicks and with everything available and how you can sort of levy things in your favor, you can kind of do some weird tricks, I want to say, because Chalet's becoming this more standard map, right? So it's like Clubhouse where there's certain ways that are becoming quote unquote meta, but when a team picks those up and they build those habits because something is a habit it is punishable uh, and that's why it's very important for the attackers to stay on their toes stay a bit more dynamic i like what drexel's bringing with the mute mozzie combination it's classic it works same with the Wumai jaeger on top of that 
what I want to see them use is use the mute jammers, use the mozzie, uh, mo bozzy mozzies. Yeah, mozzy mozzies. We'll go with that. Just a oi, pest. Oi, oi. That's the word. Oi, oi, oi. <laughs> We're getting very Aussie now, aren't we? But mozzie, mozzie, using mozzie. them effectively to, <laughs> to create some zones where they can move about freely, where they can have a bit of movement. They've already taken down a Thatcher that is massive so early on in the round. Not going to be useful for any kind of hard breach. Yeah, and time is ticking by. It's a minute off the clock already, and head has gone down. Now, Thondi is trying to maybe put a little bit of momentum back in the way of Drexel as gunfire starts to erupt all around the map. They have taken library. The lion has started to go off as the cell, or as the EEDE starts giving a little bit of an opportunity to make the push and it's so important to know when you need to stand and when you need to move when lion uses that gadget but fiery combat that picks up another kill roggers you know so i thought it was rogers earlier but turns out you pointed out it's it's like pog poggers roggers poggers roggers Still oh, no we know it's not poggers <laughs> yeah, well, it's not buggers is the fact that Drexel are absolutely picking apart this attack from Kutstown. Roggers having a look around, just two members up as Drexel look to take the 2-1 lead. Here comes those, you know, those uh, Flores drones, those Roteros, and I think he hasn't really used a lot of them. I don't know if he has. It's pretty late on the round, and he's only starting to use that utility now. Better late than never, but you'd have wanted it to be used just the slightest bit earlier. Now, this is all well and good for Thundy to try and scout this out, but as soon as he punches this wall to try and get in, it's going to create quite a few issues. This is one of the moments where the Zero could have gone underneath, shot up underneath the floor, and cleared out the... Is it cage charges on that wall? No, it's just a mute jammer, so it could have cleared that mm -hmm. out. Monkey gets another. Is this going to be a flawless round? Yes, it is. Drexel, just like that, push themselves even further ahead, and they do it in quite a spectacular fashion, putting cuts down on the back foot. The hometown heroes are starting to fall behind as Drexel increases their lead. Two to one. Are they going to be able to win the round? Oh, sorry, win the half with three rounds? Or is Cutstown going to bounce back in the fourth round of play? Yeah, well, Bar Gaming is the scene that is going to be set for this one. You know, in the EU, this is a site that we actually see Frost get used a lot in at times. But we're not going to see Frost just yet. We are looking at those defensive setups. Wamai, Mute, Ella, Jaeger, Smoke, and... You know, we're seeing a lot of double SMG 11 action over the course of tonight, but... We haven't seen a lot of Ella, if I'm being honest, so I'm interested to see how Monkey is going to be able to utilize her because Ella is a great operator. You can get intel off the stones. It can be a free kill if you play close enough to it. But the SMG as well, that high rate of fire, that 41 bullet mag, that can absolutely shred an attack. Absolutely. It's honestly an ache. To deal with an absolute i was gonna say an absolute ball like it is a ball like to deal with um <laughs> at least okay, she's in a better one. spot than she was before when she had the titan slayer shotgun and that was ooh, that was not nice to deal with that was way 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 too strong but she's in a better uh better position now with the scorpion for sure but it's still like you said in the right hands in the right hands it is a terror absolute terror it causes chaos within the team, plus with the Grismont Mines, there's just a lot going for that operator. The most important thing is she's got a deployable shield and those things are such highly valued utility. So, so huge. I mean, especially when backed up with a Wamai and a Jaeger. It's an oldie, but a goodie. It is, and it wastes so much utility. Monkey does sing out that scorpion and gets the sting on the Thunder. He has fallen. Bootless is waiting for top to just go through the window with Thomas changed his mind. He's going to reposition himself. 
and maybe push up through trophy stairs. Skirt gets the kill on the bootless, so now there's a chance back into this round for Kutztown. Head jumps on in, and there's nobody inside Solarium, so he's going to push into Master Bedroom next, but we're a minute and 10 seconds into the round, and they've barely even gotten into the map, and they got to traverse the whole side if they want to make their way over towards Bar Games. And, you know, this is the shield that you were speaking about in particular. You know, this shield on top of Library Stairs with the Jaegers, with the Omais. Trob's position here, he doesn't need to get too aggressive on the peaks. He can just stand where he is. The threat of him being there is enough, but Thatcher will have a big impact on his ability to stay there. Huge impact. Fiery Combat chiming on in as well. Thatcher's taken out Tom Cuts. Toms, he's starting to make his way onto a position where he can do something, but it's not going to be enough. That's an easy pickings for Drexel. Very, very nicely done. Just like that, moving up to 3-1. Oh. They win the half. Now, can they get that final round? Push it onto 4-1. Very commanding lead so far. But if cuts down, can get one more round, it brings it within distance for them. It does. And a question I'm going to ask you is... You know, me and you have been, you've been in the scene a little bit longer than I have, but have you seen a bit of defensive utility stock increase more than the shield once they made it so that you could see through it? Because about two years ago, the shield was kind of the utility that nobody brought because you couldn't really see around it. As a defender, all it really was was cover. Whereas now it's kind of become a ad hoc version of the mirror window. And really the shield... I can't imagine Siege without the shield being in its current form anymore. The thing is, right, is so I remember talking to some players um, over like tier two, some tier one players as well. And um, a lot of them said even if you removed the, the little mirrors in it, wouldn't matter too much. Um, the main thing that sort of came in was the fact that Ubisoft introduced a lot of anti utility operators all at the same time. So you mm -hmm. had Wamai, you then had like you had a Rooney, you had it was actually it was Wamai and Malusi, the combination of those two. The Malusi Banshee soaked up so much utility because they were bulletproof. Plus the Wamai mm -hmm. magnets combined with Jaeger, those three meant ADS has had three charges back then. They've been significantly nerfed since then. You had what you can have three magnets off the off the chart, plus mm -hmm. three banshees. So it would be what, nine grenades? Or, like, uh, at least, what, nine flashes to clear the ADSs, three grenades for the Banshees, plus five magnets on top of any other utility, that, on top of the deployable shields, on top of everything like that. And it's so... And then I think it sort of made people pick the deployable shield, and then they went, oh, hey, this is pretty good, actually, if we defend this piece of utility. Because you can't shoot through it. Like, it's, you know, it's not like... Uh, barbed wire or anything like that we can just hit it or, or or something like that it's a lot more just inflexible speaking of inflexible though drexel's getting snapped in half there's no bend yeah, he... for the drexel side <laughs> a lot of break though <laughs> a lot of break as fiery combat monkey have fallen trob though gets that kill on to skirt back the other way as suddenly we're back to a 3v4 Kutztown, they need this round to go into the half at 3-2. But for the players playing on site, it's a matter of being patient, using your time. Well, my disc's being thrown up around the breach, but Trob is going to get taken down by Tom. A minute and 30 seconds, and I'm looking at the utility. They've still got, what, two, four, five, six drones that they can use, Novi, if they decide to on the attacking side. And with a minute and a half, this is the perfect time to maybe start using them. Yeah, you should really start using it, especially now that you've got, what, a minute remaining and you know there's only two players left. So why run in onto site without the information? You've got the small bit of time, you've got the utility, go for it. And just getting that, that slight information gain means you turn any gunfights from, even if it's a 60-40, up to a 70-30, which is really, really good odds. Drexel, on the other hand, 
they could do nothing but waste time. Toxic Canisters going out from Bootless to do just that with the SMG-11 in hand. The deployable shield is still here. So there's the potential with the ADS and the Magnet. So that requires two pieces of utility just to remove it. He can sit pretty behind this peek out but no he's getting pushed he wasn't sure if Thomas was going to push it or not just push straight before the smoke even popped and just like that cuts down very impressive comeback in that round to push them ahead well not ahead but within catching distance now a three to two scoreline for Drexel as we hit the half half time in this game and as things stand you gotta say Kutstown are probably the happier of the two sides you know we always would say that in the traditional 6-6 format you want to go in at the half at 4-2 so realistically going at the half at five in the 5-5 five five, but at 3-2 the defenders are now in the best position because Kutstown all they got to do is win four rounds on Shally on defense and they I go through to the lower bracket well. final but for Drexel University, if they can maybe get an early round on attack, suddenly momentum swings back in their favor. But this is the hometown la team. This is the Kutztown land. There is bound to be a lot of people walking around that building right now beside where these two teams are rooting for their boys to take the win on this one. Certainly so there's a lot of home hometown pride, isn't there? Yeah, always mm -hmm. even if the, you're the underdogs in the scenario you know you always want to back the team and there's also that advantage we, we haven't even touched on it being on land gibson it's mm -hmm. such a different environment it's so so different for the players this completely alternative vibe as well that's given off you can fist bump your team you can see their faces you can you can i'm from what i've heard you can scream to the other team there's a lot that goes on a LAN. You can hear it all and, you know, the same way to, you know, we're from EU. Whenever you teams that came through UK and are playing at major tournaments, you got a bit of support for the home sides. And that's what these guys are going to want for Kutztown. Roggers gets the open and kill though. And that, you know, that gun, uh, I forget the name of it right now because it's late at night. It's so... There's virtually no recoil whatsoever. It's a laser beam. Yes, the rate of fire is a little bit lower. But if you're what good at... Uh, no, um... Thorns. Thorns gone. Oh, it's uh, uh, Uzi. The Uzi. The Uzi. Yeah, the Uzi. It's late, guy. In case you, you don't know, it's... 1 a.m. here, and Novi has been absolutely phenomenal tonight so far. Came in last minute. Speaking of last minute, Roggers at the very last second swings that breach, and Skirt gets another one as Kutztown have a fantastic position now. They've got the breach in their line of sight, and really, does it come any better? Then a 4 2, well, I was about to say then a 5 2, but it's become a 4 2 now. But all these members of Kutztown have to do, Novi, is just hold the angle because. Oh no, Trob's going to pull up. Novi, I, I'm a caster, it's my job to get things wrong. Hey, no, 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 this is just a caster curse. You're setting it up like. Uh -huh. Kutztown just need to cruise through. You've cursed them in the process. <laughs> and now, Skirt. It's interesting with the dock pick as well because I I kind of get it I kind of don't at the same time there's 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 better picks there's better picks for sure but skirt of all things has the P90 now Trob finds that headshot Doc is not gonna heal him up despite his best efforts in pleading in all chats and so he's gonna remove his head for punishment now Monkey and Trob in a two on two cuts down have certainly had their way Ooh. in this round but has completely swung the other toms has to find that headshot with the smg 11 it's not going to be enough Runs to oh my lord trob gets decimated on such low hp that was a headshot to boot with the shotgun but how on earth has drexel won that round trob pulled them across the victory line and cuts down is going to be left with their hand head in their hands it was a 5v2. Drexel had two men up on the breach and every single member of Kutztown University, well, not every member, but four of the players peaked to the breach one at a time. And in that situation, the golden rule is don't give away a pick because 
if you're being honest, when you're playing in an online environment where ping is an Im has an impact, you can swing things and get that little bit of a benefit. But hmm. because of the fact that all these players are on zero ping, Attackers you can actually hold behind. angles pretty safely, and Kutztown didn't do that. They chose not to. They got too aggressive with it, too excited, I think. And quite rightly so, they got punished. They're going to be kicking themselves for that one, because now, instead of an even scoreline of 3-3, three, three, they're now so far behind in 4-2. They need to mount that comeback. Actually, switching to a different site altogether, I believe. I think they're on bar gaming. So Curious not uh -huh. even opting for the basement once more that they had such a confident start on. Completely switching up. Speaking left. of switching up, Drexel, Capital, Ying, Gridlock, and Lass. Couple of, couple of fast boys in there. Couple of slow, chunky boys like the, Gla like the Glass, who's a little bit slow. But I'd be a bit worried because this has got Rush written all over it, doesn't it, Novi? We could be about to see a very fast execute by Drexel once they get the intel on the site. They need to get the intel first. Here's the Candela getting charged up, so that's going to get thrown out. Smokes as well. Skirt finds the first with the P90. I'm still finding the funny, the fact that that's being used on dock, but now the smokes are out everywhere. Look at this. The flash is going everywhere. The P90's found a triple kill, and now with a magnum, but here's the glass with the thermal scope. Bootless raining down fire takes out the dock. So the dog and the mute removed. The next smoke is going through, and he's just standing by the window, ready and waiting. You can see, <laughs> bro, is nuts. <laughs> the, the, the strat, the respect is getting given out in all chat. But there's one player in the service corridor. But where is the rest of them? That's what Drexel needs to work out because currently they're a man down, and despite all the chaos they have caused, they have not come out ahead. They have not a minute and 30 left, but just a little bit of a pause in the action, though. You still have the combination of Ying and Glaz, and Glaz is a, is a strange one because if you can click heads, he is fantastic, and you need to use the utility, but because there's still a smoke and because you've still got those... Can well, you don't have those candelas anymore as Tom Z gets that kill, and it's all down to Glaz in a 1v3 and it's just important now that Drexel don't feed him. Or, you know, don't get, don't get fed, sorry, by Kutztown. Because if you're Kutztown, you just hold your crosses and wait for him to jump in the window. Hold the cross F, um, and then just chuck some... Oh, I don't know. Chuck some lead, that's <laughs> the one. I was trying to think what bullets are made of. It's lead, it's lead. How, how did I not remember that? Lead. Sunshine, chuck some sunshine lead and down rainbows. Range. Sunshine and rainbows, Sunshine yes. and rainbows. PG rated game. <laughs> uh, definitely not. <laughs> well, um, it's, that actually, it's a that actually game. reminds me. This is, this is a very sad topic. Um, <laughs> back when I played in the university scene, our, our team was called, <laughs> this, is, this is so bad. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> We're called sunshine, <laughs> lollipops and rainbow that. six each. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Bring it back. Get a petition in chat. Bring back Sunshine's Lollipops and Rainbow Six Siege. And you know what? You know what? I like it. It's a bit of positivity. There's not enough positivity in the world right now, it, is it, there? It, it, nah, it deserves to be roasted. It was awful. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's be serious on this one. Also, it wasn't the best look for a team, but, but it's all a bit of fun. Speaking of fun... Drexel is currently cruising in the lead. That 4-3 mm -hmm. scoreline. They just need the two more rounds. We saw this actually last game with the the, the Penn State the Penn State upset, I want to say. Mm -hmm. They were behind. I think it was like 4-2 or 4-1. And then they just smelted that comeback. And cuts down. Shown resilience. Shown that they can bounce back. So has Drexel. Currently, if Drexel is slightly in the lead, Cutstown needs to cement their momentum by winning this next round. If they don't, it's just a blip on the Drexel radar. They move on to that point. 
Can't stand need to view it like they have to win this. They do. They really do. Because if you put Drexel on the match point, the best players, they've got this habit of being able to drown out the situation as far as the scoreline is concerned. But when you're two rounds down and it's match point for the other team, suddenly people start playing a little bit more cautious, a little bit more cagey, and they forget what they did to get themselves in winning positions in the past. So it's very important that Kutztown win this round, and if they lose this round, that they don't lose their heads. Calm, consistent, composed. That's what we're looking for from the Kutztown team. Drake's on the other hand. We want to see some aggression, some fire, or a Nitro Cell being chucked through the Maverick hole. That's an old lead and a goodie. It does leave a slight space for the Thermite to open up the wall into the office, but the P90 is doing work for skirts. Uh, I, I would not expect to see a P90, but hey, if it it, it ain't if it works, it ain't stupid. <laughs> skirt, skirt, as he keeps picking up lots and lots of points. Kills even. Look, he's on 10 and 6, and I'm going to be honest, I think that he's gotten at least 7 of those kills by playing Doc with the P90. So, you know, we're casters. We get things wrong. We do the curse of the caster. It's our job. Well, so far, Skirt is proving us wrong with the P90 as he's been going 90 with it since he pulled it out inside defense. 45 seconds left. They've got the 5-3 advantage, but for Cutstown... They've been in this position already, and last time they were, it didn't work out the best for them, Novi. Not at all. Not at all. They need to hold on to the position and just not allow Trob into separate one versus ones. This player is lethal. He's dangerous. Backed up with Monkey again. These two are the dynamic duo with head goes down. Oh my... Gibson, oh no. Gibson, it's a repeat. Gibson, it's a repeat. It's left up to Tom's as well. Oh my lord, this can't be going like this. No way. No way, oh. Tom's closes it out. Cuts down, managed to reverse their fate, but it came way too close. Tom's was allowed to do things that no player should be allowed to do. We just saw the same film twice, Novi, but with a different ending. And, uh,. You know, we know which end and both of these sides are going to prefer, but it's now 4-4. Four, four. This is a tight game, but Novi, there had to have been a second where Kutztown were panicking there. there. There had to have been one second where they thought, oh no, not again. Yeah, surely. Surely there was a... They were like, oh no, 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 no. Like, not a repeat. <laughs> but they somehow... Well, that's Tom's is discipline. I mean, Tom's has kind of been the staple of the team all the way through. Uh, if there's any player on the Custown team that needs to get shouted out, to me, it is certainly Tom's. Yes, Scott is having a fantastic game, but he's also got, like, infinite lives with the dog. Plus, for some weird reason, the P90 is working for the only game ever it works. But Tom's, in every single game, has been a consistent factor, both in attack and defense. And for me, he is the Cutstown MVP. Is it enough that him and Skirt can bring this to map point? I don't know, because Drexel, we've seen what they can do when their back is against the wall. Yeah, and we had a chance to cut to cut or to have a little bit of a talk with Skirt earlier. And uh, we asked him about the game, and he told us he hates Rainbow Six Siege, and he is only playing because he's being forced to play by Tom Z. Well, with both of them going 10 and 5 and 10 and 7 right now, I am sure Kutstown are happy that Tom has the ability to, for to force Skirt to play. I mean, yeah, if, uh, the most important thing we always say is for players to have fun, right? Because if you're having fun, if you enjoy what you do, you're a lot more likely to perform better. You know, that's... You feel better, you'll perform better, you'll hit better shots. And you're less likely to whiff things, you're less likely to get frustrated. And so maybe Doc P90 is just a bit of a meme, but he's like, hey, it's working, I'm having fun, and I'm destroying these other guys, why not? And if it works, it works. It's absolutely fine. Drake's although monkey. This is very brave. Not getting droned in, this is... 
okay, this is kind of a mistake, but it's also kind of a risk at the same time. You cut down on time massively because you don't have to wait for another teammate. But at the same time, you get caught out, kind of your own fault because you should have, should be droned in in that situation. But he's not getting punished for it. There doesn't seem to be a Roma. Skirt is <laughs> doing these like shoulder peeks to see if he can find anyone, but there is no one down that corridor, so it's absolutely fine, Skirt. Just sort of psyching yourself out. And look at this rotate by Drexel running all the way through with the Thatcher EMPs as well. Spoopy is gonna open the wine room as well. And now they're looking to assault from the north side down towards the south, and they're poised on the entrance to try and open that hallway up. They are. They've got the boiler wall open in the wine. But if you want to plant, you know, our good friend Ace put up a little bit of a seed school and he says you have to clear into wine if you want to get the diffuser down. It's very important. Well, they are playing out of that playbook right now, but they need to clear. I think it's Cade that is inside that position. They need to get rid of him. They're opening up those vertical angles. They're trying to find his head. And Spoopy gets the kill onto Jaeger. 5v4 now. They're getting aggressive. They're moving into sight. But Thunday gets one. Thunday tries to get two. But it's Monkey that finds the frag. And Thunday is going to fall. 4v2 now as Traub pulls one out. Traub gets the double. And Skirt pulls one back. And now they find themselves in a tough spot. The, oh, the, the BM. Traub with the BM right there. Let's watch this back. Let's watch this back. Hipfire drop shot. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, Traub. You know, okay, I, I take back <laughs> what I said about Tom's being the MVP. <laughs> Traub, MVP. MVP candidate. Absolutely. That is amazing. Novi, straight out of the playbook of Modern Warfare 2, that one right there from back in the day, the oh, yeah. fire drop shot. The, the drop Ooh. shot. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's the, that is the good stuff. I love smelling a drop <laughs> shot drop shot in the morning. You know, with a name like or yours. The evening. A name like your caster name and hearing that Yeah, you, know, you know, just saying, Novi. I'm just saying. Oh dear, oh dear. See, like he's Novi. I drop, I dropped the cane. Drop the cane. All right. Look, it's Novi. And for anyone watching, it is Novi. I know that you've had a couple of issues in the past with people uh, getting the pronunciation wrong. So you heard it straight from the horse's mouth. It is Novi. And by the way, Novi, can I just say? I believe this will be your last map on the cast tonight, but it's been an absolute pleasure getting to work with you again after a long time out. And, uh, you know, I think for a man taking it on a short notice, you've absolutely smashed it tonight. I mean, thank you so much, but also you, you being a pleasure. Sticular was really cool to Castle as well. I, you know, I've mm -hmm. followed him on Twitter for a while, so it's great to actually, you know, have a bit of a chat to him and get to cast a game with him at Skyscraper mm -hmm. as well, which was really cool. Um, and also, for introducing to me to the man, the myth, the legend, Croc stuff as well. Um, you know, he he was a lovely guy as well. Like he, he, you you keep you keep good company, Gibson. That's what I'm trying to say. Good, definitely, you definitely keep good company. So, thank you for <laughs> bringing me on board. And it, it's nice. I can now like I'm, I'm crossing off different regions to cast. I've done I've done Australia, New Zealand. I've done APAC before. I've, I've done Europe. I've now done N. I can say I've casted NA. So now I've, I've, I now I just need to do LATAM and I need to do Asia oh. and Africa. That, that's, 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 those are the next three that I need to do. Novi out here playing region bingo and suddenly he's going to get it all. But Monkey Skirt pulls one back. This is match point for Drexel. And now with the 4v4, Thunday, oh, he got lucky there on that one with the timing on the swing. But he stays alive. He's got the SMG 11, and he should reload because he's got the opportunity to do so. I'm seeing chat lighting up. They want to spam the crown where Kutstown, they want to take the crown. And Drexel want to take them off the throne. Tom Z gets the kill on the Trob. Bootless now, LMGE. You know, Navi, you spoke, or Novi, you spoke about it. Mouse one, W shift. With the LMGE, that's pretty much all you got to do. Yep. Just, <laughs> it's that easy. That's why it's so strong at the moment. It stops defenders from re-peaking, but Spoofy's just going to peek any angle to find Thundee. 
Maybe it is on the two hero players for Cutstown to keep them in the game. Is it going to be Drexel to take the win or is it going to be cuts down? Toms goes down to Spoopy. It's all on the dock, on the frost. Bring the cold. Are they going to be melted out? I'm just, I was trying to think of a frost kind of pun there, but I couldn't think of one off the top of my head. Off the top of the head, Head might get his removed there. Skirt actually manages to find Bootless, and that's pretty big, but Frost goes down on the library stairs. That's a massive death for them. Now it's all on Skirt. Brilliant headshot. Snap straight to Fiery Combat's head. And we're left in a one versus one again. Spoopy has been doing a phenomenal job this round. Been going under the radar pretty much the whole game, but has been consistently winning their ones. But this round has been the difference maker for the team. Throws a flash through the surface entrance and we get our first overtime of the evening, everybody. Drexel University and Cutstown. This is an elimination game. The hometown heroes versus the underdog story in Drexel. Both teams have now pushed each other to overtime. Yeah, we're going... <laughs> you know, as our colleagues in the EU would say, we're going all the way. <laughs> you know? I don't know going about you, but whenever way. I hear over... <laughs> whenever I think of overtime, Novi, I just can't help but think but it's Des saying that. It's... It's just one of those siege things, but... We're going to overtime. Yes. It's a 5-5. Five, five, and Novi, we spoke about some players having big games. You know, Joe had a huge wow. game earlier on tonight. Uh, KZ's had a couple of big games. Skirt right now at 14-8 and eight has had a monumental game. And he's actually clutched out two rounds in this one as well. So he has had a big impact. He's had a huge, huge impact in this game. But then there's been quite a few players who've stood out. You know, Head, for instance, isn't having the best game, but the previous games has been huge mm -hmm. for cuts down. Absolutely huge. Fiery Combat is currently taking negative, but the kills that Fiery Combat has found has allowed Drexel to win rounds. And that's what counts is in terms of impact. It doesn't matter how many kills you have. It's does that kill help you win the round? If it does, that's fine. Because, for instance, if it's a one versus five, and you get, and the team with five just run into you and give you three kills before the timer runs out, you get three kills, sure. But it doesn't do anything. It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Every single one of these players, the kills have mattered. They've swung the round in one direction or another. And it's fascinating to see that for the first time, I feel like all day, maybe apart from the Penn State game we had earlier, we're seeing two teams really push each other hard. Yeah, we really are. And this is a massive opportunity. The big thing is, could Stone start on defense? That has a big impact because it means you get two tries on the board. You know, on Shelly. One of the closer to 50-50 maps, but it is still slightly defender favored as Dundee gets the open and engagement. Skirt pulls another one. It's a 5v3 now, and dare I say, we've seen this before, Novi. <laughs> oh dear, Trump's alive. And on the nook as well. This could be a little bit worrisome. No frag grenades in hand, so no up nade is going to be a possibility. There's another one. Okay, the script is being flipped. Tom's is going to be the player to push them across that mark. But Spoopy had a great round previously. Wasn't quite able to close it home. But suddenly put them in a winning position. Is he going to be able to do the same here? Trob is going to be droning up. There's enough time to do that. Looking upstairs. But this is a bit of a... Not even a risk. It's a bit of a desperation play. A Hail Mary at this point. This is just chucking the ball as far down the field as possible and hoping someone is in the end zone to catch it. The Hail Mary, and you spoke about the script. Well, is this a Disney script, or is this got an M. Night Shyamalan twist at the end of it? Traub pulls one back as the hometown heroes find themselves in a 4v2 in overtime. Head gets the head of Spoopy, goes towards Knock, and doesn't get the kill but head finally on the flip doors and you know it's looking like a disney film right now but if this twists back the way 
of Drexel. It is going to be the M. Night Shyamalan of M. Night Shyamalans. It's going to be huge. The hometown heroes looking to eliminate Drexel University and push themselves into, at worst, a third place finish. Not too bad for a team that got first around it in the upper bracket, running the full gauntlet all the way through. Ironically, the teams who've lasted a bit further in, I think they're the ones who have been falling out of favor. So nicely down by Cutstown, but they need one more round to close it home. And they did struggle a little bit on their attack as opposed to Drexel University, who, once they got the ball rolling, looked very, very comfortable. They had a set lineup that worked, and they're going to the master bedroom site with the classic deployable shield. And I heard this is a, a li little birdie told me this. As in little birdie, I mean fresh. Um... <laughs> When Fresh was with G2, they're the ones who came up with that deployable shield on Chalet. On, on the really? Piano. That, that, yeah, they were the one. They were one of the first teams to do that in EUL, and they were the ones who came up with it in in scrims. Or so he says, or so he claims. Or I could have been listening wrong. Who knows? It, it could be a multitude of things. But I seem to remember him mentioning a shield, a piano, and Chalet, and G2. Well, Fresh has a big boy brain on him, and I wouldn't be surprised. But this is overtime match point. This is Kutstown's opportunity now to get the win. But is there a sting in this tail? They are going to try their very best, Drexel, to work their way back on in. But, you know, for Kutstown, these two teams, Novi, it's not about how you fin how you start. It's about how you finish. And SI 2022 TSM showed exactly that that's what it's about. Yep. Finished third in their groups. Ended up winning the whole damn thing. So it's all about fighting to the bitter end. They're not out until the timer runs out. Or the opponent gets that seventh elusive round. Evening the score count, 4-4, four to four, is very helpful. Losing the Sledge, not the biggest issue in the world when attacking this site in comparison to some of the others, so they can thank their lucky stars there. The Thatch is still in play, so it is the Ace as well. Thundy needs to get in a position where he can start using those air jabs effectively. But at the moment, they've managed to run the clock down, but not gathered much progress. They have not. Bootless is looking in the window. He spots them out, but Thunday gets the first kill. 4v3. Looking through the bathroom window to see if they can maybe spot another one, but Monkey spots out Thunday and gets the kill onto him. It's a 3v3 now. Kutstown are three kills or a minute and 15 away from getting into that lower bracket final as Fiery Combat is going to get down. He's crawling behind half wall to get a little bit of security, but Trob is going to get traded out 2v2 now, and Monkey needs to get this res. He's making the move but he's low HP Tom they've got full master bedroom control but they need to get the diffuser and that is lucky Novi because that diffuser very easily could have fallen down outside gotta be careful with it especially with the time remaining yes it's 40 seconds but could put you in a precarious situation that's a nice one by Rogers pretty poggers to put them on a potentially one more death. And there we go. Cuts down have done it. They've worked their way in. Somehow, the hometown heroes into a winning position. They will be going through to our lower bracket final to face Penn State. What a fantastic job by the, the hometown team. That is just... You know, I, I was genuinely a little bit worried in our first game mm -hmm. because I because cuts down got dropped to the lower bracket and I was like, mm -hmm. Oh no, you can't be the, the, the home side and and go out first round. That that can't happen. And look at them here. They're in to at least third place. What a mm -hmm. fantastic job by these players. Brilliant job by the players, and they are now just ten states away from getting into the final. And if they were to go and win it. Well, then what a scalp that will be to take. UMBC completely unfazed. They've made their whole way into the final. But let's jump into that bracket, Novi, and remind everybody of how we got to where we are now. 
Yeah, so cuts down. They started all. That first round versus Bryant. They managed to take Bryant down. Facing Drexel. This was the upset. Robert Morris looked pretty, pretty good in, in their game. They made mistakes, but they showed a lot of promise. But they got rolled by Drexel, who got rolled themselves. Got into that next round. Our first overtime game in that lower bracket. Cuts down. And then cuts down. I'm going to have to play again versus Penn State. Top 25 team in the country in that Premier League. And we can look. Um, Potentially, uh, well, actually, no, we don't need to look at the upper bracket. We already know who how that one's gone because we can see all the teams now. But commiserations, Drexel, they have fallen out of the tournament. They, unfortunately, will be cemented in fourth place. But I think they have done a valiant effort and they've showed us mm -hmm. that there's a lot of talent on that roster. Yeah, lots of positives to think of going forward into the year ahead. And, you know, a lot of these players hoping to someday maybe make their way into T3, T2, T1 as well. And Novi, we've seen some potential, a little bit of uh, improvement in some of them names, and who knows? We may have seen the next big name in Siege playing for one of those teams that have been eliminated already. Yeah, you don't know. It's not, it's not necessarily just about raw talent. It's also about the hard work and discipline. There's many, many players who've taken time to get to that point uh, where their skill set really comes alive. And a lot of that is just that hard work and dedication and participating in things like this. The, these sort of grassroots tournaments is the perfect opportunity to, to practice and emphasize or amplify those skill sets that will be required in the future if they were to get up to tier three to tier two to tier one. Mm -hmm. 100 percent. Well, guys, that is that for the semifinals. We go to the lower bracket final now but novi it has been an absolute pleasure casting with you tonight i know that you're going to have to leave us thanks for stepping in at such short notice and uh if you want to catch novi again you can see him on the nordic premier league and buell the guy is super talented and uh make sure and Aww. give him a little follow on twitter as well hello and welcome back to the kutstown university rainbow six siege lan we are at the lower bracket final and my name is gibson and that handsome man that you see to my left which is uh as you probably realized is not crot stuff it is the one and only artifacts warden good friend of mine i uh reached over you know we, we lost a couple of casters and I reached over and pulled him in for this one. So, Warden, how excited are you to be here for this? I think, uh, for those of you at home, I think Warden may just be muted, but we will continue on while we wait for him to get that solved. And yes, that is a Monty Shield in his background. If you ever want to check him out, at Artifix Warden on Twitter. He's a fantastic Siege cosplayer as well to check out his stuff. But we are going to go over to Villa for game number one inside this lower bracket final penn state university taking on kutstown university and the first ban is going to be a thatcher now it's time for that attacker ban coming on and let's see who penn state decided to get rid of warden have you rejoined us yet i think uh sorry we do apologize for those of you at home warden is uh Experiencing some technical difficulties would be the way to put it. But the second ban is going to be the Flores. And very situational ban. And a player that I think with the AR-33 and with those Oteros can have an absolutely massive impact on any game that he plays. Kaid will be the second ban that comes on in on the Fender side. and Or on that side. And look, it's another one of those great ones that can stop a lot of those vertical attacks. So I like that. And... The final ban, the fourth and final one on this map, will be Jaeger. So, Wamai will be the dish of the day when it comes to that utility denial. Warden, are we back yet? Do we have, uh, do we have Warden? Oh, no. We'll get Warden and as soon as we can but until then you guys are stuck with me on the solo cast so i do apologize for all of your ears and if you need subtitles please put a message in chat because i know that i can get a little bit excited castle doc frost thorn and valk 
is your defensive lineup so much intel that they'll be able to grab valk can get those cameras up lots of information thorn as well your utility doesn't necessarily always get a lot of kills but once again it's intel the same with the frost and you know skirt p90 doc you saw what he can do he is gonna do it again and uh as we still wait for warden to get back in a little bit of site setup as we're gonna go straight into kitchen dining as the first site of the day and in a situation like this kutstown need to do whatever they can to stop penn state from building up momentum they just had an absolute barn blazer of a game against drexel and penn state the exact same they had a cracking game against umbc 15 seconds into the round falk patrolling in and around kitchen pre-setting that c4 ready to maybe catch somebody by surprise with that one once that audio intel comes on in miles doing a little bit of droning by me and stairs and having a little look up towards 90 as it looks like this push coming in from penn state will be starting on the south side of the map and push all the way through from a v g jaws makes his way into vault they're slowly but surely starting to pick up some map control getting a lot of information and making this attack or you know making it very easy for them to push in towards statue destroyer gets rid of that vibe alarm so that whenever they push down red stairs there'll be no audio cues and they're just doing a great job but with a minute on the clock already we still haven't had that opening engagement Shots coming on in. Skirt will be the first player to fall, but Tom instantly gets a pick going back the other way as Destroyer taken out by that pre play C4. Mild. They've got that's statue good. control now. And is that Warden? Do we have our boy, boy Warden back in? I think you do. I think I'm, I think we're working now. We are. So Warden, a oh minute God. 14 left in the round. A lot of vertical control being taken by Penn State, but they need to start actioning on it. Do. Time is going to swiftly run out if they're not too careful here. A few shots do land on Mr. Sinister there. So they really need to kind of be very careful that these uh, holes, they do both go, uh, they do go both ways, unfortunately, as they stare down into the site, trying to find any more targets to pick off. So that as soon as they find them, they can then look to kind of crush in onto that site and really p put the pain on. Yeah, they want to cause some misery for the members of Penn State to Kutstown. They're the hometown heroes. They're playing in their own LAN for the chance to make it into the grand, grand final. 30 seconds left and Penn State, we said this before, they're a patient team. They attack very late. They play to the 22nd meta and his jaws is just getting ready. He's got the hammer in his hands. He swings the hammer and they're pushing on and Roggers gets two kills and suddenly the hometown heroes Kutstown find themselves in a 4v1 and that is a win for Kutstown and Warden. That was just a case of Penn State once again playing a little bit slowly and Kutstown just absorbing the pressure. Yeah, they seem to really kind of, as you said, t kind of take that pressure really well, and that's kind of really key. That um, I feel that they needed, they were searching for a pick that they maybe couldn't find because they were just watching those angles, maybe a little bit too passively. You need to kind of get aggressive on those and really put some. They were kind of, like you said, there was some initial pressure, but it wasn't enough to really make the defenders squirm under it. They really had, they were still able to move around. They weren't locked off. They weren't penned into any corners that maybe they could pinch another player into onto. So it really kind of fell apart there. They really need to work that top four more, but then also encroach round on the actual floor itself to really put the defenders under pressure, to force those mistakes, to put them in those awkward positions that will then result in the kill and the eventual collapse onto the site especially if you're going to take that much time. In meta on attack, you do need 
to at least get a pick or two. You need some sort of advantage when you push into the site because it suddenly becomes shooting fish in a barrel for the defenders whenever that attack does come in. But we're moving on into the second round. Kutstown will be very happy with how that one went. But I'm looking at that defender setup again. And there's so much intel there, Warden. You've got the Valk cams. you got the Mozzie cams. you got Thorn, who's blue Razor Blooms. Once again, they don't get a lot of kills, but they provide so much intel. They do. They're really good for that. And as well, I think one of the biggest uh, things that I've wound up using them for is for... Um, Full uh, for commitment swings. So I place them in areas where where I know an attacker fully has to commit. They can't stall out. They fully have to commit. They have to commit to that swing. And as soon as they go through and you hear that initial trigger, then I swing. And that's where you put them under pressure. That's where you swing back. You either get the kill. If you don't, the thorn can trade it straight back out because you've got that pressure on them. They've still committed to that swing. And hopefully the shrapnel will take them out as well. The key kind of thing that I'm curious about here for uh, Kutztown is the dock pick. You don't really see dock picked much these days due to him being... Mm, it's it's a very selfish operator. A lot of the time you're using those stims on yourselves rather than your fellow teammates. And uh, while it's not like a thinker where he, everyone gets the heal, unfortunately it is very, like I said, quite selfish. And as well, we see more kills go towards Kutztown University as Destroyer looks to make entry on in. The Thorn does activate, but he manages to scramble out just in the nick of time. And uh, he's really trying to put some more pressure on. And while the man count for uh, Penn State just keeps on falling, they really have to kind of look to work this site a little bit better as they're just kind of trapped between two doors as they try and swing on through and another and they're gonna lose another man and now destroyer it's now left to jaws in a one versus four and he's got it all to do here and i don't think he's gonna have uh really the ability to clutch this one out and unfortunately he won't as skirt finishes it off with the p90 nonetheless as well an absolute buzzsaw of a weapon and one that you really don't want to come across when you're attacking yeah, so Warden, I think, you know, you obviously came in late, you missed the last game, but absolutely dominant performance by Skirt on the dock. I think he ended up, he ended up 16 and 8, I think, there, thereabouts, and a good 12 of his kills came on the dock, so he knows how to use dock. He knows how to position himself in an area where he can get the kills, but... Warden, a big thing to remind the viewers of as well is this is a LAN event, so every single player is playing on zero ping, which means that defenders, players like Doc with those long scopes, they can hold angles. They don't need to be worried about the peaker's advantage that sometimes will happen in an online scenario. So in a reality, a LAN event gives you a far better understanding of the skill level of these players as well. It does. It does allow you to play weapons that you wouldn't normally uh, use. I think one of the best examples of that is uh, take something like the Romy on Mozzie, or uh, as, uh, as as we see here. Uh, oh, is it? Um, my, bra is, my, my, my brain has just totally gone into fog. It's late here. <laughs> um, but it goes into. It kind of lends itself into that. Is the Romy is now the size of a Zippo and you really need to make those shots count. And on a land, you can really make those shots count. Shots that wouldn't normally hit, that may kind of be bugged in for to some unfortunate server messiness. Don't, doesn't really happen on that land. A, a lot more weapons do become viable. An ump is another good example. So uh, it is, it really does showcase that uh, any weapon can still be dangerous in the right hands on land. Well, plain and simple, Warden, this is a game where the headshot is king. It doesn't matter what weapon you're using, unless it's the Cavera pistol. I think that's the only gun in the game that doesn't have that one-shot kill multiplier. Maybe some of the shotguns at range, obviously, those pellets don't have the same sort of an impact. But, like I said, no matter what gun you use, if you can click heads better than the other guy, you will win that fight. UFO already pushed inside Pottery, looking to move up those main stairs as they just have a look around, trying to find any potential roaming presence from the defenders. They have used a minute already inside this round to clear out a lot of the section of the map, Warden, but you've used a lot of time clearing. Now you got to start working towards objective and getting a kill or two. 
you do, and unfortunately the first kill does not go uh, Penn State's way, as Jaws will unfortunately fall to the waking, uh, to the Jaws of uh, Thundee there. So, that's a good first pick, and they're going to force themselves up the main stairs nonetheless, and they're going to look to take control of the bookcase. Thundee is unfortunately forced off his little angle looking down onto those main stairs, so now uh, Cr Crutchtown really have to be careful of the presence that may swing through onto Bar, Mr. Sinsa forces his way through the study, unfortunately will take a heap of d uh, damage in the process, so they're very low, now they've got to be uh, very careful of how they uh, look to play this, as they are the one that's carrying the Diffuser Destroyer, we'll use the Echo, sorry, the uh, IQ there to find the Valkcam that was spotting them out, but they are going to fall in the, pro uh, in the process, Destroyer down and as well as mi uh, Mild down as well, and now it's a 2 versus 5 for Penn State to really kind of claw back and again it's they're in a really sticky situation due to them having to funnel themselves again through these single doors where all of the defenders from crutch town can just watch into and deny any sort of entry inside but they um what they do find a pick on the th uh Thundee, nonetheless ufo with a great shot there from the arx and now i've got to find try and find some more thames we'll find two and as well skirt will then finish it all off there yeah, but the big thing was, even though the numbers weren't that bad in the favour of Penn State, the issue was the HP. They had about 10 to 15 HP each along with the down player, and Kutztown take a 3-0 lead. We're just two two rounds away from that split, and if Kutztown can go for, you know, win this next round, Warden, at the very worst, they're going into the split 4-1 up meaning they only need to win two of the remaining five rounds of after that to go through to the upper bracket and the grand finals. Exactly, they've already put themselves in a really good position uh, defending as well as they have. My only sort of, like, real pick against Penn State here is the fact that they're not really using any sort of utility or hard reach to try and open themselves up with, give them, give themselves some more angles, give themselves other routes into the site, they're kind of just trying to brute force their way through single doors, and unfortunately it's not panning out, especially when you're just stepping into so many arms of the defenders, as they just mainly kind of, Crutchtown are mainly looking to kind of anchor on site, you haven't got many roamers who are playing around, so they've really got to look into that and try and adapt to what um, Crutchtown are doing, and this cat can as well is going to make life uh, a little bit more difficult for Penn State if they don't drone out those cap cans and they just walk into them because it's really going to hurt them especially as you can now put more than one cap can trap on a door improvise adapt overcome is the message of the day for those attackers as they want to try get the win on this one 3-0 lead for Kutztown, and they've done a great job, Warden, of just getting that opening kill every single round, which means that really the attackers are fighting with one arm behind their back. I know that, you know, me and you would know a lot of players in the EU scene and a lot of teams. There's a team called Ten Star, and their yeah. mantra is once they get the numerical advantage in a round, they play trade the way to victory, because even if you do lose a player, you're still back to level grounds. You are, and that's kind of the name of the game, right? Because in some instances, you are going to not, you're not going to be in that position to win out strategically. You might, you know, not have some key uh, areas open to you or in use that you're actually be able to use to your advantage to really win out that site. So you have to play that numerical advantage, and like you were talking about with Ten Star, and just play those trades. Make sure work with your team, coordinate with them, and Destroyer as well. One of the uh, members from Crutchtown gets aggressive and almost finds the pick, but unfortunately they do manage to skedaddle away from that sight line just in the nick of time, as they're really giving them hell on this top floor. Destroyer's trying to force their way through, but he also takes some damage from below. Some really good team play coming out from Crutchtown here, um, but unfortunately, um, well, I, I said say that, two kills, three kills! Going away, four even going the way of Crutchtown, and again the attackers just completely fall apart for Penn State as they again just try and force the, their way through single doors, and it's not going to play out. He's got a minute. My, uh, Mild has got a minute left to go. Oh my God! It does a, a drop from the <laughs> ceiling as well. Just out of <laughs> Assassin's Creed. Uh, unfortunately, just a bit of a kerfuffle there, but. Uh, 
Wow, Crutchtown, that was uh, a really good round there as well. Yeah, they've got a 4-0 lead, and they've got one more round to play on defense. If they win this round, they go to match point, and all they got to do is be is win one out of five. And the issue then for Penn State would become they cannot afford to make one mistake. They need to play perfect siege for five straight rounds. But you said, you know, you were questioning... The dark pick, the P90 that was being used by Skirt. I did. I told you that there was read, there was method to the madness. It, that's, that's something at least. I mean, I haven't really had. Uh, I, you don't really see it in EU Siege. I'll be honest. We don't. I haven't really seen Doc get picked all too much. So when I saw, first saw it on the table, I thought, Ah, okay, that's that's a bit uh, you know unusual. I don't don't really expect you don't really see it anymore. I was I thought that you know Thunderbird would be the more optional pick, but uh, he's really making it work, and he really does love that P90, especially with that 1.5. It can just make that thing sing as well. I mean, they are known as the uh, zip guns as well because they just you're just able to fire so many rounds down, and you can just score people in half with them. They are brilliant for that, and. Yeah, I mean, I can't argue with the results the man's pulling out. Yeah, 51 bullets in that mag, like you pointed out as well. There's so much to play with, but we're inside round number five. Kutztown University with a dominating performance through four ma or four rounds. They've got that lead. Miles doing the drone work again, and you can't fault Penn State. They've been doing a lot of good things. They've been droning out the map. Ooh. They've been looking around, but how do they not spot those cap can traps as three members take damage on? On that one that's what i said that you really needed to be aware of if you're not careful you will unfortunately fall prey to them if they're not droned out properly and we saw that big mistake they have got the thinker to heal themselves back up so it is not it's not all over just yet but they still take a lot of damage nonetheless and they're going to force their way through study yet again looking to try and just go for a direct slight push Setting up some flank drones on red stairs to make sure, or just running out to make sure there's no defender presence there. And Jaws is looking to get aggressive and see if they can force their way through. Yet again, he does find that first pick onto Rogers there. The Thorn Trap is activated, but again, just gets away in time. This really just does speak volumes about the fuse time on those Thorn Traps, as they're not always the best for getting that instant trade out. Skirt will manage to find UFO. Destroyer will get a trade back. Now is the time to play the numerical advantage. Penn State finally have the numbers advantage in their way. It's a 4-2. Head and Skirt now really have to try and make, just pour on the pain here. Get aggressive and go look for some more picks, but also hold down those key doors. This is all about, this is all coming into angles and sheer aggression and gun skill. And the question is, who is going to win it out? Is it going to be Cutstown or is it going to be Penn State? Well, we're going to see Skirt trains it out with Destroyer. So now it is all down to a 2v1 as head with full HP. And the bandit there is going to throw that C4 around the corner. It blows. And now it's a 1 versus 1 head against Jaws. Let's see which members of the face are going to win this one out. The head's been spotted out. That bandit MP7 is an absolute... A weapon and a half in the hands of the right person. 30 seconds left. But on the other side, you got Finke. That LMG, the diffuser's going down. So now Head is going to creep the way up. It was only a bit of a distraction, though. 25 seconds. Here comes the swing. And oh no, he doesn't get the kill. Jaws does. And he takes the head off of him. And that will be the first round for Penn State. But Warden... That was so close to being a sweep from Kutztown. That got a little bit too close for comfort there. Like, I'll be honest, Kutztown did really, really well to swing that back into their favor. Uh, head and uh, skirt there really doing the hard, heavy lifting to kind of just put them back into contention in that round. Taking it to that one versus one really tight. But unfortunately, Jaws was the one who but did bite he off, well, head's head. So it's... <laughs> really kind of good uh, to see that Penn State do have some fight left in them. They haven't totally relinquished their aggression or control of this. It got a little bit too close, I will admit, but Defenders, protect your bombs from being defused my kind of, again, this will come back to kind of my biggest criticism about Penn State's attacks. They all just brute forced it and looked to win it out on gun skill. And when the defenders have so many angles like that on lockdown, 
it really is difficult, as you saw, to kind of put that round in your favour. They managed to do it, but it's so hard to do. And I'll go back to this again, especially on LAN, where you can get away with some right freaky little shots. Yeah, it's... They were in a situation, too, where they had a 3v1 and suddenly it got turned into a 1v1 as well. So a little bit of complacency kind of snuck in, but... The big thing about Zofia, or not Zofia, but Finca and that LMG, two factors of that LMG won the round. The first one was the fact that the muzzle and the size of that gun is so big that it baited the swing from Bandit. So head swung by because they've seen the muzzle of the gun. But because the player is so far away from it, it allowed Finca to fall back and then all of those bullets not having to reload won the round for them. So yeah. That LMG can be so powerful and multiple factors. But we're two minutes and 30 seconds into Kutstown's first attack. They've got Ace, Gridlock, Finca, IQ, and Nomad. It's a nice little lineup they have, but maybe a little bit light on nades. Yeah, it's a bit of a stark contrast to kind of what we've seen uh, in other uh, in other scenes. We've, we've really seen the kind of grenade meta really kind of come into its own. A lot of grenade kills are coming from underneath these days, not really uh, going uh, linearly. They're not going straight into an area. They're coming up from underneath the floors. We've seen that a lot on Villa, actually, uh, as well. So it's kind of really uh, curious to see that they've brought all of this flank watch. I mean, gridlock and Nomad, that's kind of overkill. That's kind of surprising for this, but uh, they're going to look to try and make it work nonetheless. They're going in from the master side, and they're going to make sure that all of these angle, all of these rotations that Penn State can use to come up uh, from underneath to kind of bite them and steal players away are going to be fully locked down but they've really got to look to make this kind of linear push across and into 90 now they are going to manage to do it but they are they going to face any competition from penn state in that process and where are these challenges going to come from from penn state yeah that is the question skirt pushing up on to 90 already they're getting a lot of map control they've got the flank watch like you pointed out gridlock and nomad means that nobody should come up from behind destroyer tried to and that is the destruction of the flank for penn state kutstow now they've got the numerical advantage but sinister has the footholds he's got the maestro he knows that somebody's about to swing and all he has to do is push Mouse one, and that will be that for one of those members on the attack, but it's all slowed down now. We're in that quiet phase. We're bracing for the attack, Warden. And if it's going to come, it's going to come quick. And Tom pushes into sight and gets that open and picking in there. And Skirt's going to double down. Jaws now left to clutch it all out and really kind of snatch this round away from Crutchtown. He'll find one, but can he find three more? There's 13 seconds left on the clock. They've got to push in! Thunder will get aggressive and kill Jaws. And wow, they finally get another round under their belt. Nonetheless, Penn State having no real chance to try and come back from that. It's really all against them now. We've played six rounds, Warden. And Cutstone, I believe, have 29 kills between them already. They have been absolutely fragging out. And even in the round they lost, it came down to a 1v1. So you spoke about the mechanical skill coming in. Well, Cutstone are really flexing right now. They really are. Um, I mean, it's just... It's really hard for Penn State to actually win these gunfights simply because I kind of think they're getting outswung, right? They're the because Grudgetown have a hot, hold, held all the angles on defense that they needed to hold, and they made sure that there were some trades in place if they did lose a player, which is fantastic to see. Great teamwork from them, but Penn State are kind of. I guess they're kind of getting really kind of nervous now because they see everything kind of start to slip away and they, they're kind of looking to not take those engagements. You saw them kind of there on their defense. They were kind of trying trying to hide out, play the time a little bit. And then when Crutchtown turned it on, they swung through, they took gunfights. Penn State wasn't ready for it. And then they just kind of lost them one by one by one, leading to the, that kind of that one versus four that we saw right at the very end there. So... I kind of think that 
Penn State, in order to start winning rounds, need to get a little out aggress uh, Crutch Town here. And maybe we might see things going their way, but that solely depends on the player's gun skill and who's got the better aim and who can put heads the fastest. Yeah, that is the question. We spoke about it before. Who can click heads? And Tom's got a nasty little angle through the drone hall. He spots out the shin, and he finds Sinister's Achilles heel. And he's just going to double down now by putting down the Claymore as well. But the Mute Jammer is going to take away some of that effectiveness. Jaws took some damage with that knee, and he misses a C4 as well, as things are going from bad to worse for Penn State. And Destroyer manages to pull one back. He takes outskirt, but it's a four versus four. And with IQ being down, the question is, did IQ manage to get rid of any of that defensive utility from below? Destroyer whips out that uh, DMR, tries to land some shots, warning, but misses and really cuts down. They still have a good opportunity in this round. They do, they're gonna barrel through the uh, walk-in wardrobe there and look to take control and then maybe look to uh, force toilet. Unfortunately, the wall is reinforced off, so they might have to get that open in order to maybe create that line of sudden. The name comes through, destroy, just managed to skirt away as he's only on one HP in a dream. And he's just gonna patiently, passively just hold this angle, wait for someone to kind of swing through. Maybe even opt to get aggressive when the moment arises. Mid managed to find Tom's there. And now UFO as well, who's holding over by red PSU do have the advantage now but they've got to make sure that they don't waste it they've got that man count they've got just got to make sure they don't throw this man advantage away they're going to double up on that uh, uh, master single door and just wait for any one of C crutch town to kind of look to swing through so they've got two guns on it so that if one does fall they can immediately trade it back out and still keep that man power that manpower advantage rogers Teetering on the edge of actually jumping through the, uh, the uh, bathroom window here. Not sure what awaits them. They're going to wait for their buddy to go on in first. And then they're going to follow them through. Now here comes the kind of aggression. They're going to look to take Astro control and rip it away from uh, Penn State here. But are they going to be able to do it? And are they going to be able to swing that manpower count back in their favor and find two kills? Well, a little bit of a breeze would get the kill on the Destroyer head. Finca drops, but if there was any operator that you want to get down, Finca is probably the best one who stole that passive ability away from Zofia about a year and a half ago. UFO holding the angle. Rogers gets a kill on the jaw. Swing comes in from Nomad as two members are playing inside Wolf. Diffuser being planted. Mile gets a, no no. gets a kill. Rockers gets one. It's a 2v1. Defenders win the round. And Penn State make this 5-2. But this is another round where Penn State took it very close. They did. And they managed to do... They managed to win that round by simply just holding angles, playing together, playing that man count, and playing in positions that maybe Crutchtown really didn't expect them to, because they kind of relinquished Astro control towards the end there. But what they weren't, but what uh, uh, so, uh, Crutchtown didn't realize is that I can't remember what player it was but it was the mute jaws there we go that reminded me down below who was just playing on the stairs they didn't really expect anyone to play there who just popped up and managed to rem uh, down i think it was the thinker and that kind of really stalled out their attack and the ability to get down to the fuser and as soon as the time started to get low they had to then commit to that plant in order to obviously make sure that they had enough time to either play for those kills and play for the overall time and then they just weren't able to f find it because they ran, the clock ran down, and as soon as it ran down, Penn State knew that was it. They can now just collapse on and just kill everyone left that was on site there, and then just kill the diffuser and, hey, presto, you've got a round. It's a simple game, Warden, whenever you can click heads and get the kills, and that's exactly what Penn State did. But this is violent chess. That's the best way to describe a game of Rainbow Six Siege. And so far, Kutstone have managed to get a lot of the pawns, but they have the queen in their sights as they are now on match point. Penn State need to be absolutely flawless for the next three rounds one slip up and we have kutstown in the grand finals look everybody loves an underdog story kutstown were the underdogs going into this game penn state were the favorites for the whole tournament but all of a sudden penn state now at five two down suddenly they're the underdogs to make their way into the final 
Very true in, indeed. We're going to see Destroyer play the Astro here just quite aggressively as well, just to make sure that uh, Crutchtown aren't able to get the um, Vertical, because Vertical on the kitchen site is kind of really important. Destroyer needs to make sure that he doesn't get too aggressive here, as there are, are players who are looking to push into Master. He is going to take out a bunch of drones, and as well, he's going to take down Skirt with him, as he just needs to make sure that he can get away. He does manage to get away and take another drone with him, but he's going back for more! But no, he falls to the grenade! He got too greedy! Yeah, if you're going to play Astro Stairs, you need the Wamai there. You need those discs to protect you, and they just weren't there. Sinister's got four Wamai discs in pocket. Jaws pulls one back, though. He gets that headshot with the SMG 11 on to head, and Sinister drops on down into the basement. Skirt, though, with the pistol, gets the kill on the UFO. We got ourselves a 4v3. Skirt, low HP. Roggers is the same, but my ho -ho, sinister on the fadeaway, Warden. A good fadeaway, nonetheless, is when you manage to take a kill like that, and an important one, nonetheless, because that was all the pressure into the pantry, and now uh, Crutchtown, all the kind of pressure that they have is the vertical. Still good, uh, nonetheless, because they're able to, again, like I said, you've got to force the defenders into those uncomfortable positions, but the mute, it's going to deny all of that intel. They're going to try and use the IQ gadget to see if they can find where that pesky little mute jammer is so they can actually get some information. Skirt with the G8 does have the ability to pre-fire this corner pretty well but are they going to be uh, able to find the player on the receiving end that they need in order to make that kind of push through the flashbangs sail on through from the nomad they're now out of flashes all they've got left is the smoke and two breaching charges do they have enough utility left here they've got to make sure that if they do decide to go for this plant that they use these smokes well because Dundee, they've got it. They've kind of just got to get aggressive now. It's now down to the final 30 seconds. You've got to go send yourself through that door. Your information's being stalled out in every opportunity. Come on, boys, it's time to go. 15 seconds. They're getting antsy now. Mid, you've got to whip the C4. Unfortunately, it doesn't fly through. And instead, they'll down. Uh, oh. Penn State managed to find another round. They managed to down two players. And then they just unfortunately run out of time there, I think, at the end. Yeah, that is a big round win again for Penn State. Just clawing their way back into this game. But it's match point again. And Kutztown, they're going to get at least two more attempts to win this one out as we move on to that tertiary, that third site. And it's going to be Aviator Games this time around. Last time we played here, Kutztown got the win with some beautiful play, some beautiful swings. And, you know, it's... It's the flank watch that they're bringing. You know, they brought Nomad and Gridlock last time. Destroyer tried to flank up red stairs, got decapitated by Tom. And from that point on, when Kutstown have nothing to worry about apart from the site, it really makes the attacker's job easy. That's why I always say mobility is winnability, because if you can stay mobile and you can keep those roamers, keeping attackers thinking about multiple angles, it makes their job more difficult. One thing I will kind of uh, highlight is we haven't actually seen, I don't think we've really seen many of the track stingers go down from Rogers. I don't think this double uh, denial is actually helping uh, Crutztown much uh, as, as they go for these attacks because PSU are still finding the ability to kind of just swing on through onto these angles and just find these really important picks that, you know, put the defenders firmly in control of the round. So they really have to kind of look to utilize this utility a lot better. Finally, we're seeing more nades come out for the side of Crutchtown. But the question is, are they going to be used vertically? Are they going to be used, are they going to be thrown up? And to remove some of the defenders from uh, PSU, uh, Thundy going to look to get aggressive inside uh, the box here and try and remove a player they've clearly got yellow pings and information to call out but they've got to make sure they kind of clear this uh, underneath because they do have C4s on hand coupled with the Valkyrie cameras as well so there is options for denial uh, for um, Penn State here but I, I, I don't really know how this is going to go Gibbs well look it's all about that open and pick it's statistically proven that so there's such a high percentage of games are won by the team who get the open and pick so that's exactly what both these sides are trying to do 
Penn State. They've all fallen back on the side. Melissa's going to do some late game reinforcements as well, which is going to just continue making a lot of noise. But Kutstown, they're playing a patient game and Herod gets the head of Mile and that's a 5v4 now. And all of a sudden Jaws is low HP too. Could that be the dinner bell wrong? Could this be Kutztown feasting on Penn State to get the win? But all of a sudden, everything just falls quiet on Villa. It does. Finally, we're going to see those track stingers used, but it's going to be used to uh, pop the laser gate there, and they're going to look to try and maybe send it through study. This could get really this messy really quickly. The bloodbath is going to start coming because Head finds the frag grenade onto Jaws from under, I, think, I believe maybe underneath. I'm not too sure. And here comes the collapse. They've got a minute of time, so they've got plenty to use. They're going to look to try and plant bar, but no, they're going to fall to destroy it. He's destroyed their advance in. Head manages to find the trade, though, leading to a 2v4. Penn State is going to slip away from them and if they don't look to kind of deny more pressure here and it's going to go in more in the advantage of Crutchtown as Skirt managed to find another it's just left to Mr. Sinister and he's not going to be able to do it because that's it Crutchtown win and they're going to go through Cuts down the hometown heroes they make their way into the final with a convincing 6-3 win against Penn State and what a game that was but Warden, before we break it down any further, I think we should jump into a quick break and get ready for the grand final. So we'll see you guys very soon. And we are back, guys. And, you know, the, what you see up on screen isn't quite right just yet. We don't have the winners and losers, but we do have our finalists. UMBC taking on Kutztown. My name is Gibson, and I am joined by the one and only Warden. Warden, you've stepped in late notice. We're going to Clubhouse. Habana, Finca, Valk, and Mira are your bands. And this is a best of one to see who can win these grand finals. They're going to the dub house nonetheless to see, to really crown the victor here. And there's some good, really interesting bands there because we've got the Habana. So no hatches, no hatches can be gotten to go down to that bottom floor site. That's going to be really difficult for the attack. Crutch down on attack first. It's going to be uh, curious to see how they're able to work around that. Uh, they're going to bring the Thatcher and the Ace. Ace isn't really too great for getting uh, hatches, uh, it must be said. Um, but because uh, obviously you have to use two, but they're actually going to go to the gym site, and it's going to be interesting. I'm going to, I'm again quite uh, curious to see how the defense for UMBC is going to go. They've got the Aruni laser gates, they've got Mute, they've got the Jaeger, they've got the Cade as well, but the Thatcher is on, and that means that you only need to throw one EMP to pop that Electro Core and look to get that wall open, so they're not going to be able to stall out that Jacuzzi wall too long. They're going to have to look to play aggressive off that if they're going to be able to take this gym site, and I think it's going to be a really difficult round for uh, UMBC because of uh, because of the bans and like I said, Thatcher being on the table. So I'm uh, really excited to see how this plays out That Cannot wait to see what happens in this one. But the big thing is the Habana ban is not as effective as it used to be, Warden, because we have the can openers. But I'm looking at that attacker setup and they didn't bring any. They've got four nades, two clay, sorry, four claymores, four nades, and the three soft breach charges. So basically, they got a lot of explosive utility. And Thunder is straight away got himself up inside stock, and he is just causing havoc on everything that is going on above him. But nobody is going to be found. UMBC, the undefeated team, taking on the local cuts down side. And as it stands, just so you know, Warden, Joe and KZ for UMBC have been absolutely deadly in every game so far. We're excited to see how they managed to pull it out. Skirt's going to throw in that name to look and try and remove any presence from inside the red stairs because the smoke is sailing those deadly canisters on through and really choking out the attackers here as they struggle to make their way inside. Oh. And the first is going to fall to the SMG-11 nonetheless. And as well, some more shots are going to pepper through and Thundee's going to manage to find the kill on to... Uh, Telki there. Joe is going to get dropped by Rogers as well, and it's going to quickly fall to the man advantage. Cutstown with the lead. 
Yeah, that is a big double straight off the bat, but massive with a huge play as he brings it back into a three versus three. But this is a good start by Kutstein. Both these sides getting aggressive. Skirt knows that there's a defender nearby. He's getting the pings, but he can't turn his back to that gym wall. Roggers is going to get taken down by Massive. And I believe now that was Massive through the drone hall. So just that gym wall being open, Warden, it prevented Skirt from being able to swing. It did, but unfortunately Skirt's going to manage to find Massive, and now it's a 2 versus 2, but uh, unfortunately Skirt is on very low HP, and now they've got to try and throw themselves through the absolute crossfire that is going to be construction. It's going to be really difficult to f uh, force their way through and make it out alive, especially with Skirt on a slither of HP, and KZ watching very aggressively into that, but there's only 30 seconds left. Crutchtown have to look to get aggressive here, and it could really swing the towards UMBC's way. KZ is going to find the first one. Head now left on their own to clutch it out with only about 15 seconds left. 15 seconds to go ahead is prone inside logistics he needs the spot ahead very quickly though sees one in the distance the prone player is there Oof. kz i said he was one to watch he gets the double at the end of the round and that will be a defensive lead and you know it's all that action all these things that happen warden and the answer the the end result is just the defending side winning round number one so no surprises there no surprises at all. I'm very surprised that Kutztown didn't decide to look to go over to Jacuzzi, open up that, and then head back over and look to get open the wall in servers first. But they just went for a straight service end. The problem with doing that is that... Um, Again, you kind of don't lead to any sort of pinches. There's not enough pressure to make the defenders squirm, and they're just able to hold angles, look down, and because this is a LAN, they're able to find those kills that they may normally lose online. So it's really important that you actually work with your team to get that pinch off. Otherwise, you're just throwing yourself at a brick wall that is eventually going to do more damage to you than it is going to be, uh, be done to them. Exactly. UMBC got the one round lead and you know i think i haven't quite got the stats here but i think they've only lost five or six rounds over the course of the whole tournament to warden they have been nigh on untouchable but as we get into round number two the arena for this one will be down in the basement armory church and as an attack inside, we're looking at where these players are coming from. Three of them pushing towards secret stairs. So that kind of hints to me, Warden, that we're going to see some form of blue tech with a little bit of pressure coming down dirt. But what do you think? Uh, I think that we are going to see that take, but the real excitement is that uh, UMBC are performing a classic SSG-style roam here. And the problem is with that is, it could all go wrong. Instead oh, of no. see a dirt rush from Crutchtown, this, they might actually struggle to pull this off as they're going to try and send them down such a narrow tunnel that all the defenders are going to fall back to sight. And now the action really begins. Two fall to Ding's uh, UMP. Another is going to fall as well. The t f quad coming out. Oh, no. It's actually a triple, and Joe will clean it up right at the very end. And UMBC will take another confident round here on Church. That little uh, image that we had of those five players getting ready to push down dirt, well, you could put that right into one of those memes of images that precede unfortunate events because <laughs> that was unfortunate for Kutstown right there. They got absolutely wiped going down the narrow corridor and... You know, it was high risk, high reward, Warden, because had they got that open and pick going down dirt, they probably won that round. Yeah, unfortunately, the presence was alerted to the defenders straight away. They all just clustered up and waited for the turkeys to cut and just step into the barrel, and then they just gunned them all down, unfortunately. It was uh, kind of a bit of a shame, but uh, nonetheless... Uh, that we didn't, it was a bit of a shame that we didn't get to see that SSG roam really at its finest and, you know, uh, Crutch Town looked to attack um, different parts of the map, but uh, it was an exciting rush nonetheless and uh, UMBC will really be thanking them for that one. Yeah, they definitely will and UMBC, they've got two rounds, but now we go into the third round and 
This is the one, historically, when you go to that tertiary site, which has now become CCTV caches, it's become so easy to get that breach open, that you expect the attackers to maybe win this one. But Warden, right now, those attackers are so happy that the Pro League rules do not allow you to use Azami, because Azami has made rafters almost impossible to take. Yeah, she's... Honestly, fantastic for it. Just able to throw out those uh, Kiba barriers, just create some new interesting angles for you to kind of hold, some creating some really unexpected plays. Couple that with the Romai and the Jaeger can really turn into a nightmare to finally take Rafters, which has been, uh, you know, a. Uh, it's been getting easier and easier as it's become more attacker sided. Skur desperately swinging in, trying to find that pick onto the one Mai, who's playing that Rafters position. But unfortunately, they're not able to find it just yet. And it, but they, uh, they will get the first kill, but it's very quickly traded back by Joe. Yeah, Joe with the headshot with the SMG 11 takes the head of head off him. But now with two minutes and five seconds still to go in this round, plenty of time for these attackers to reassess their option. But they have garage control, and that's half the battle. Now they just need to get that main breach up. I've noticed as well that it looks like Thunley is going to go get some pressure onto that CCTV window as well, which once again just creates the crossfire. And it's a simple game when you get your crossfire set up, isn't it, Warden? It can be. Uh, kind of the biggest kind of criticism I've got right now for Crutstown, or the biggest criminal act they've done, is they've lost their Thatcher quite quickly. And the problem is that's really going to stall out this attack for Crutstown, because now they've got nothing to open up the server double wall. However, they are going to find a pick now onto one of the defenders, and it, it uh, unfortunately gets traded straight back out by Massive, creating a three versus three. Now they've really kind of got to work it. Oh, oh they actually have got open the server wall. That's my bad. I missed it, unfortunately missed that. They're going to opt to go for the plant now, with one watching through the server wall. He's going to have to make sure that nothing gets through. C4 comes out, narrowly dodges. Tom's there, and now he's going to look to kind of go for the plant again. But he is really got to be very careful here because there is another C4. It is going to connect, but not before the diffuser goes down. Yeah, that is absolutely massive. No Roggers on the repel has a vitally important job. Two swings come on out, but it is a two versus two. And I think they could potentially... Oh, the run out comes out as Roggers gets him. Take and he gets KZ. Oh! And he gets massive. Kutstone take the triple and they pull one round back. And that play on the repel was massive. That was huge. I was really well held by the Thatcher, uh, sorry, the uh, Thermite there. Just watch it, just flicking back and forth between those angles, popping up and down like a, uh, a jack in the box. Just a deadly one at that, just knocking heads left, right, and center from the NBC. Cruts down and managed to get their first round in, and that's a really key and important round uh, as well. So they really need to get this next round in to really kind of put the pressure onto UMBC to really make this kind of, uh, to really. Um, gain that kind of upper hand and advantage and put them on that pressure, that back foot. Yeah, that's... Uh, pressure is something that over the course of a game, the more pressure you exert, the easier it is to break the will of the other team warden. You know, you're... You're a pretty intelligent player yourself, and I know that you love the analysis side of the game, and... As someone who looks at that way, how important do you think it is for the attack inside to just get inside that mental and throw off the defenders especially when you're attacking first mental is everything in siege honestly because if you lose that kind of passion that willingness that and get scared um against those players it can really just play into uh, how you make those really important and key plays that could be round saving round clutching just it, it, it really just plays the whole thing and it's why uh, I really do love Siege at the end of the day because if you're not able to um, keep that strong mental uh, and really kind of just second guess yourself then you're going to lose out rounds that you really should be winning and like I said you're just not going to be able to do stuff that you should be doing we're going to see the drone work come in from Crutstown now to look they're going to go for another server side attack but I really want to look and see them get open that jacuzzi wall as well to aid them in this pressure on the uh, defenders 
Yeah, but the wall is already open. Skirt is pushing up as well. They're trying to get in to gym bedroom, but they're working through that checklist. They got rid of the Aruni gate as well. So that's another opportunity to do some damage. The nade is being cooked towards where you expect someone to play on red stairs, but there is nobody at home to gather that package. So he's going to try and repeat the send again. But once again, that's two nades absolutely wasted, Warden. It is, and all because they can't be bothered to get on their drones and do the important work of droning out these positions and making sure they get that good utility usage off. And unfortunately, it's going to come to bite them as Ding finds the first kill with the shotgun of 590 to clap a player off the board. And now Thundee really has to look to make a play here to push through and take that cash control. Otherwise, this again is going to have a stalled out defense for, uh, sorry, stalled out attack for Crutchtown. Yeah, the attack has stalled, but they get to... Oh my god! Oh my he god. just sees the head and tosses the nade back the other way. Somehow he is still alive and kicking, though. That nade is good. Oh, no, Thundee, no! He's right no, behind no, you! No, 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 no. Oh, he gets oh. one! What? Oh, Massive gets the kill, but he gets traded out instantly as we have a 3v3. But that is a massive opportunity lost for US or UMBC there. It really is. They've got 50 seconds left to work with as well, which is completely doable for Crutchtown, especially with the amount of aggression that's following through. Skirt trying to push through into Logi. I think they're just blocked by the wall. I'm not sure. They can't seem to get through. They managed to vault in. Now they've got to try and find the player who's playing in there, but they, uh, it is KZ, the player, the big one that you mentioned, and he's going to find two! And NBC managed to take another round off from Crutchtown. Yeah, brilliant performance by them so far. 3-1 lead. One more round left on the split, war uh, split warden. And if UMBC win it, surely they'll be confident they can go on to win it. But if Cutstone can take this round before they switch on defense, suddenly things swing in their favor. It will do. We're going to see a bit of a pause come out here. I'm not too sure as to why. Uh... We're just going to wait to see that cleared up. But let's quickly just kind of break down the kind of attacking lineup and where they're going to be going. They're going to be going to Church Arsenal uh, and UMBC for their final round. And uh, Hutchtown is actually bringing a very curious operator here. They're going to be bringing the Monty. I'm very curious, uh, interested to see where they're going to play that operator, where they're going to look to send the walking mountain that is Montagne, where they're going to send him down, where they're going to use him to gather that really key important information that they need to decide where they're going to attack because they have they're doing a lot of switch arounds using the new attacker repick here the therm the flyers is going to get swapped out for the thermite monty's also going unfortunately going to get swapped out for the uh, jackal because i think they've kind of realized that umbc like to use this ssg star roam and they can use that uh, jackal to track down these players and make it easy pickings for them to pick off all those roamers and then look to crush down onto that bottom site yeah, I like the way that they've reassessed their options here and changed it up because the roaming game is such a vital part of Clubhouse, especially on basement, because from it's a strange map whereby from the top floor, you can exert control the whole way down through the south of the map. So taking a jackal can help you clear that top floor a little bit earlier. So like you said, the SSG style roam, it's very important that those defenders all stay within one or two seconds of each other. So if an engagement happens, they can get themselves in a position to refrag. This is a game where the butterfly effect is absolutely massive, massive uh, warden. So those players, they need to be able to react to every single flutter. They do, but also teamwork is really important, like you were saying, because they've got to make sure that they're able to trade off each other. If they don't trade off each other, then it's all going to go wrong. They need to give the attackers hell in order to stall out as much time as is physically possible, because that is ha what is make or break for this strategy. Storing out enough time to put the attackers under enough pressure so when it comes down to it They haven't got enough time to find the defenders and they walk into all these preset cross angles And well, it's gonna go their way right at the start as massive is gonna find one and then Joe's gonna find a C4 onto the second And now Crutchtown are in a really difficult situation where they've now only got three remaining attackers To clear out a top floor roam and then crush down onto the bottom bunker site uh, unfortunately as well, they uh, are gonna manage to uh, they're gonna lose Dundee as well to um, 
to another defender, uh, but the massive has been downed in the process. Yeah, but still job done by the defenders. A minute and 40 seconds wasted off the clock already. One attacker has been taken, or sorry, two attackers have been taken out now. So they have the numerical advantage. Now with a minute on the clock, UMBC can just fall back, turtle on the site, and wait for this push to come on in. The Castle Barricades, Warden, they're causing an absolute nightmare now for this attack inside. That's why they're so key to this setup. It's all about delaying the time. That's what those castle barricades are for. It gives the defenders the chance to slip away and have those uh, sight angles broken. We're now going to see Rogers try and get off the thermite charge onto the kitchen hatch. But no, because he didn't place it on the hatch because it's cage charged. They weren't able to get it off. And they desperately throw down to try and clear it. Not even cooked. They're not even thinking about it. They're running out of time. They've only got 30 seconds left. Skirt is peppering shots everywhere because they don't have the information they need because they lost Fundy in the process to a defender who's still lurking by strip. You've got to forget him. You've got 15 seconds to get onto the side and plant. Yeah, the hatch drop comes in and it fails as M Tickle gets that kill. KZ for the, what, third, fourth time this today already. He gets that last kill inside the round. And he's using that beautiful ninjas in pajamas skin as well, which is always good to see players, you know, supporting the orgs, which makes Siege such a fantastic esport. But it's 4 1 Warden, UMBC two rounds away from winning it all. They are, and honestly that last defensive setup we saw from UMBC was perfect. That was the perfect way to play that ssg style roam just trading off those picks and then just lurking just being a menace you saw how much pressure the sledge was under panic shooting everywhere as soon as they lost the ash because they've got no idea and then they'll just like well we've got to send it onto site but we've got 15 seconds left and then you just fall into the waiting arms of the defenders and then you just put to bed by them so it was really perfect and now we've got to see umbc really complete their master stroke here and just take these next attacks confidently as well don't give crutch down an inch otherwise they will manage to find their way back in this yeah they are working their way and worming their way to try get back into this but umbc they've barely lost a round the whole time and they are working so incredibly hard now to just wrap up and finish what they started I'm looking at that UMBC side as well, and they're sharing the love. Joe's got four kills, Fox got four, KZ's got six, Massive has got five, M Tickle's got four. They're sharing the frag and load warden, and that takes a lot of pressure off those key entry players, those key roamers, when everybody's getting involved. Yeah, it really does, and I, I really am. Um... Just, I'm really interested to see how the um, Crutztown are going to be able to kind of look to swing this back in their favor since they're losing some uh, gunfights as well. Because look, they're down on the numbers everywhere apart from Rogers, who's just breaking even. So they've really kind of got to pull it back out. And as well, you've got head on the smoke. So it's going to be really difficult. And that's a really kind of key role. So he's got to look to kind of, if he's not winning those gunfights, play the time using those smoke ba babes and just deny as much time as possible. You see Massive here do some really good drone. Make sure that there are no roaming defenders as Crutchtown have opted to do a turtle setup for this kit for this church site. Yeah, the turtle setup though, it can still work, Warden, because usually teams spend a lot of time trying to find the roamers, and even without any, the ghost roamers have wasted a minute and a half of this round already. They're not even there, but the attackers are wary. Look at that, C4 pops and Buckting gets knocked, but of course, unless you're keeping your eye on the points, they have no clue that Buckting is down. 
Fundy managed to find the confirmation onto KZ. That's the star player for UMBC gone. So that's really good for Crutch Santa to actually be able to find that. And as well, they're throwing out these EMPs, just trying to get rid of all the gadgetry that Crutch Town have got for their defense. Because as you can see, they have that thorn on there. And that EMP will remove that gadget from popping, so it won't be as vicious. We're going to see as well that the, uh, one of the defenders in that of Tom's penned into the corner here, desperately scrabbling for their life in church. But they do manage to find a kill onto Massive nonetheless. It is going towards Crutch Town as the UMBC's attack is slowly falling apart in these dying seconds. Yeah, Crutch Town coming to life here. 5v1. Are they going to get a flawless round to half the deficit? 4 1 lead for UMBC, but there's 25 seconds left. Buckting is just fighting his time he's hoping that maybe cuts down get a little bit too aggressive but if you're cuts down all you got to do now is play the most passive 15 seconds of your life wait for buckting to make some sort of move yeah look buckting that's gonna be that for this round cuts down brilliant performance and uh you know buckting tried you know, I like, in the 5v1, even if there's a couple of seconds left forward, and I like to see the attacker at least die and try something and wait it out. Yeah, it's nice to see that they, you know, weren't really concerned about saving their KD. They really just tried to go for those dying seconds to maybe try and work something, even just take one or two members uh, of Crutztown with them. But uh, they managed to just, uh, unfortunately, fall at that last hurdles. But, um... That's really good from Crookstown. Something I've noticed is that when they go to defense, they really play actually off each other really well. They're, they're very, uh, what's the word? Uh, they're very disciplined in holding those angles, but swinging at the perfect opportune time to pick one of the players off from UMBC. So that's really good and positive to see. It really shows that Crookstown actually still have a dog in this race. They do, and if they win this next round, suddenly it gets a little bit sweatier for UMBC, but if UMBC, if the University of Maryland, Baltimore County can win this round on attack, they take the 5-2 lead and they're just one round away. I was talking to Novi earlier and we were saying, is this a Disney film? Or is this a film by M. Night Shyamalan? Will the hometown heroes win their land? Or will UMBC manage to strike out and get the win and break the hearts of that hometown team? Uh, I'm still looking through my script to kind of uh, just find whether it's a Disney tale or the Shyamalan film. I can't seem to find it just yet, but uh, what I will find, however, is uh, Mr. T uh, Mr. Tell finding the first kill for UMBC. That's a good positive first step to taking that... Uh, uh, putting them in the position to win this round, as, as we've spoken about before. Finding yeah, that first pick bonded. is really key, and it's onto Fundy as well, bonded. the kind of kill leader for Crutztown. So, another vital pick, another kind of point in UMBC's favour. Skirt's now just desperately flicking through the cams just to make sure that they're, they're not expecting an attack from UMBC anywhere else. And now they're really going to put the pressure onto Crutztown now. And uh, Tom's very well aware that there is someone playing outside that server window. Yeah, UMBC. Skirt's job is to play rafters until he dies. And he's having a little look around. Toms is holding an aggressive angle by the window. And they've got their crosses. You know, that's one thing they do have. And UMBC, they've got time and the numerical advantage. They're just going to use a little bit of a drone out those defenders to try spot any weaknesses possible. Massive droning out the default spot. Skirt skirts the head off of KZ. M Tickle takes out head as well, though. So the attackers keep the numerical advantage. And this is what we said, Warden. Trade your way to victory. They are doing, but unfortunately they um, uh, are in that uh, unfortunate position where they are a man down. They're looking to try and trade that back. Toms gets aggressive onto that server window, but unfortunately doesn't find the head of the attacker just yet. Joe taking some bit of chip damage, but he does find manage to find the kill onto the person who dealt that damage, which is Rogers. Skirt's going to get another, but Massive is going to trade out onto Toms. It's all just left to Skirt and the dock. He hasn't used it. I don't think he's used any of his stims just yet. No, he's used one. He's still got two left. Ooh. This is for him he manages to find the first but he's got to find two more yeah this is a tough situation to be in skirt five and four there's the stem he's going to use another one now to just get himself ready 
to get into the fight. Couple more shots fired. 23 seconds, which means he's really only got about 12 se or you know, 13 seconds to get these two kills. I think it's a bridge too far because look at what UMBC are doing. They're just biding their time, playing passive. And yeah, that'll be that for this round as UMBC move to match point. Those stims may be life-saving, but unfortunately they're not round-saving uh, for uh, <laughs> the uh, UMB, uh, sorry, uh, Crutch Town there. And now, unfortunately, UMBC are on the match point. If they win this, if they manage to take this, that's it. It's game over. There is no do-over. So Crutch Town really have to look to put themselves in a confident position. Uh, they really have to take this defending site confidently. Otherwise, I'm really starting to get concerned that they might not be able to pull it back. It's not even match point. It's tournament it point, not? Warden. It's tournament oh. point. This point will win the whole tournament if exactly. they can take the win on this. But Kutstown, you're still on defense. So when you're playing on defense, you gotta just keep doing the right things, doing the small things. It should be harder for UMBC to win these rounds, but there's just something mentally about defending when the other team are match point, isn't there, Warden? Yeah, it's it's just that kind of nagging sensation in the back of your mind, and it is one of those sensations that either make or break teams. And if Crutchtown win this, we know it's going to be a make because they will be able to hopefully carry that momentum forward into the next round and win and win and win and take them all the way into overtime but if it but unfortunately if they lose it well that is the breaking point like i said there is no do-overs here like you said it's tournament point and we're seeing them go to gym to defend this against this tournament point that umbc are on the verges of yeah it is a very very Good position for UMBC to be on. Let's see what they're made of. Let's see how confident they can be in this round as they try to take it away. But for Cutstone, even getting to the final was a massive achievement because Penn State were here, a top team in the whole of NA Collegiate. And the fact that Cutstone beat them out will give them so much confidence. But look, this game is not over just yet. Joe is droning and... As he's droning, he's finding very little resistance in this side of the map, isn't he, Warden? He is, and that's kind of really important to, um, for the side of the uh, attackers, that they're able to find all of this information. They're kind of being given all this information for free, and uh, Ding will find their first kill, and Joe will find a second. It looks like Crutchdown's defense is falling apart the scenes because they weren't able to pick off all those drones. They, they had all the information they needed. They got aggressive on the site. Skirt's going to manage to find one onto Massive, but he's going to get down in the process. He's going to get himself back up... Uh, get himself back up for the briefest of seconds but unfortunately he's gonna fall <laughs> however James is going for a massive one he's gonna fight a double and Head will take it they can manage to get, stay in this fight for another round and UMPC are just asking themselves what just happened two attackers outside the window sitting on a drone and I don't think that you will ever get an easier double than that you won't. That was just beautiful by Tom's there, just swinging out and going, oh, there's two people, and they're completely oblivious. Do you want to know why they're oblivious? Because they just killed Skirt in the server there, and they thought, ah, oh, there's not going to be anybody else playing there. They're going to be playing around site. No, Tom's, the big playmaker just came in and went, no, I'm still here, and I'm going to put you in the bin. <laughs> Bring them in the bin is right, and that keeps them in this map. Two rounds away from forcing overtime because that's the best case scenario for Kutstown now. They need to be perfect just to force overtime. And we've only had one overtime over the course of this tournament. Actually, funny enough, Warden, believe it or not, we have a nine map pool. And in this tournament today, we have seen eight of those maps. That's, that's kind of really good to see. Which, what was the, I'm actually curious now, which was the only map that wasn't played? Do we know that? Uh, please at do not attempt to board the helicopter. Border is uh, the only one we haven't not seen. Surprised. <laughs> not surprised by that at all. And 
we're gonna go just going back to the match here. We're gonna see Crutch Town. Uh, they're gonna go for another uh, turtle defense, I think, and it worked out well for them last time. But are UMBC gonna adapt their uh, their sort of attack here to make sure they take this? Because right now Crutch Town have a hundred percent win rate on this site, and this could mean another round win for them, taking us to a five-four scoreline. Oh, we will see. I know that. You know, I've been casting a long time today. This has been a very long day. But I still deep down want Kutstown to take us to overtime in the final. You know, what's a bedtime? We like to see some excitement. We like overtime. Let's see if the hometown team can keep that a reality. Or will UMBC say goodnight right now? Well, they're doing their, their due diligence here, making sure that there is no, absolutely no roaming presence from Crutch Town. UMBC doing a brilliant job of that. Now they're going to make sure they get down those claymores that they brought with them onto all the rotation points that the defenders might use to come up and attack them whilst they look to work this middle floor, this middle floor here and then push down onto the basement. Joe now finally breaking on through, looking to uh, ping out those hatches there because it's only in force and really it's not great to use waste a thermite charge on that so he's going to put it on this reinforced hatch and then look to blow it open now UMBC start doing the work to uh, look to pressure down onto this turtle defense from UMB uh, so from Kutch Town and looked to really bring it and stick it to them because they've only got a minute left to go and it's going to be squeaky bomb time soon enough Squeaky bomb time is right, Warden. The ace charges are going to pop, making Church a very difficult position to hold. The Thatchers come out as well to make sure that they are going to pop, but UMBC are setting this up for a massive push inside the last 40 seconds. We've got every single player still alive. Everybody is ready to go. Let's see what Kutstown have in hand to repel this push. This could be the last round warden they're getting ready the execution is coming but skirt ruins the plans with the first kill well and the c4 is ripped and ready for anyone to drop that moto hatch and as well i'm not sure if umbc are aware i think thundy took a lot of damage there i think they are aware that someone was playing in blue that was a big point i was going to come back to because if they weren't aware then that uh, church push that uh, they're about to make is going to get shut down pretty quickly oh thundy's going to manage to find and drop one tons is going to find a kill onto Bading, and then what two kills are going to fly out the way of umbc kz managed to find another one with a Pistol or at least down them, and now it's a one versus two. However, it goes to a one versus one, and it's all left to massive tournament point on the line. T Rogers now looks to maybe have to try and res Tom's if he's in the position to. He is managing to skirt himself away. Rogers Attack. looking Attack. desperately trying to find this last remaining player of massive. Oh. He's gonna catch him in the butt. Is he gonna manage to finish him off? No, but Tom's is back up. Oh, God. Tom's oh, got on the to the MC. He's coming through Moto. It doesn't even know. Oh. No, Matt wins it for UMBC. That's it. Tom and Point. They're going to take it. They're going to take this land. And unfortunately, the hometown of Kutztown are going to be knocked out with a desperate final round. Fantastic towards the end. Real nail biter. But they just managed to pull it out. Yeah, brilliant by them they deserve that look at joe he is just having a little drink could but he knows that that was a tougher final that he was expecting but well done to the players what a performance by them well done to kutstone getting to the final but this is ggs this is a massive tournament you can see joe just kind of point down saying this this is our turf this is our home even though it's not but they made it into theirs but warden this is the end of the night. This is the sad part of the night, but this is the time when we got to go and start giving credit to all of the people that made this happen. So first off, massive thank you to everybody involved with the University of Kutztown, all of the volunteers, all of the staff that made this happen. Massive shout out to everyone involved with Now Loading, who produced this amazing tournament as well. Saffron, our brilliant producer, did a fantastic job all day especially when you consider all of the stuff that was thrown their way i want to give a massive thank you to you warden 
you stepped in so late. Like, I mean, midnight yeah. your time, you were just out of the bath and you were like, do you know what? I'll do it. I'll step in. I'll have some fun. We we also got to give a massive thank you to the cast and crew. Infernosis did an amazing job. Sticula as well casted the first couple of games. He did an amazing job. The Observers, Crot, Novi. Massive thank you to everybody who made this happen. And finally, the viewers. Doesn't happen without you guys. Warden, I'm going to give you the honor of signing us off. Is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? Unfortunately, I think you've missed one name there that we needed to thank, and that's you, Gibson. You've done a fantastic job casting all of this throughout. You've done just really amazing, and thank you again for inviting me just to bring, bring me along for the ride and to just witness the final kind of dub that was found on Clubhouse, the dub house nonetheless, for that of uh, UMBC there. But yeah, that's going to be it from us, and I thank everyone for watching, and uh, I guess we'll see you in the next time, next land that uh, gets hosted by Crutchtown, and I think it'll be another banger just like this one. Take care, guys.